so sharing screen. So for I will make uh, Candy the presenter right now as we are uh, soon reaching the time, and and now Candy will. Uh, I think Candy, uh, can you confirm that you see the share icon? Yes, I Perfect. can see it. And Perfect. So let me start sharing. Perfect. Cool. So I hope it's coming up. Is it? Yes, it's perfect. Very good. <laughs> okay, so let's just uh, just to be sure that uh, everyone is in. I see people arriving. That's nice. Um, Still time. Ah, okay, nice. I see that Tor managed to to now hear everyone. So we have five minutes. So uh, I hope, uh, Candy, that uh, the frame rate will be okay. I see that you are using MPlayer. I, th I think it should be okay. If not, uh, you, we can also um, basically share your, uh, you know, your camera feed by just pressing the, the the video icon on the bottom because you can share the screen while having your face up top as I have. So you don't even don't need to have the MPlayer uh, there if it's better for you. Okay, I, I thought like uh, this uh, this way it would be even in the recording. So ah, no problem, no problem. So it, it's so, up to so you. like uh, well, the 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 end player um, text like annoys me. So like I would like to see it go, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find a way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No problem. No problem. Perfect. Okay. I don't know. Maybe you know, end player has some kind of yeah, like I switch. I, uh, yeah, like I normally have, um, yeah, like I have a comment <laughs> because I was also testing the same thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, uh, let me see if I can. Yeah, I have this and it, it automatically, I don't know, I don't know how to explain, but it automatically is this and automatically starts, um, uh, is this starts with, uh, without the bar, but yeah. But I wonder if it's because of that comment or if it's because I have somehow a system window rule that I kind of forget now. Uh, but I, I have this and somehow it, I don't know, I don't see the bar. Mm -hmm. ah, so, but I'm using MB, MPV, maybe that's the problem. Mm -hmm. I have no that's idea difference. what it's MPV, so uh, let's see if I have it. Some very minimal thing. <laughs> But never mind. It's if it's not, it's okay. It's it's not that it's not that big deal. Hi, Nikos. Hi, Pedro. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. That's cool. Nice. <laughs> okay, so for people that uh, are arriving now, we have shared a couple of um, links in the shared notes including the schedule and the various social media uh, names and also the hashtag. Also, uh, between uh, every talk, uh, we are going to see some default slide with some helpful uh, tips regarding uh, this uh, big blue button instance. Uh, but anyhow, if anyone has uh, a doubt or a question, can just be here in the public chat and someone will uh, help.
So I'm afraid like it's a window manager thing. No problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. So it's now perfect. instead, like I will have their video zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect, it's perfect. And I hope like it is small enough so that you know, so that it doesn't obstruct any kind of yeah, you know, it's very discreet. Any any of any of the slides. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Good morning, Andreas. No, it's so that like it is visible that I am from Quora, you know. Exactly. Okay, so you can start uh, now if you want. Yeah, I will mute myself. Well, I will, I'll start in a minute. Like um, yes, it's just one minute. Yeah, exactly. Just just just, just minute. Um, I think uh, let's let's do it on time uh, so that. So that If anybody like joins at the very last second, they do not lose my <laughs> my first slide. Exactly. Any questions, uh, feel free to save them or write it here and we will be able to answer them in the uh, Q&A uh, slot. If no, if no one else answers first in the public chat. <laughs> Okay, so it's uh, half past. So thank you so much for being here. We'll come to the cool days, uh, um, well, first to the opening session, but for the entire day full of presentations, it's uh, it's awesome that, uh, that that you are here and that uh, that you are able to be with us uh, for uh, for our conference. Uh, so, of course, uh, the conference wouldn't be uh, possible without uh, without you people so uh so thank you very much uh for like being here uh, for those who do who are not presenting and thank you very much for you who are presenting and uh, uh and also uh also uh like attending the conference at the same time like we have uh, we have tried to uh to um like get uh, the pictures uh, of of you who are presenting here uh, into this slide there would be no conference without you so so it's awesome that uh, that, that that you are with us and, and you you allow us to to have this uh, uh have this uh uh conference I, I don't know how to switch slides yes well, probably i won't be able to be on the screen at the same time so this conference is actually like exactly one year after uh, we have uh, we have done the move, uh, so you can maybe remember uh, that one year ago uh, there was uh, still like LibreOffice online project, uh, but we have decided uh, to move it out of the D uh, TDF infrastructure. But it doesn't mean that we don't do not support LibreOffice uh, anymore. LibreOffice is an essential part uh, of the server side of Collabora Online, uh, so we are fully supportive of the of the project. Um, LibreOffice is a great project and uh, uh, there would be no Collabora online without the LibreOffice. So it's totally essential and, uh, and Collabora, of course, is uh, still part of uh, the Document Foundation serving in various bodies there and uh, supporting it in general. So LibreOffice rocks, we want it to succeed. Um, still, uh, Collabora online is now a separate project. It is hosted on GitHub. GitHub um so we have uh, our own infrastructure uh, so that is uh, like github for the code and review process and weblight for the translations so for the translating the process is uh, still like very similar to what it was uh, um, before on the tdf infrastructure like the the weblight uh, was used even uh, even there uh, on the, uh, at document foundation but for github and the processes have changed tremendously so uh, thank you all who like helped with this transition and who uh, like got used to uh, this these new processes um it is like the tool looks different in the first place then like we started to miss the git review uh, that that we were using in the tdf infrastructure instead like we had to uh, we had to adapt uh, the the commands that are using for pushing to GitHub so that it is uh, uh, it is easier. 
Miklos has done uh, lots of work there so that like uh, there's one command that creates the branches and, and creates the pull request from there. But then on the other hand, the rest of the process um, is like similar to those who uh, who were uh, doing some, some projects on GitHub already. Um, that is connected uh, to that we are starting to build or building uh, our community uh, for Collabora Online. And uh, um, it has shown um, like its uh, uh, its its fruits uh, because uh, uh, like if you can see uh, that there have been like many contributors uh, since the move. So so there were like three thousand six hundred twenty six commits by one hundred thirty seven people, and uh, like this counts both code and uh, trans translations. So one more than 100 people actually didn't have the Collabora email address. So, uh, so, so big thanks to the 71 uh, translators who are not from Collabora and uh, big and huge thanks to the 38 non-Collabora code committers. We appreciate your work uh, that you are doing that. We hope that it is fun for you because uh, I hope that is the ultimate reason uh, for contributing uh, to Collabora Online. It is supposed to be fun. It is supposed to be like feeling well uh, that you are doing that. And if you are not feeling appreciated, we are doing something wrong. And please do tell us like what we should, what we should improve. Uh, from the Collabora people, uh, let me list those uh, who have who have contributed and, and committed stuff uh, into into the Collabora online. But of course, uh, we list also the people uh, who have contributed code. Uh, so thank you guys. Uh, I think some of you are even even now uh, listening to the talk. So I hope that you are able to find your name. Um, so you are a hero when you are contributing code to Collabora Online. Thank you so much. And uh, the same is for the for the translators. It is awesome that that you uh, you are able to uh, to um, help us with translating to so many languages. Thank you. You are heroes too. And some of the people uh, that have been among the committers, and I list here only those that uh, that um, do not uh, have the Collabora uh, address, uh, are uh, present here at the conference and presenting their talks. Uh, so huge thanks, Alexandru, um, for uh, for the talk. How cool is used in uh, one on one. Uh, Gabriel uh, from the same company about stability and cleanup improvements uh, in online. And uh, thank you, Alexander, uh, kinds for all the things uh, that, that, that you are doing for the look and uh, that, that you are going to present, uh, present about that. Of course, uh, Collabora Online cannot exist by itself. Um, I think you all know, but let me just repeat that. Collabora Online just focuses on, on the editing of the documents, editing them collaboratively in the web browser by many people in distant locations. Um, but the actual storage of the files is something that we do not, we do not sort out uh, in Collabora Online. We need to depend uh, on the, on the um, partners or integrators that actually integrate Collabora in, uh, Online into their solution. So um, we are using a wopi alike protocol. Uh, so we have some extensions and, uh, and uh, use uh, some, some ways like how to do it like much more, uh, much more closely um, to your solution so that like you can modify the Collabora online to your needs. You can uh, theme that you can do like whatever, whatever you need. Uh, so that it fits you well. Of course, uh, if it doesn't fit you well and you do not find like how to do that, we are happy to help. And uh, even like you can contribute uh, additional improvements into Collabora Online so that like it fits more into your solution 
or on the other hand like you can work with us uh, as a partner on improving the integration from our side so that it fits your solution much better there's a talk about uh, uh, about uh, integrating so there's sdk creating new integration and of course uh, uh, we have here also presenters of people uh, of uh, of uh, partners uh, and uh, integrators who have done their integration already uh, so huge thank you uh, to Paul uh, for Symphony Bundling, integrating Wopi and Collabora Online, Julio Sertel from Nextcloud for the Nextcloud integration update, Birgit uh, Becker uh, for eGroupware integration update, uh, Shantia Kandhari uh, about Mattermost uh, integration, Ashot uh, will be talking about the Moodle integration and Billy Klocek um, about, uh, about own cloud and Collabora on, um Collaborate online inside uh, their infinite scale. So thank you for being here and uh, being able to present uh, about the, the status and update of the you know, of the integrations that that you are doing. Um, about the practical bits uh, about this conference. So the conference is uh, just one day, just today. It is going to be like quite a long day we have lots of talks um, the infrastructure for this is using big blue button as you have uh, probably noticed uh, the big blue button um, uh, software was provided by Arawa who has uh, created the server setup and uh, Scaleway uh, is providing the bandwidth so thank you both uh, for, sponsor for sponsoring this conference this way um, it makes it much easier for us. Uh, thank you. And uh, regarding the task, um, the tasks are supposed to be like reasonably short. So each task is supposed to be uh, something about 10 minutes. Um, we have grouped them into the blocks of six to seven talks. When you are presenting, it is uh, good to be there for the entire block so because like sometimes uh, the the talk may overrun for a minute or two sometimes it may be a bit shorter so uh, like it is uh, i think better that we do not wait for the like very exact time when the, the talk starts starts it is much better to be there for the uh, for the entire uh, entire slot of these six to seven talks after uh, after these uh, six to seven talks um, in one slot uh, there are questions and answers at the end but i think uh, if there's something that like should be done interactively um i think you shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be afraid to raise your hand and the presenter will be able to see to see it and uh, and react on that in case like it's uh, it fits their style um and uh, like after the questions and answers and there will be a short break um, sometime around the the lunch time in europe there will be like larger break uh, for lunch um, i apologize uh, to people who are from different time zones it is uh, like uh, that we have to adapt it to, to one of the time zones and at the moment like most of the presenters are uh, are from europe so so this was uh, the easiest way like how to how to do it uh, most of the talks will be live. Um, there are a few that are pre-recorded, so they will be uh, they will be run um, uh, from YouTube uh, inside uh, this big blue button. So, like the experience will be very similar to what uh, what you are seeing with the live talks. Um, but most probably, you will experience that the people uh, well are maybe better prepared because they do not feel the stress of uh, of the live streaming and of course it is our first conference i hope that it will be an annual conference uh, but like it is the first one so please bear with us if it's not perfect uh, there are of course things uh, we uh, will be trying to improve like the, we will be uh, and we will be appreciating your your feedback so if you um if you 
uh, will see any room from for the improvement or anything that we should do better please look, let us know the user channels like tell us on the uh, on the uh, on the irc on on or on the telegram or email us to hello cleveronline.com so i think that is mostly it uh, for the technical stuff of the conference and uh, um, so the last thing for me is just to repeat it is awesome that you have here uh, that, that that you are here thank you for much so much for contributing to collabora online being interested in collaboring uh, online being here and i hope like uh, you and i hope you like the conference uh, we will have 36 talks um, and uh, in addition to that the opening closing session uh, by 31 presenters, each session about 10 minutes, um, organized in these uh, blocks, uh, which should to take about uh, one hour. So I hope uh, like you will like this uh, this format of the conference and and yeah, looking forward to what comes next. So that's it from me. So any questions about the organization of the conference or anything? Just maybe a mention that all of this room contents is streamed on all social media. So if you, if you prefer to, to flow there, it's up to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, William. So if there are no uh, no other questions or no other comments. I think uh, we can slowly start with the first real conference call. <laughs> Perfect. No, it, this was also real and it's nice because it gives uh, a lot of context to this first uh, conference. So I think it's nice. And hopefully we will be able to do this again together next year, uh, but no, not just online. So that that's... yes. Yes. That's the spirit, that yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay, so I think I will start slowly, but I th I'm just checking if anyone has some question. If everyone is here. Yeah, I see that people have been arriving as well in the middle of your talk, so that's good. <clears throat> okay, so. I still have some time, but I think I will slowly start. So, Now, uh, uh, oh. also typing better, that's the thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, my computer just <laughs> broke. Okay, so oh, fair enough, yes, it's, it's expected that it flakes. Uh, <laughs> that's all good, you know? Thanks. Mm. <laughs> but it's interesting that you can uh, still hear me. Um, okay, never mind. We have some slides that someone else can share. Yes, we have Marco coming in next uh, on the schedule, so I can share his slide if, if you want to. Yeah, why not? Marco, are you around? We could go for you if you want. Tell us about... The SDK, or are you are you unprepared? What do you think? 
am sharing the presentation. I'm taking ownership of the presenter. Fair enough. Marco, are you with us? This is a pre recorded so. talk. <laughs> This talk walks through the basic steps for integrating Collabor Online's editing capabilities into your existing web app. On the web app, you need to add an iframe where the editing UI and the document itself will be loaded. In fact, Collabor Online is a WAPI client that can be integrated with a WAPI host, that is your web app. To set up the iframe, your application needs to read a discovery XML document from a defined location on the Collaboron Live WAPI client. The discovery service is available at the address displayed in this slide. The response is an XML document that contains a URLSRC property for various file formats. This property specifies the address that you need to use for initiating the iframe that you create for the document editing. To be able to access files securely, your application has to pass an authentication token to a Collabor Online. From the Collabor Online point of view, it can be any random number or string that will be passed as part of the URL when accessing the document storage. The token should be generated according to the requested file and the user who is logged in. Your existing solution has to implement a few WAPI endpoints so that the Collabor Online can download files that the user wants to edit and upload back the updates. As a bare minimum, your application has to support the following four WAPI endpoints. The get file endpoint that sends back the content of the file when the shown URL is invoked using a get verb. The put file endpoint that replaces the file with the body of the post verb when invoked with the shown URL. The put relative file and the point that creates a new file with the body of the post verb for the needs of the save as operation. The check file info and the point that returns at least the base file name and size of the file as JSON data. Finally, you also need to implement a function that generates a unique token for a given file and user. In our SDK documentation site, you can find several examples for integrating Collabor Online with your application. These examples have been implemented by using the most widespread technologies such as PHP, Node.js, TypeScript, React.js, and the Python Django framework. Even more examples will come in the future. So let's start a walk through one of these integration examples. The front end of this sample application is just a simple HTML document which embeds some components. There is a form where you have to enter the address of the dedicated server or virtual machine where you have deployed the Collabor Online WAPI client. There is an iframe where the editing UI and the simple test document are going to be loaded. Moreover, there is a hidden form used for performing a POST request to the WAPI client in order to initiate the iframe. The hidden form looks like the one displayed in this slide. The action attribute has to be set to the URL of the Collabor Online server for editing simple text document. A query parameter named WAPI SRC needs to be appended to such URL and needs to point to the check file info endpoint. In this case, the file ID parameter to be passed to the check file info endpoint is just a simple one. In fact, in this simple example, we are using a fake ID. 
Anyway, in a real application, you should be using the file ID valid for your web app storage. The targeted boot points to the embedded iframe so that submitting the form leads to loading the editing UI and the requested document into the iframe. Finally, the value attribute for the access token input element has to be initialized to the authentication token associated to the requested file. When the form with the Collabora Online server address is submitted, some JavaScript code embedded in index.html is responsible for making a request to an internal endpoint to which the entered server address is passed as a query parameter. The response is used for setting up the hidden form with the appropriate data and then initiating the form submission which performs a post request to the Collabora Online server for getting the editing UI and the requested document loaded into the iframe. The backend of this example application exploits Esper's Node.js library for routing requests to the required WAPI endpoints. There is also an internal endpoint named Collabra URL whose implementation takes care to retrieve and parsing the discovery XML document through the HTTPS and XPath Node.js library. The URL associated to Collabra Online for editing files with mimetype text plane is returned as a response. It is also part of the response a fake token, which in a real case should be generated based on the ID of the requested file and the user logged in. Now let's see the WAPI endpoints implemented by our simple application. As we are going to see all the implemented endpoints have the document ID passed as part of the endpoint path. The check file info endpoint returns information about the file with the given document ID. The response has to be in JSON format and at the minimum it needs to include the file name and the file size. In the display of the code test.txt is just the name of a fake test file to be edited with Collabora Online. The size property is the length of the string returned by the WAPI get file endpoint as file content. In fact, given a request access token and a document ID, the get file endpoint sends back the content of the file. In our example, the implementation is very simple. We just return hello world as the content of a fake test file to be edited. In a real case, you should use the file ID for retrieving it from the web app storage and send back the file content as a response. Finally, our sample application implements the put file endpoint, which replaces the file content with the post request body. In our implementation, we just log to the console the new file content so that it is possible to check that saving the document Collabora Online has triggered this WAPI endpoint and sent back the correct content. In a, real case, in a real case, you should replace the file in the web app storage with the new file content. Thanks to the just illustrated setup, when you click on the Load Collabora Online button, you get the expected result as shown in this screenshot. Thanks for watching this presentation and for any question you can use the contact information displayed in this slide. Perfect. Uh, so I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we do hear you, Pedro. Cool. So it was nice that Marco was able to will able to play the Marco's video. <laughs> no issue, no issue. <laughs> yes. So I will just. Uh,
Try one more time. <laughs> yes, and yes. So can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Yes, yes, we do. I can confirm. Perfect. I'm even two minutes earlier. So that's nice. So uh, right after uh, Marcus' talk, uh, let me uh, show you uh, some of the latest updates and improvements on uh, mobile. So this year we have been uh, a bit uh, busy with many other corners uh, around uh, Collabra Online, but still I think we were sailing and we are sailing in a nice direction um, just when just we look to uh, mobile uh, commits. Uh, starting off with annotations, before viewing annotations and even <clears throat> navigating between them was a convoluted and hard to interact uh, user flow. Uh, you would you'd either see uh, the document or the annotation and you need to go back and forward. And even inserting the annotations, you wouldn't have the possibility to just insert an annotation while browsing uh, a couple, while viewing a couple of annotations. You need to be sure that, ah, okay, I want to insert, and now uh, I'm going to press that insert icon. Uh, that being said, uh, I started a proposal and a very long GitHub issue with uh, steps, with many steps where we, we could improve this user flow. Um, and it was not just me, we iterate, uh, Pranam, Candy, Rashesh, I, and we, we kind of iterate over and we uh, reach some uh, nice solution. Uh, why not uh, reuse the mobile wizard here, uh, display the comments, yes, as, a, as, a, as cards, but cards that can be uh, click, clicked, can be tapped, you can enter in the comment uh, threads, you can have all those actions and of course, additional icons were even provided for that. So modify, reply, remove, resolve, and um, have the F comment right, uh, right there, right on the on the mobile wizard uh, top bar. So for instance, and this even improves uh, documents where, where you are just previewing. Uh, so for instance, here the bisection uh, presentation in PDF from AZ, which you cannot miss. Uh, later today uh, and all this possible thanks for all the effort and work uh, from a premium, of course um, also a mobile wizard additions so uh, the goal was to use one same pattern to reach many complex features <clears throat> uh, so displaying uh, a multitude of uh, uh, components in this example font work we are using an icon view which it also uh, is uh, very easily and uh, very easily adapts to uh, other sizes. So, for instance, even on landscape mode, you are able to view and have everything centered as you uh, would expect. Uh, and improving on what the users depends on. So, uh, all, having all access to all those controls right from the bottom, easy to reach, uh, while having uh, the selection or the text uh, present. So it's, it's always uh, important to have this, uh, um, these two components visible. Um, this uh, was expanded in many, many other uh, mobile wizard applications. So even when you, are, when you need to be prompt with a security warning, let's talk about uh, macro, uh, macros. And if you want to enable, disable, um, or a complex uh, properties from a master view, or even text import, uh, in he, in this case, it makes much more sense to use the full height instead of just a small uh, part of the screen. So there was many improvements done around that. And now it's time to uh, get busy. And it's, <laughs> and it's important to uh, getting the message out there uh, when, the when, when Collabra Online is busy. And it's busy why and what it's doing. Because the more we do that, uh, less, less guessing and more reassuring uh, uh we will we will uh we will also communicate uh, to the to the user so it seems almost the, the 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 application is more responsive even if the if the waiting time is the same so here we have busy pop-ups on the right 
down uh, which are uh, used for uh, ongoing uh, um, messages uh, so processes connecting downloading and on the left here we have a, a snack bar size uh, of a pop-up uh, where it's actually meant for on or off messages uh, that can have uh, an action uh, button or not interesting uh, and i will be talking a little bit uh, further later today about busy pop-ups as well uh, but it's how we do this animation on the busy pop-up and how dynamically distinct how dynamically the color changes. so don't uh, miss that um, later on to do I would love to expand this level of consistency across other feedback uh, pop-ups. Uh, so it includes uh, when the doc document is inactive or even a uh, clipboard message, for instance, when you need to download content, etc. Um, using the empty states, it's a, a, another, uh, another nice update um, for guidance. So uh, when you uh, go to pl places, in this case, this panel where there is no information, uh, having just an empty thingy going, uh, hanging there, it looks like a glitch and it doesn't help no one. And it even makes the, the features less uh, discoverable. So while not using that uh, for guidance, showing what it will uh, appear there and by the way why not sh why not showing a relevant action that user might want to uh, tap next up we have context actions but uh, this time on mobile so um and thank big thanks to andreas Keynes. i've been it's it's a work in progress i've been just uh, trying to facilitate his his work here but basically depending depending on the selections depending on the context you will have different icons appearing on the bottom toolbar don't miss out also his, his talk i think he's going to mention uh this as well and many other fixes uh, like there is so many fixes like uh I don't know, like around spreadsheets, uh, revamped tabs, um, revamped slide sorter uh, with many improvements, uh, and also canvas follow ups after the cool work from uh, Gokai, uh, which is also going to speak, uh, he's going to have a talk just uh, about uh, the canvas. Uh, and he, have, he has nice diagrams, so you cannot miss that. Um, new slimmer formula bar on, on mobile. Um, my dog they're very happy <laughs> within a revamped table control so you are able to control the tables um, but they are discrete enough that you can still see text that might be above a table or under the table or side by side with the table um, the the top uh, the top toolbar on mo on on mobile was also revamped so there was many alignment fixes um, and oh and i also forgot here even to mention the inside of the hamburger menu we also had many uh, alignment uh, fixes and uh, additional icons um spreadsheet has some new cool uh, read only mode so uh, until now uh, if you were in a read only mode meaning before you tap the edit uh, uh, fab button you would um, you'd see every many controls that you don't need like uh, formula bar and now everything slimmer not only in edit mode but also on uh, read only mode um, and still the, the the nice thing about this is that uh, and we can be excited too is that uh, there is plans and uh, easy hacks and many things around uh, github as well uh that we can improve upon uh so i think it can only get uh better so i hope it didn't go too fast um but here are some links that maybe some of you already know uh maybe some of you uh still uh, didn't see uh so we have our um uh, our uh, io website where is our community website we'll have a talk about that community website and how to contribute to that later on as well uh, the forum and how to push our first pull request and uh, why not uh, you know hang hang around in our weekly uh, cool meetings 
or on any uh, I, 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 IRS uh, or Matrix or uh, any of those channels. So I think uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Um, I don't know if you have any doubt, have any, any question? Yes, question. Can we? Yes. So I think I'm, yeah, I'm on my time. So I will save those questions uh, and I will answer in the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks, Pedro. Great to see that. And so, yeah, yeah, so mostly I think the questions will be sort of piled up uh, and put at the end of the block. So who's next? Hello, hello. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. your slides. Okay, Maybe it's share the screen. Yes, hopefully if you're given the power, the giddy power by uh, William or Pedro or someone, then you should get that extra button at the bottom of your screen. Um, yeah, R Rashesh, you are already the presenter, so you just need to press the icon right next to after. share your video button. Yes. You know? yeah. Manage presentation. Mm. Rash, it's in the group of four buttons that are in the middle at the bottom of your screen. So there is the right, there is an arrow pointing to it on the Welcome to Cool Days background with some text saying okay. share screen. I hope. Cannot find the button to say. Ah, yeah, now, yeah. So. Uh, is, it, is it visible? Oh, coming, coming, looking very promising. Yes. Go, excellent. Now you are sharing, uh... Uh, yes. So... However, let's just hide the layouts and, and carry on. Yeah, because so I think yours. Hide the sidebar, uh, then you can. Okay, but we might spend half the talk doing that. <laughs> uh, but never mind. We will. We will get that. See, the, the real trick is to, um, well, press F five first, or, or share the whole screen. But then you have to yes. be careful of some okay. other things that you have okay. on the screen, or, or just hide the sidebar. I do most of my presentations just with the the, the um, sidebar yeah. hidden. Is it visible? Then. No, but it's coming. Yep, perfect. Look at that. Well done, Raj. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, Cypress and features of Cypress, and I'll show you how is how it is easy to write the test for Cypress. So, what is Cypress? Uh, a tool for reliably testing anything that runs in a web browser. So. Uh, it is it is built on Node.js uh, and packed as an npm module as it's uh, as it is based on a Node.js environment you it uses javascript but 90% of the coding is done uh, using uh, it, uh, using the uh, cypress inbuilt commands uh, it also uh, comes packed with uh, jquery so you can use jquery methods and cypress tests most of the uh, uh, testing tools operate by running uh, uh, outside of the browser and executing a remote command across the network. But uh, the Cypress engine directly operates inside the browser. In other words, it is a browser that is executing your test code. Let's talk about some features uh, for Cypress. The first one is time travel. Every time, uh, every every time a Cypress uh, runs a command, it will take a screenshot of each com uh, each it's that after after running that command uh, and second feature debugability as you you can you can run cypress in on your browser you can directly if if there are some failures you can directly debug the application third one is automatic waiting uh, cypress if for example if uh, if you want to click on button and the button is still not available in dom and Cypress will automatically wait for wait, wait for uh, for for the DOM to to get the to get the button. 
and the fourth one and screenshot and video if if there are some cypress failure the cypress will take a screenshot and if you want to record a video of whole testing you can also do that uh, in your for setup and installation for your personal project you can install cypress uh, by running npm command but for online you just have to add a an extra flag called enable cypress in your configuration on your configuration command once you do that, uh, you can move to change directory to Cypress test folder and uh, and run make run desktop command and you and uh, and it will start uh, interactive uh, Cypress. Uh, you can also run a specific uh, spec uh, spec file directly uh, from from your CLI. Uh, Let's see how can we write a Cypress test. There are generally three phases to write a Cypress test. Uh, first one is set up an application state. Second one is take an action. And third is like an assertion about the resulting application state. Let's see the first one. Uh, first step first step is to visit the web application on which you want to perform the test. For, for that we have a helper function called before all that which will take care of it and it will open also open the particular test document on which you want to test for uh, for example in this case we have test.odt uh, if we run this then it will show something like this On, uh, on the left, every time uh, Cypress uh, runs uh, command, it will log out that command. So on the left, you, uh, on the left of test, uh, you can see that. And the second one is take an action. Uh, for for this example, we have taken uh, we have written test for insert shape. So we have to uh, do the ticking button and uh, all these things to insert a shape. The last step, last step is to assert the changes. As we got the new state of the document, we need to assert the changes. For this example, we need to make sure the image is inserted in the document. And there is a small video for. Uh, in, in online, uh, we have two two UIs: uh, notebook by UI and uh, classic UI. By default, uh, by default, uh, Cypress runs on classic UI. All the, uh, but uh, but in so 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 to run the test with the notebook by UI, you just need to pass uh, a notebook bar parameter uh, when you run make when you when you execute make run command. Uh, it makes sense to use the same spec file uh, for notebook bar because most of the things remain same only only the ui changes so i, I have just uh, converted that insert shape uh, test to uh, make compatible with the notebook bar Uh, the, um, type, uh, one of the limitations of Cypress is that you can't uh, test multiple types or multiple browser windows at the same time. So for the multi-user test in online, we have a workaround. We use uh, two iframes on the same type to multi-user test. We can run multi-user test. Uh, we can execute multi-user test using a um, make command. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Perfect. Thanks. So next up, we have uh, next up we have Gokai with a canvas for rendering uh, UX. So Hello. Hi. 
Uh, let me, I don't know if you already took the presenter or I can just give you the presenter. I just need to find where is your avatar, so many people. Yes, perfect. And make the presenter. I think you now see an extra icon down to share the screen, right? Yes, uh, thank you. Perfect, no problem. Go ahead. Um, yes, I'm, uh, I'm setting it right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, can, you, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. It's uh, looking great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, my presentation uh, will be uh, like a story, <laughs> uh, more of a story uh, than uh, code reading and showing. Uh, we we had uh, we will talk about CAMS rendering for UX, and we will uh, talk about how it started and how it went, and what we did at the end. Uh, first of all, we were uh, we were issuing some troubles with uh, tiled rendering. You know, uh, now Colabora Online is rendering uh, the document as tiles, uh, 256 pixels uh, in size, and the, the user then can interact with the tiles. And of course, the users uh, see the tiles uh, uh, next to each other and without gaps, uh, so the document is uh, seems like uh, when you when you read it on the desktop version, and you can uh, comfortably use it uh, with Collabora Online. So we were having troubles. Uh, we were uh, having some issues with uh, drawing the tiles onto screen, and uh, because of CSS and HTML and rapid changing of the rules sometimes, and also uh, we were having. Uh, some troubles with um, uh, with rendering the UI fast because you know, uh, like in Calc, uh, user can scroll uh, scroll the document very fast, and the document needs to um, answer it uh, quickly. So we, at the end, we uh, decided to use a canvas for drawing the tiles instead of HTML elements, other image elements. And we also wanted to draw um, headers and uh, row headers and column headers like uh, and li uh, the other uh, similar things in onto canvas, uh, a canvas element. Uh, this journey began uh, like this. And then we listed the uh, advantages uh, of using this, of course, before starting the work, uh, then we will, uh, we end up with uh, something like, like this list, like in implementation will be easy. Uh, it will be easier to maintain and improve. And we will have the same look in different devices. And we will uh, be able to remove some third party libraries. Uh, so it adds to uh, maintainability and it will be touch ready uh, and we wouldn't have uh, to use canvas only for drawing we will still be able to use html elements so these were the um, benefits uh, of the idea and we and for for the third party libraries uh, of course they are uh, they are useful uh, but when it can't, when they cannot uh, couple with your code very good, then you may uh, you may have some difficulties, or you may have better uh, you may have a better idea or library which is created uh, inside the company by you. And we so we are now using of course the canvas and let's uh, let me talk about the implementation the tiles uh, the tiles uh, should be interactable user users uh, need to be of course able to click on them scroll them uh, so the document and at the end we decided to centralize the event handling and drawings with a new class, which we call canvas section container. We, uh, 
we collected all these ideas uh, and we tried, of course, because uh, before this uh, using uh, this new class and tested the idea. Then uh, we created a new class which would be able to remove some third party libraries that didn't uh, work uh, well with our code base. And we added uh, simplifications and added some flexibility into our code. And now maintaining and improving the code base is uh, easier, much more easier, I hope. We are still working on them, of course, working on them. And the idea we had uh, and implemented at first place, uh, the first version of it was something like this. Uh, a UI designer uh, on accounts HTML element. And in this view, if user uh, resize the window, resizes the window, uh, the scroll area or something else uh, text will be on the uh, will be on the right again, and row headers will be on the left again. The all the all the elements, all the sections uh, will keep their places relative to the screen. So we can now. Uh, create uh, row headers, column headers, and maybe in the future, in the future, uh, a bottom section uh, for calc tabs. We don't, uh, we don't need them, but uh, we could have them if we wanted to. And and tiles, of course, in the middle of the screen and on the canvas. So uh, and these sections, we call them section. Uh, will have uh, their own files and will have their own ev event handlers and those events will be propagated from canvas section container itself so canvas section container uh, is the root uh, of the event handling so, uh, uh, and uh, so the event handling is center will be centralized and there were challenges, uh, of course. For example, event propagation. Uh, a canvas element can, of course, uh, get the events, handle the events, but uh, and then it, it can send the event to the target section. Like in here, if a mouse is on tiles section, then canvas element can catch that event and inform the tiles section uh, that mouse is moving around it. Uh, or row headers of uh, again canvas element can handle that event and inform row headers section but when if uh, when we need a tile section and a scroll section uh, on top of each other like a layered st structure then canvas section container needs to propagate the event to uh, to both to both of the sections so this was uh, one of the uh, challenges we had. And then we added, of course, uh, a propagator, uh, propagation uh, feature to canvas section container. So, um, and this is uh, this picture uh, shows that we are using propagate on click and it propagates, it sends the same event to the uh, sections one by one from top to bottom and they can and they can handle the event uh, on their files on their class structure and one of the uh, issues we were uh, we were having we had uh, before uh, before canvas section container uh, multi touch uh, support with uh, touch uh, touch and uh, mouse uh, screen you know, with some screens you can touch and the screen and also you can use a mouse uh, and keyboard. Uh, they are both enabled. So some libraries maybe may have some uh, difficulties with these devices. Uh, and we, while we implement a new class, uh, we also solve these issues and uh, remove those uh, third party libraries and ensured that our new uh, software works with devices, uh, mouse and touch screen enabled uh, at the same time. <coughs> uh, 
uh, this is a this is a view from the code uh, that it's uh, it's developed by us and crisp images. My, this one uh, the most uh, difficult one uh, and there's thanks to Michael and Candy uh, for the patient because it took a it took quite some time for me to understand what <laughs> what they were talking about so and but the the idea is simple at the end uh, I'm talking about uh, I hope you can hear me right yes yes, yes. Thank you. And uh, the thing was uh, now the mm, the latest software. Uh, it started with Chrome. Uh, at least uh, I I realized it with Chrome uh, browser. Uh, there is a device pixel ratio uh, feature now uh, for for some time, and with this device pixel ratio is higher in mobile devices and lower in uh, general, I am generally speaking, uh, lower in desktop, it's, uh, it equals to one generally. And with this device pixel ratio, our images were smaller on uh, mobile devices or were blurry. And that was the main issue we were having because mm, if, if it is blurry, it, it is not usable. And uh, it was the main reason we wanted to use canvas uh, for drawing and one of the main reasons uh, with performance of course and so these uh, our tiles uh, were drawn with half sized and the solution was uh, using more tiles of course and we used more tiles and we mm, rounded the rounded the pixels uh, so uh, every tile is position, positioned with uh, uh, with integer pixels, not uh, floaty ones, float ones, because if you use uh, float pixels, float coordinates with uh, pixels, then the images are blurry again. And it was difficult, yes. Uh, but uh, we, it is easy to explain. Uh, I hope I could explain, but it was difficult to implement, and it was difficult to uh, see the uh, see the important points uh, with a huge code base, of course. And at the end, we uh, we prepared something like this, um, uh, like something you see uh, in this view, and we have now our scroll bar with our third-party libraries and column headers and row headers. Uh, drawn onto canvas, uh, of course, along with tiles, uh, as you can see, and also side cursor and many more things drawn onto canvas, and they are uh, they are manageable. They are uh, using the centralized event handling uh, on their each uh, and each one of them uh, their own section file, and it is published. Thank you for watching, listening. That's all from me. Perfect. Uh, thanks. So next up, we have uh, Mart. Um, can you hear me, Mart? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So Mart, uh, I think the floor is yours uh, with uh, yes. editing simulation. Right. Yes, yes. Uh, Perfect. Trying to share my screen. Yes. Is it visible? Yes, but first, uh, uh, please kill the, the share screen and uh, do the pres and press F5 so you can then uh, pick the presentation window because right now we okay. see the indeed window. Perfect. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay. 
So, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Mart. Um, I work for Colabora Online uh, as a consultant software engineer for uh, two and a half years, I think. So, this presentation is about uh, editing simulation. Uh, so, what is it? It's a tool I worked on recently. It is about simulating the typing experience. It simulates some number of people in the same document and typing some text, basically. Uh, this helps us to check what is going on at the background when people are using Collabora Online. So, uh, why is it needed? So, the performance is really vital when it comes to editing uh, because it is mostly typing. It is really difficult to measure the performance uh, with single person or even multiple people in the document because we have to record things at the background, but we can't adjust some variables like the typing speed and, and duration, and we can't be really sure about the issues without these constant test cases. So we, need a, we needed a tool to automate this process and it would give us results that we can read. <clears throat> so with this tool, we can adjust typing speed, duration, and number of people. And not every case is implemented, of course, but we can expand it to our needs and measure exactly how much time a part of the code takes and use this information to fix problems and improve the overall experience. So how does it work? So uh, the tool is written in Node.js. It consists of two parts. The first part is responsible for um, launching LOL WSD instance and other child node processes. It also controls the life cycle of these processes. Uh, the second part is the child node processes. Each process represents the single view that connects to the document and does the editing part. So JS DOM is used in the second uh, second part to load the front end uh, of the Collabora Online, and this part does the connection to the document. And each view jumps to a different location in the document and uh, with different zoom levels, and they start typing. This operation is done by sending commands to the LOL WSD with WebSocket. And we can have basically references of everything uh, with the help of JSTOM. In this case, we have the reference to the WebSocket object and we use, the, we use it to send the messages. Since um, this tool is only simulating editing, we need to use other tools like Perf from Linux tools to measure the C++ performance and uh, to check what's going on in the background. But of course, we have other tools. Uh, I guess this year, uh, Tor has worked on that to check other types of uh, performance measurements. So uh, to test it, you can go to the Lolifleet folder and just type make perf test. So as a conclusion, uh, we discovered some easy, easy problems and uh, several performance gains up to 30%. And one of them re was related to the sidebar. I discovered the redundant piece of code in the sidebar code uh, was causing a reallocation of the whole sidebar and its child elements on each case stroke. And of course, other uh, 
other work done by Michael, Miklos, Thor, Noel, and Lubosch. And so I'm sorry if I forgot anyone else. And they did uh, great, great things to improve the performance. And the four sidebar, uh, I this is before my patch, and uh, this is this was happening each time we each each keystroke basically and uh, you can see the re dark red uh, line and up and the pile above that it's going up and up and with the one line patch I was able to reduce it down to this and that's all for me thank you thank you Mertz Thanks. So next up. Very cool. Have... <laughs> yeah. So next up we have uh, Prana Pranam. So I'm just going to make a presenter. Uh, can you hear me, Pranam? Hello, hello. Yes, I can hear. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you can share the whole screen. Yes, exactly. And it's great that you are sharing your camera because nobody is doing this. So it's pretty gr great to see your face when you are presenting something. So, yes. And I hope I'm looking handsome. Y yes, yes, we see There's everything. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, so let's get started. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, today, uh, everyone wants to have uh, high scalability and virtually zero downtime. Uh, in that case, uh, Kubernetes is here to rescue us. And with the increasing demand of Kubernetes, uh, it, it is really great that uh, we enable Colibor Online uh, to be able to deploy on the Kubernetes. And today, I'll show how to do that, uh, how it works. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, we can deploy Colibor Online as any other uh, general application. Uh, you, you just set, we have provided the configuration and you just uh, uh, make service available and you connect with the service and then there are as many pods as you want. And those are different instances of the Colibora. But uh, the Colibora would not work as a simple application why because uh, when you are using collabora online with collaborative editing features these pods do not communicate with each other so suppose uh, two different users are opening the same document at at the same time there are chances that one request would go to this pod and another request would go to this pod and because they do not communicate with each other none of the user would be able to see that another person is editing the same document at the same time. So both the user will be able to edit it and save it, but they won't be able to see each other. And to see the changes, they have to reload the document, which is quite not good thing for the users. So in that case, uh, in the Collabora Online, when you are trying to use Collabora Online in Kubernetes, Ingress is not an optional thing. It, it becomes mandatory and we have to use it for the load balancing. We load balance it based on the uh, URL parameter, WAPI SRC. For the same document, uh, all the, for the same document, WAPI SRC parameter is always going to be the same. So we decide uh, if the WAPI SRC parameter is same, then all the requests for that parameter should go into the same pod. So the collaborative editing feature would work properly in that case. And then uh, the entire structure would look something like this. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I am going to show a little demo and uh, show how e easy it is to uh, deploy Collabora Online on the, uh, on the Kubernetes. First and foremost thing is uh, we have to get started with the Minikube. I'm using Minikube for the demonstration here. Uh, so that is the very first thing. 
The second thing we would like to do here is uh, enable the ingress once we are up and running. By the way, all these instructions can be found on the uh, Collabora SDK. Don't hesitate to increase your, your font size on your console if you if you can. With control plus it should do the trick if you Yes our mouse will. Thanks. I hope uh, it is visible now. Uh, this is an optional thing. You can also skip it, but I like to keep all the things in one namespace, related things. And the last thing uh, we we have to do is uh, install the ham chart. And we, we have already provided that all the configuration and it's up and running. Now let's just check how it is going. Uh, usually, uh, this takes uh, pod takes a couple of minutes to get up and running. And meanwhile, I think I have time. And if there are any questions, I can take it. Why not? Uh, so thanks. It's, it's wonderful to see it all slowly uh, coming to life. Look at that. I don't know. <laughs> so, do we have questions from people for that sort of block of, of speakers? Is there any uh, anyone with questions? If so, why don't you turn on your your uh, you know, camera and uh, smile at us? In fact, it'd be good if the speakers who, who are here uh, could do could do that, uh, so that we can uh, answer any questions or discuss anything there. I've seen a question earlier in the chat. Uh asked by Andreas Kainz uh, about a GS formula bar, but this was for previous talk. Yes, 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 it was for my talk, yes. So first question was, can we hide toolbars and show them like browsers do, swipe up, down? So this was really uh, related to the mobile uh, design improvement talk. Yes, so this is a nice idea. I think we have even discussed this <clears throat> internal and even in the community meetings. Uh, that will be nice that in some occasions on when you are on mobile and you are you know scrolling uh through a lengthy document maybe some of the things could could be hidden and then some of the other things could appear again if you swipe back yeah it's like a very common user pattern uh in the mobile realm but uh, no one is working on that basically that is a nice idea <laughs> Uh, and it's a nice idea to hack on. Who knows? And the second question is: Is there a is there a plan to use the JS formula bar? Yeah, because Call could get some workflow uh, love. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. <clears throat> I know. Like, yes. we, so, so yeah, can, he, can he can tell you about? Or, or, well, we have hypothetical plans for JS formula bars. Yes, yeah. yeah, too. <laughs> Unfortunately, like it is uh, this very complicated thing, uh, just because like in the formula bar you want to show the formatting like uh, if you have something in ball like uh, it, it should be in formula bar in ball and like it should be preserved like when you when you are actually like updating the things in the in this formula bar in general like uh, showing that as uh, as in ball like is not uh, not something like that that would be like crucial for the feature but still like maintaining maintaining the formatting so like if you get into a bold word uh, in the formula bar and like you continue typing like it should stay bold like when, when, when you are typing that so um so like we have some ideas like how to do that uh, but none of them is trivial so it is not happening in the near future i'm afraid but anyone that wants to get involved in doing that uh, we have some great design ideas and points to uh, to wrestle with so yeah do do you get uh... Get involved, yeah, and, and we should be able to hope keep with uh, lots of videos. Oh, uh, Alexandru, can you not see us then, or uh, you? Uh... Hey, life, good to see you. Look at this, fantastic. Um, other questions? I think. Um... Shoot. In meantime, uh, as, as we can see, the pods are up and running, and 
the default uh, URL we have configured with is this. As you can see, uh, it sends OK, which means that it is up and running. I can also demonstrate it with the uh, next cloud. Uh, so it is up and running already. And this is a document. Uh, let me just try to add another user there. And you will see it still works. Cool. So I think Nicholas was asking if we support Kubernetes. And the answer, of course, is yes. And uh, we have people out there using it uh, even, which is, which is extraordinary. See, <laughs> as you can see, the, there are different users. And I am editing. And you can see changes in the board. So collaborator editing feature works too. And by default, uh, Collabora is currently providing two configurations. Uh, for HA proxy and another is engines, which I introduced this morning. So really? <laughs> uh, I think that's it from my side. And thank you. Thanks so much, Pranam. Really cool. And uh, it's not not uh, not at all easy to make all of these things work. I think if you unshare your screen, Pranam, it's possible we can see more of each other, which would be uh, which would be kind of cool. What with this lonely world of uh, you know horrific COVID lockdownage that uh, that, that we live in, um, say. So, Cool. Um, or maybe we can't. Hey, what I, how does one play with this? Ah, if you click hide presentation with a little minus at the top, then yes. you, can, you can see bigger people, uh, which, which is cool. Um, so yes, Nicholas, we do we do support it, and I think we should probably market it more. You know that we uh, that we do probably. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm sure Cora is taking notes uh, somewhere in the background, and uh, that's probably one of the things that we should uh, get done. Um, what other questions? Any other questions from people on any of that? Uh, Marco, are you with us, or are you uh, you are uh, you're hiding? Perhaps I think Marco is a bit busy this morning uh, at exactly this time. For some reason, we shuffled his talk to an unhelpful time. Um, so I think uh, Andreas was asking about the the dark theme uh -huh. for Clubber Online. Hi. Ah, yes. Um, I have my third question, nobody answered. <laughs> um, um, dark team, uh, do you want do we want to prepare a dark team for co? Or yes, early or it's too early. Right. Pedro, what do you think? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, actually, there is already some bits, like for instance, the uh, uh, let's let's talk about the Android shell that uh, already has some work around the dark theme. But when we are talking about uh, Collabora Online, really, so you know the interface around the document, uh, not yet. There was some efforts, but still, uh, I, I guess, I guess we just have too many things to hack. Uh, before I arrive to that stage. Uh, and we would also I would like to have not only just, you know, dark, dark mode in a way that we just invert everything, even if it looks bad. Uh, we want to have it nicely. And this includes even uh, maybe to uh, maybe even inverting the color of the document itself, you know, because what's the point of having dark mode when the interface is black and then you have this shining A4 document <laughs> right in your cornea. It's even worse. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. But Go ahead. Having, having said that, the, the biggest blocker for this so far uh, was the sidebar uh, because like it was uh, it was rooted from the from the core. Uh, from LibreOffice, so uh, so that was the biggest blocker. And in uh, like uh, Clubber Online 2021, like uh, we are overcoming this this biggest blocker. Uh, so like it is increasingly possible for the for the inverting the document itself. Uh, like LibreOffice has this functionality, so like uh, it should be possible to insert the document. Uh, sorry, invert the document. Um, the again. Uh, it is not trivial because uh, like uh, this uh, has to be somehow purview. So some of the users like uh, would like to be in the dark mode and some of the users would like to be in the, uh, in the like not, not, not dark mode. But uh, like it could be somehow like incremental that the, first of all, like it would be enabled that, that like one uh, that like 
there would be some server side setting for this, or I don't know, like per, per user or whatever with this possibility. But for the UI, I think it is increasing the possible. So, uh, so Andreas, is, uh, if you are somehow interested in this, um, talk to Pedro uh, how, uh, how to proceed with that. Um, I think in CO 2021, like it's, uh, it's now, um, very probable or very, very probable that we will get some, some reasonably good result, um, in things, uh, like writer and impress, it will be harder in cult because of the rooted, um, uh, formula bar again. Uh, and, uh, of course, with this limitation of the documents, uh, like having to be all either dark or, uh, or light. I, um, so I think we can fix that bit with as, as we do for the watermarking uh, with an extra bit uh, in that that yes 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 mark. but like it is some some engineering and some, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. some kind of switching <laughs> inside the, the tile rendering yeah. and having to to render each tile twice actually and what the hell like, intersects with theming as well like what how, how does what happens in you know if you have a dark mode in your outer frame and you're starting to push colors through how does that how do those two things intersect I don't know <laughs> <laughs> Pedro smiles and nods. Yes, it's it's not entirely clear. But anyway, for, for mobile devices where we have one user and one theme, you know, we should get something really cool, um, which yeah. I guess is the big the big use case of people lying in bed reading their DocX uh, ODT, you know, whatever, <laughs> at night and not wanting to disturb their spouse or, or whatever it happens to be. So, uh, yeah. Um, yes, cool. We have should... one more question here from Nikos. <laughs> so, as the sidebar is uh, JS HTML now, will the other old tuned uh, dialogues follow to get migrated to, to to that as well? So, I I think that <laughs> the goal is that wherever is possible and wherever there is more disadvantages than the advantages, yes, I think that's the direction. I think Candy can speak about that as well. The best would be if Shimon, uh, Shimon yes. <laughs> speaks about this. So, so but I'm not sure Shimon, if he's here. With us here? Uh, yeah, I think he's not here. Uh, but I, I can just, uh, let me see. I will try to ping him. So, so in general, uh, like this is the direction we would like to, to have and, and go. Uh, of course, like for the larger dialogues, uh, no, I think I think the the tapped bar, the double decker tapped bars uh, at the uh, in the dialogues are not implemented yet um, uh, for exactly. the for the dialogues. So I think that is the biggest blocker. Um, but doable in general, like uh, the, these are well built. Uh, the infrastructure for that is there in the core. Uh, so so it needs to be uh, needs to be just implemented. Yes, and uh, once this is done, it actually will improve a lot because th th those steps, <laughs> once we have that as native, uh, you know, a lot of these reports we sometimes receive from users that, you know, they press a tab and then the whole dialogue shuffles around, yeah, because the order of the tabs change. Even that, suddenly, it's much easier to, to improve. So, yeah, I cannot wait until we have that. Um, and the formula bar? Is there a plan to uh, replace it with JSON? Because on mobile, it it is yeah. a bit a showstopper in Focal. So we talked about that earlier. I think the problem is synchronizing the attributes uh, with the plain text there, and uh, that's something that requires a big chunk of engineering um, to get right. Okay. Um, so one thing, Gokka, I was, I was thrilled by your talk, <clears throat> as you know, and the uh, the canvas pixel crispness uh, work. That's really good. And I was just doing some competitive review yesterday with Office 365 online Microsoft's uh, product. And you'll be pleased to know uh, that if you load a, a doc document on, on their server, um, not only does it render incredibly blurrily, um, but it also renders with false color around the, the things uh, interpolated up as well. So they're, they're clearly rendering it for like a sub pixel clear type and then scaling it. So you see like these horrible fuzzy colors so you know like uh we're, we're, we're really kicking some backside there i think that's uh that's uh, compared to the competition thank you thank you for uh telling sharing this information <laughs> we worked a lot and thank you uh also john uh it was incredible and it was fun of course uh, at the same time well i'm glad you liked it great great result um what else oh gabriel there's a kubernetes question uh, for Pranav. 
and says, how are the documents yes. distributed between pods and how does it work in practice? Uh, so basically, the uh, it doesn't matter how many documents, if, if it is the same document, uh, we it has to go into the same pod, otherwise we, uh, the default configuration is rely on the cloud provider's load balancing and we do not provide any additional uh, load balancing apart from that based on the OPSRC parameter. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I think we discussed at some point this at cool meetings, but I was just uh, wondering if there are any news. So from what I remember, uh, uh, the distribution is made on OPSRC. Uh, hash is uh, uh, generated from uh, OPSRC and then based on that hash, a pod is uh, chosen. So, uh, uh, of course, it did, uh, here uh, it could be possible uh, that some issues will arise. Uh, so, for example, all the pods will be distributed to the same, all the documents will be dis distributed to the same pod. So, I was uh, curious in practice, uh, uh the hash that you are using is working well uh how the distribution is i mean uh, did you encounter it uh, cases like uh, uh one pod has i don't know too many documents assigned uh, in comparison with the other pods or something like that uh, not so, so maybe let me answer that question gabriel so yeah. we didn't we didn't do uh, any kind of like uh, real stress testing uh, uh, of this. Uh, so it was that we uh, we came up with the setup and gave it to the customers that are using Kubernetes and they didn't complain. So uh, the assumption is that uh, that that it works well, uh, but uh, like we didn't do the the stress testing ourselves uh, to the level uh, that we would be able to tell you tell you like. Yeah, it absolutely like rocks and, and distributes perfectly. Uh, that's uh, something we cannot we cannot tell you at, the, at this very moment. And of course, it's 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 based on a hash of the WAPI source, which comes from the integration. So if the integration wants to do a hash attack on, on the uh, on the pod distribution uh, algorithm, then no doubt it can. But that seems like quite a self defeating approach. You know, I don't know. So so ha have a reasonably sensible WAPI source. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that, that's one thing. And the, the other thing, uh, Gabriel, when we were talking um, like the last time about the details for this, so, so there is the setting, uh, and I do not recall it off the top of my head, uh, that, that actually uh, like, uh, tells, uh, tells uh, the ingress uh, to, uh, to keep the hashes stable for those that were already assigned. So mm -hmm. Uh, I do not recall, uh, Pranam will recall the, the name of this thing, right? Uh, uh, there was this setting that uh, that, that made this uh, hash stable for the, like, when, when you add more pods, uh, that like, okay, yeah, like it is distributed to more stuff, but like what was created so far, it still goes to the to the old ones. Uh, but I don't, do not recall the name of the, of this setting there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it sounds like Ralph has some experience here. Ralph, do you want to, do you want to tell us? You, you say it's it's going well for you, the Kubernetes uh, distribution. Uh, do you want to talk or, or share your video or I don't know? That sounds encouraging. Ralph? No? Ah, life you're almost typing instead. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. True. Uh, it needs a couple of key presses. Yeah, the dis distribution is okay, but it's far from being equal. Um so far i would say yeah it's i don't see how we can make it better apart from really using a different hash and doing that completely in the integration and keeping track how many people are already on which document um that would be the only thing and basically create an artificial hash for the distribution yeah well, yeah Okay, so uh, yeah, well, there are solutions. So, for example, we are using a proxy for this, and we ensure programmatically that uh, there is a uh, there is a, a well distribution between the ports. But in this case, you need a proxy, a custom proxy. So, I think one of the things we're interested in from a roadmap perspective is getting that feedback on on how well that's going or not. 
And then, you know, obviously, you know, it makes sense for us to produce a, a balancing a proxy that will work out not just how many docu you know, how many documents, but how many users and, and what load is on those machines. And then maybe even give hints for, for scaling out and up, and up and down and so on. Um, so yeah, that, that's certainly something that's in the back of my mind on the roadmap. And uh, you know, if, if customers are having grief with that, then let us know. And, uh, yeah, so we use a proxy and the proxy also runs a script before it sends someone actually on the Collabora cluster so that we can monitor um, how many documents a customer opens and also to be able to report back to Collabora how many uh, users each domain uh, has and obviously that could also be used uh, to do a more clever approach with the hash. Mm -hmm. But as a, we, we are currently not using it, but we only have um, at the moment three pods in use and they are, as I said, um, sometimes one pod has like double the load of the other ones, but it is still okay, so I haven't spent any time and effort to, to improve it. So Ralph, no. that script sounds really, really interesting. And if you could just share your configuration on the forum, I think that would be interesting to lots of people generally. So uh, if, if that's easy to do, you know, you're, yeah, you're, so you're basically, your um, I just, when uh, Collabora opens the document, that URL goes to a little PHP script. The PHP mm -hmm. script basically looks at the whoopee source and ecoware itself also sends an extra parameter which is not in the collabora protocol okay. which uh, denominates the user who is using the document mm -hmm. and that gets recorded in a database and based on that uh, i just proxy the original document through the php script and from that on basically my php script is out of the whole equation and everything goes directly to the engines proxy yeah that, that'd be wonderful but if, if there is some small cut down example or something you could put on the forum i think that'd be really useful for other people and for us to see as yeah well. i can it. do yeah. that i mean i also have i think i shared it in one of the tickets i opened i have now a, a way that i'm able out of our monitoring to go to the different admin screens Oh, cool. because that's also very helpful for troubleshooting mm -hmm. uh, because you have the customers reporting uh, this document doesn't open anymore but then you have some trouble <laughs> which <laughs> of the which pods server. is actually serving the document yeah, yeah, yeah. and now we are at least able to then select the pods see that document and go to the admin screen of that pod and can cancel it or can see the pot has a problem and um, yeah, kill the pot. Uh, so, so regarding the idea of having a proxy, uh, uh, there is another advantage. Uh, you can uh, not only spread evenly uh, the uh, documents between pods, but you can uh, take into account also the um, uh, resources usage. This is something that uh, we don't have yet, but we have in mind to do it at some point. To take into account, for, for example, there could be only two documents on a on a pod which can consume almost 100% of resources, and on the other pod uh, you can have uh, 10 uh, documents which can uh, use only half of the resources. So in order to take advantage of these differences, Okay, not only to spread evenly, but uh, to spread based on resources. I think uh, it's uh, it will be a, a good idea to have this. Definitely, definitely. And I think yeah, I mean, it's basically like the Kubernetes scheduler. When a new document arrives, you can just select the pod which has the uh, least of the load and the uh, most of the resources available and schedule it there. I mean, yeah. it might not help perfectly because it could happen that a hundred other users want to join that document mm. but yeah as we, we could do a much better in that regard yeah yeah definitely that's all for all sorts of amazing things are possible i mean like we, we could shut the document you know and migrate it almost transparently to another node if, if you know like in theory there's no real reason why you can't dynamically rebalance the document if almost transparently i mean not not fully transparent, but uh, 
And yeah, if you stop fighting for too long, you may find yourself rebalanced to another load and never notice. But uh, let's see. Let's see. But I think there is still one small problem. When Kubernetes shuts down one of the Collabora nodes, at the moment it seems not to release the logs. And that's a problem. Because Which logs, Ralph? Um, the Whoopi logs. Oh. That's interesting. As I mean, Kubernetes the the sends a signal, and so <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. you would have the chance to uh, remove the whoopee lock. But it, as a, I haven't really an example to reproduce it, but I can see that it's one way that the lock, as we were investigating in another problem with the whoopee locks, mm -hmm. and one way uh, you can easily reproduce it is if you kill one of the pods, um, then the lock stays. Right. Yes. I mean, this is this is a lease, effectively, that we we renew the, with the Wappy protocol. So, you know, you yeah, have to renew the customer, it means he has to wait half an hour till. till yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sucks. That sucks. Yeah, no, don't disagree with that. Yeah. <laughs> but I think if it's a lease based uh, thing and you you hard kill the guy who holds the lease, then that's pretty hard. I mean, if it's if it's a clean shutdown, then we can do something. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was talking about clean shutdowns. If it, okay. if the pod crashes, obviously there is very little we can do. <laughs> but uh, if Kubernetes basically sells, yeah. sends a kill signal, um, Collabora cleanly shuts down, then it could also... Um, <laughs> release it should release the, lock. the locks, no doubt about it. Yeah, so, so we should uh, look into that. If you, if you file a bug, we, you know, you, we can look at it. Yeah. Good. Uh, cool. What else? Other other thoughts or questions? People. I was particularly pleased to see Shinji here from Japan. So hi Japan, you know. And uh, yeah, great, great to have you. I guess it's very late at night. So uh, thank you for. Uh, oh, and Quickie, of course. Why she? I think maybe Quickie is back in Slovenia. So uh, yeah, good to have you here. Anyone else want to speak up, say something, type something? Right. Ah. <laughs> cool. Cool. So it, it sounds to me like there's more we can do on Kubernetes to uh, to improve that. I think it, it's great uh, to hear about this HA proxy. Uh, sorry, the Nginx work that my pronouns just been doing. So that's that's cool too. Um, yeah, obviously the Cypress Cypress testing are going on as well. Uh, and it's it's really nice to know that, that <clears throat> you know this burns away behind the scenes every commit we do we're running all these tests uh, to uh, exercise all that mobile goodness and uh, thanks to Rash for uh, maintaining that and of course Unisimray keeping the CI system working um, which is which is all good behind the scenes um, yeah and it really goes a lot quicker if you turn off the delays that the uh, that, uh, are, are in there so that the user can see what's going on when they're trying to debug a problem which is fun. And anything else? Other thoughts or questions? Yes. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the e-groupware stuff later from, from Ralph. I think you're doing a, a demo there and uh, Gabriel's uh, one-on-one. -on -one, uh, bits. I think Alex Alexandru hopefully will uh, turn something there. Um, it's slightly early, four minutes early for our next talk. So we can, you know, do like a, you know, I know. Get Mr. Motivator here to uh, I know. do some exercises or something. Well, we can have a break. Why don't we have a, a quick uh, comfort break and then we'll be back in three minutes. How about that? Make sense? Thanks, everyone. Thanks. See you in a, See you in a bit.
you are now the presenter tour. You are ready to to launch. I'm not hurrying you. It seems like you, your your microphone didn't get recognized. Uh, so maybe refreshing the tab or either relaunching your browser can fix the trick. If you are not seeing your microphone into the big blue button settings. Hey Tor. Hello Nicola. Uh, Tor has just disconnected <laughs> in order to refresh his browser. So we are just uh, we are still forty twos in the room. So it's and great to see. Me now? Yes, we can hear you, Tor. So good, I'm good. forcing you to have present rights and you have them, so everything is ready. So this bl uh, plus button is the screen sharing. No. Uh, next uh, to the b below your screen, next to the camera, the fourth button. Oh yes, just share the, your yeah. screen. Now I yes. see. Yes. Yeah. Entire screen, or let's choose window. That one. Share. You see this now? Yes, we do. Okay, so let me start then. I guess it's time, yes. Yes, it's time. You're on time. So... Uh, there. So in this uh, short presentation, I will describe what new features have appeared in the, in the iOS app during the last year or so. Uh, these can be classified based on from where they come, like is it something that has been in, in desktop Collabor Office and LibreOffice for all the time, but hasn't been available in the app? Or is it uh, something that has been in web-based Collabor Online that hasn't earlier been in the app and then it can all we also have some mobile improvements that are now also then in the app and not very many features that are specific to iOS and some features that are like uh, for some reason, especially mobile users want, but and uh, have been then implemented initially for, for iOS. Uh, things in desktop collabor office that have been there for a long time but that we haven't had in the mobile apps is like the Tesaros functionality uh, this was as far as I recall not even very hard to enable just had to change some settings that decide what we compile in into the code and we then also bundle these thesauruses for a few languages uh, German and probably some other European languages I don't remember exactly uh, for spell checking we have like until now we have used the system spell checker for for those languages where it exists However, that was slightly problematic for Swiss German. Hello, Nicholas. Because uh, the iOS system dictionary for German that's uh, that uses the German German <laughs> spelling, and the Swiss they spell German slightly differently. So we have to use the separate bundled dictionary for that. It seems to work. And uh, from things that were developed for for the web-based online, we now have also also in the iOS app is, for instance, this uh, editing of PDF files, where you can do simple things like uh, 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 rotate pages or I guess delete pages and things like that.
and uh, if you watched Pedro's talk, all these improvements to the UI from for mobile devices in general, they of course are also present in in the iOS app. Then, uh, although there is some some potential confusion there because uh, some of that is only for mobile phones and and the iOS app is mainly used, I think, on iPads and uh, sometimes intentionally, but sometimes accidentally, uh, we use different UI for for mobile phones and for tablets. But if you notice any such inconsistencies, please do report report a bug about that. Uh, and uh, features that have been implemented specifically for iOS are not that many, but one thing that I could think of is this uh, font selector. And here it's like truly native. I mean, it uses the native iOS uh, control for that. Do they call it control or widget? I think they call it control. It is not something done in JavaScript, so it looks familiar from from other iOS app. But then on the other hand, it doesn't match the look and feel of our JavaScript based UI. Uh, we could use the same idea for for the color selector too. But on the other hand, the, the JavaScript color selector also looks nice and works fine, so I'm not sure if that's a good idea. And this is how the font selector looks. It pops up this uh, floating smaller window that you can scroll then and, and choose a font. Uh, but I guess it's up to matter of taste whether you think this is uh, good or bad. Because it, as you see, it doesn't really look like the JavaScript things. And uh, one thing that uh, people who use mobile devices often want is emojis. And we had like lots of problems in Collabora online regarding emojis and other characters that uh, require two of these UTF-16 code units to uh, because they are like not on the first first uh, what do you call it well, in the in the basic multilingual plane uh, and then there are, are also these quite complicated characters emojis that consists of like several unicode code points like this male artist fellow here that actually consists like of a one character that did, that is like a, a male face, and then another another character that modifies it to be a, an artist, and then a third one that says he has a brownish skin color. And these now now work in the iOS app. Another similar class of emojis are uh, country flags. They consist of two characters that actually correspond to the two characters of of the country code in question. And these features were like mainly done for because of bug reports from for iOS, but they also now then work in the web based online. And that's all I had for this. So thank you. Thank you, Tor. And if there are questions, I guess we can wait for for the, the QA session. QA indeed. session yes. indeed, indeed. And coming next is Dennis with Canvas overlays and improvements. And this is a pre-recorded talk, so... Uh, 
Hello, I'm Dennis Francis from Calabra. I'm going to talk about the Canvas Overlays and Improvements work I did earlier this year. I'd like to talk a bit about the work done on Canvas Overlays and client-side grids. Overlays are objects like text selection, cell cursors, cell area selection, etc. that needs to appear over the tile images. We now draw tile images on a canvas called the main canvas rather than using image elements as we used to do in the past. Similarly for overlays we used to employ SVG elements to show them over the tiles. But now we draw these overlay objects onto the main canvas over the document area where we paint the tiles. Client side grids. Now we draw grids for the calcap at the client side on the main canvas itself rather than making the core paint them onto the tiles. This is now possible since the client knows the size of each row and column and also whether they are hidden or filtered using the sheet geometry core API. The client gets the document background color from the core so it paints that color on the canvas rather than having them in the tiles. Here are some screenshots of only objects. More on the topic of overlays on the main canvas. All new code for the canvas overlays are in TypeScript, just like most of the tile painting code is. One good side effect of this move is that we use core pixel coordinates everywhere and we no longer need an intermediate coordinate system like latitude, longitude. It also made things easier to introduce unit tests for custom internal data structures used to represent the overlay objects. The overlays are painted on the main canvas after drawing grids and tiles. This painting order is configured in the canvas section container, which manages the painting of sections on the main canvas. The style properties of all the objects like fill, stroke color, opacity, border thickness, etc. are configurable via CSS variables. Since the overlays are now in the canvas, the Cypress tests can't test them directly. For helping these tests, the overlay coordinates and states are exposed as a JSON text inside dedicated div elements for each overlay objects. But this is done only when the client is run under Cypress. More on client side grids. In the core side, grid and the background color are no more painted in the tiles. But since there is no information about merge cells on the client, the core needs to draw borders for merge cells using the background color on the tiles to hide the client grids in such areas. In the client side, the document area is first painted with the background color. After that, the grids are drawn and then the tiles are painted. We get some performance wins due to the client side grids. Due to the absence of tile grids, the tiles for empty areas are nearly empty. We can render empty areas in the client without waiting for the tiles. This makes a notable difference on rapidly scrolling or panning to empty regions. Here is a list of source code files related to the canvas overlays. That's all for me. Thank you for listening. Perfect. So now next up we have Alexandro. Can you hear me?
Hello, hello. I don't hear you. I see that you have. Yeah. Uh, yes, now. Uh, no, no, it's within. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, headphone. We see. Yes, the headphone. So, so you will need Alexander. Do me a favor. Uh, close this tab and oh, and uh, try to enter again because it seems you have just uh, headphones. So it seems that you you entered or you enter without audio. Okay, perfect. We will try. Now I see a microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Yes. I'm going to start the camera as well. Uh, can you see me? Uh, in a few seconds, I think. Yes, we do see you. Great. So you, you can Hello, see Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> One second. Oh. Push my presentation just a sec. Perfect. Yes, I see it. Go ahead. Okay, so I can start, right? Yes. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Alexandro Produtsu. I'm a senior JavaScript developer at uh, One and One. Our department is called uh, Mail and Media. Uh, let me give you a short, quick context about uh, One and One. It's um, mostly known uh, for uh, hosting. Uh, they are her, a fun fact is that they are uh, Borussia Dortmund's main shirt sponsor in Bundesliga football this year, um, which I think is as cool as the Colabora Online short name, pun intended. Uh, let me show you the, the logo here. I have the t-shirt. <laughs> okay, so um, we, uh, apart from this, one one has several uh, portals like uh, WebD, uh, gmix.net or mail.com, um, which provide different uh, services such as uh, mail, cloud, hosting, and of course, editing documents with a product called uh, Online Office Editor, which is built uh, with a cool. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, as you can see, uh, cool uh, occupies like 90% of the screen, and the rest is uh, um, the, the sidebar with uh, the different options to uh, view the most recent files, to upload, and uh, to switch to a different application. Like I told you, we have uh, several of those. So uh, now let's talk about uh, integrating Cool from a UI perspective uh, into a setup. So uh, there are custom UI changes, tweaks um, that uh, should be expected when you integrate Cool into um, another application or into a, pro uh, a portal. And uh, you have to, to plan for them on how to integrate these into your project. Um, I've... Uh, I've included like two categories, two types of code changes, though the, those that will benefit the community as a whole and those that are specific to your project. So the changes that are benefiting the community can be applied in the uh, original cool code and the others uh, should ideally treat cool as a black box because they are particular to your, pro uh, to your project, such as uh, minor UI changes to integrate into the overall theme um, and other uh, particular things that uh, are specific to your project. So uh, the changes benefiting the community should be uh, ideally documented into a central place to keep uh, track of them. You want them integrated to the community as soon as possible so that you don't have to uh, reapply them with uh, every uh, cool update in the future. And uh, a good thing would be to also uh, have some comments in the code so that uh, they can be easily discoverable in the code. And um, 
ideally even to link to the original task or, or bug in Jira or whatever software that you are using to track these um, these changes into your project. So let me show you what I mean by that um, comment uh, standard. Um, we have uh, a convention to use OE update into our code to mark these changes. And as you can see, when we do a, a grip in the Linux uh, CLI, we can have we can see immediately all the files that have uh, custom changes uh, applied to them. So um, recently we have opened uh, four PRs uh, and uh, they have been all uh, all merged into master and we are planning to open uh, 16 more UIs wise, UI wise, sorry about that. Um, from these four, um, two were features. Uh, one was a bug fix and another was a demo that was uh, contributed to the documentation. Uh, and the demo was uh, basically our mini application uh, stripped down with a sidebar and allowing you to, um, to open multiple uh, instances of the editor uh, at once. So if you want, you can check that uh, yourself by... Uh, running that uh, demo locally. So now let's talk about custom changes specific to a project. Um, you want to keep these custom JavaScript, CSS or HTML changes into a uh, new folder um, so that they are grouped together uh, in a uh, specific place that you, uh, you know of. Uh, you don't want these mixed together into the cool code because it will uh, get messy and uh, uh, you will have to uh, think about that when you reapply these uh, changes when you upgrade. Um, uh, an important thing is to build cool with uh, the production flag enabled and that will output a single JavaScript file as well as a single CSS file. Uh, bundle.js and bundle.css is what they're called and they're uh, in the, this folder. Uh, you can prepend JavaScript changes to the bundle and that's how we do it and you can append uh, CSS changes to it. You run make, you concatenate that custom, uh, those custom uh, JavaScript uh, and CSS changes to the cool bundle and then you minify everything. And now let's see how uh, how we do that uh, with uh, some simple npm commands. So we are um, outputting the CSS code and then minifying it and adding it to the uh, bundle. We have another command for uh, building the assets, which are uh, uh, project specific assets, such as, uh, for example, new icons. And um, Next is the build the JS. Uh, we do a similar thing uh, for the JavaScript files that we have. We output them uh, and minify them uh, into the uh, into the final bundle. We we um, prepend that uh, we um, prepend that to the final bundle. And the build command contains uh, everything all together now. So first we go um, into uh, upper directory from our custom folder. We run the uh, original um, build for cool. Uh, we clean up things. We run make with minify false because we actually minify things together at the end. And that's about it. So what is not shown into these slides is that we also uh, take the this folder we publish it to our internal NPM registry, which is Artifactory. Artifactory is for Java originally, but it can be run as an NPM registry. And after that, we trigger a job that uh, gets that package, which uh, is actually the disk folder, uh, unzips it and pushes it to a CDN service. 
Um, this package JSON uh, that you see here, with just a few commands, has a separate version um, to the cool um, one because we want to track this as being a, a separate project because of uh, these changes. Um, so here are some example of uh, custom changes that we apply to our project. Uh, we have overridden the native uh, WebSocket and J uh, Ajax constructors, uh, constructors in JavaScript to open that sneaky Java G session ID everywhere that we have to carry. We froze console log so that others developer, other developers will not turn into Lime Nelson from uh, Taken and chase you everywhere. <laughs> uh, actually, I lost like 30 minutes or one hour asking myself why are not my log messages output into the console. <laughs> um, we changed a few icons, uh, as uh, I mentioned previously, to make the application look more uh, similar to uh, the um, uh, look and feel of the others. We also integrate uh, intercepted uh, clicking links, so they, they go through a DRFR initially. So if you click on a, in a document on a link, it will redirect you to an internal uh, to our uh, in URL pertaining to the DRFR, which will scan for malicious website, for example, websites, for example. And um, yeah, that's that's the main reason. I think probably might be some tracking as well, if if you need it. Um, what I want to mention uh, from these four examples at, is that we are also considering to um, contribute to the community, the first one and the one with the intersecting clicking on links. And we think that we might be able to do that in a generic way and uh, in a, a way that is optional um, for the users if they want to use this um feature or not and uh, many more others we we had a talk with um first in our team and uh, after that with the cool guys <laughs> uh, and uh, talked about all these changes and how we can contribute them to the community and if they are useful so uh, the final goal is, is to, goal is to keep the current customizations to a minimum and if possible contribute everything to the community uh, which means that others will benefit from your work and improve the code that you have contributed and uh, another benefit for you is that you don't have to reapply uh, these customizations each time that you upgrade to a newer version of a uh, call so it's a win-win for everybody for your project and for the community as well. Um, thank you very much. And if you have uh, any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thanks, Alexander. That was really cool. Okay. Next, yeah. Next up, we have uh, Mart. So, can you hear me, Mart? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. So you are the presenter now. Okay, thanks. Let me share my screen. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, I will talk about uh, Android new features and improvements. So uh, this year, our first feature is the dark theme. And now we have the theme options on the apps shell, but, but it only covers the native part yet. Eventually, uh, we will have it on the web view too. And of course, it's nice to be ready on the native part because we will need to pass this information to the web view about the team. And uh, we now uh, support the uh, CSV files. 
the Android app can open and edit CSV files. As you can see, we have a nice text import dialog on the right, and we can use it to form we can use it to format the data. We have also a nice warning when we try to edit the file. It warns us about the file format because if we decide to go with the text CSV format, we would lose the rich formatting if you do any. And we now have an option to export it as spreadsheet document before we even start editing. Another one is the PDF viewer. Now the app can be used as a PDF viewer. Uh, Gokai recently implemented a nice scrollable PDF view, but it doesn't uh, made it to the Android yet, but you can uh, try it on the browser. Uh, right now the PDF documents are loaded like as if they were presentations. We have now draw documents uh, supported. I worked on this uh, this year and uh, to bring the draw component to online. We have already released that and it contains re-implementation of the graphic selection handles as seen in these figures. Uh, it's not fully supported yet on the mobile. We need to bring some uh, draw elements such as arrows, connectors uh, to mobile wizard, but we are able to open and edit now. Uh, we can even make this guy smile with our phone. Uh, comments have, have been improved. Uh, as Pedro had already mentioned about this in more detail, comments are now in the mobile wizard. Uh, we can also set up the username that will be used on comments on the app settings. Uh, we have some bug fixes and improvements, of course. Uh, last year we released Collabor Online for Chrome OS as well. Uh, it is the existing Android application built for x86 and 64 architecture. Chrome OS has uh, Google Play and able to run Android apps if the app supports the architecture. Um, of course, it brought many issues because it was a mobile app running under a desktop device. Uh, for that, many of the maintenance has been done by Candy. And uh, one of the problems I worked on was the trackpad scrolling. Uh, we have lots of controls on the inputs and they all differ to each device type. It can change if it is a touch device or a desktop device or a mobile tablet, etc. And some Chromebooks, uh, somehow Chromebooks trackpad on the Android apps does not produce mouse wheel event uh, on the JavaScript, but it's instead it was producing uh, touch move events. Uh, so we are using the app as a desktop view and we are expecting mouse wheel events being fired, uh, but we didn't get any. So I had to implement a special case for Chromebooks to handle scrolling with touch events. And some Chromebooks have touch screen too, and now they, they are working uh, thanks to this. Another one was the keyboard focus issues. So we do a lot of focus related tricks uh, to hide the keyboard on mobile devices and it requires to take the focus away from the text input. Of course, this caused a confusion in the Chrome OS app because we didn't have any on-screen keyboard popping. And there were several more problems related to this now is fixed. And we also have uh, improvements on the clipboard as well. 
So in general, for Android, uh, we now can open password protected documents and we have a no number of fixes for uh, storage providers on some devices. It was crashing when we create a document and also save it inside a network storage provider such as Next Nextcloud or Dropbox. Uh, of course, uh, Pedro mentioned in his presentation, we have much more fixes, uh, many, many more fixes and improvements done uh, throughout this year. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks. I really like that bit uh, regarding setting uh, the username via the Android. So uh, next up is uh, Mikolos uh, with the fuzzing uh, and string vectors. So, uh, Do you see also the one and one uh, PDF on the presenter side or is it just me? Uh, yes, I see. I think uh, you need to replace it. it. Yes. Uh, but I think Mikos is already uh, uh, we, we have ready and you can save it. off time if you want to. Okay, yeah, so okay. Uh, perfect, thanks. Uh, is this um, visible and can you hear me? That's, that's yes. yes, yes, we do. Okay. Hear okay. And see you. So let's start. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Miklos. Um, I started my LibreOffice journey as a writer developer at CISA. And now I'm a bit global of productivity, doing all sorts of consultancy and, and a bit of online work as well, which is the source, uh, um, which is the topic for this talk. Um, so we will first talk about sanitizers, then fuzzers, and third about uh, stream vectors. Can, so, can you, what are. Nikos, can you share your screen? Uh, is it not shared? No, no. Uh, that's a shame. Yes. So let's is try it? again. Yeah. And um, Kendi is doing some noise. Yes. Thanks, Kendi. <laughs> okay, so, is this better now? Uh, yes. Thanks. Ah, okay. Yes. So we see everything. Thanks. Yeah, good. Uh, so, regarding um, sanitizers. Uh, sanitizers are compile time instrumentation uh, tools inside the Clang and other compilers so that you can build your code with uh, special compile time flags and it will do um, um, additional checks at runtime to check for undefined behavior or some kind of other problems and, and more. Um, each of these sanitizers are typically something you can use in isolation. So if you would like to use multiple sanitizers, then you need to have multiple builds. This is quite annoying. On the other hand, at runtime, this allows a much faster performance. So unlike Walgreens, which is very slow, but this is something that uh, you can run on a staging server, for example. Uh, now, there is a special case for the undefined behavior sanitizer and the other sanitizer. That's something you can combine. So that's what we do. And the environment for running cool under sanitizers is that we reuse the um, uh, LibreOffice um, core Git uh, settings as is. Uh, so we take a core checkout, which is known to be passing um, make check there on the core side already. And then we uh, build online.git uh, code um, with the same compiler, same tool chain, same compiler flux. And uh, make check like the C++ tasks for, for the online site are also passing on, under sanitizers. Um, some tweaks were needed there. Uh, sometimes we had two aggressive timeouts for tasks and that uh, needed uh, some uh, extending. And in some other cases, they actually found badness and we had to fix them. Um, at the moment, Cypress tasks are not something that we run under sanitizer. So the Tinder box we have, or the Jenkins job we have, is, um, is uh, building with uh, Cypress disabled. So that's something that um, uh, we could try out first locally, uh, see what are the issues, if there's just noise or it finds something useful, fix the problems, and once, once it's passing, then it could be a continuous effort again. Um, and uh, for exactly what Clang version to use, what uh, environment variables to use, what compile flags to use, that's a lot of a lot of sometimes, and it can quickly lead to non-interesting problems. So what we do is that we reuse the LibreOffice uh, development environment, uh, LOD.get environment. Um, Stefan Bergman for the LibreOffice site spent 
lots of time on fine tuning that and we just reuse that as is for the online side this also helps that we have um, a same tool chain on the core side and on the online side so it can't get out of sync uh, now once you have sanitizer set up then you can do fuzzing as well uh, you could do fuzzing in, in itself, but it's much more interesting in case you combine it with sanitizers. So the idea is that um, for the admin fuzzer, we take the incoming traffic, a WebSocket traffic on the admin console, and we turn it to a fake file format. It, uh, it will be a more or less plain text file. Um, each line is representing one incoming uh, WebSocket text message. And based on that, we can uh, replay that uh, file format. Uh, with um, admin um, admin socket handler and uh, we can see if uh, the um, this handle message member function is uh, handling the that uh, data correctly even it can be like intentionally tricky data and it's basically untrusted user input or in case it, it finds some problem and finding some problem is the piece where sanitizers are happening because then if you have some tricky input then we can make sure that uh, it's not just passing by accident, but actually it's mostly free from undefined behavior. The nice thing is that um, the, um, the fuzzing, fuzzer itself is really just a few lines of code. What you see here in the slides is almost the complete fuzzer code. So what we do is just we create an instance of this um, admin console. Um, then we read that uh, incoming uh, byte uh, array um, as, a, as a text file line by line and we just feed each line to the to the admin console so nothing complicated now and even this one already found six problems in the in the past and uh, for the majority of these problems that was something that was introduced recently and we could just fix it and prevent badness and um, ship good code to the customers uh, now uh, out of the three fathers that we have uh, at the moment the second one is the client session fuzzer uh, this fuzzer was the fuzzer, like the fuzzer uh, initially, it was the first one. It, it is testing what's uh, incoming on the web circuit from a browser editing clients. And um, um, as mentioned earlier, we use this fuzzer with Absan and ASAM. Um, for, for the online Git uh, code, we build exactly almost almost the same as a normal online build. It just built in the special environment and uh, you use a um, one additional flag, enable, enable fuzzers um, to do, build the fuzzers. Uh, this is needed because the fuzzers build is not producing a WSD binary. It will produce a library and then like uh, it builds um, um, a library from the online code and then this library is statically um, linked to the fuzzer executable because that's how fuzzing works um, in the simplest way. And the third um, uh, fuzzer we have is the HTTP response fuzzer. This was introduced when Ash was working on the async safe work, which required a, a custom parser for HTTP responses. Uh, this found three problems so far. Um, if I remember correctly, all of that was something that was um, introduced recently and we could just uh, quickly fix that and, and it, uh, it was not cheap uh, to an actual stable release. And once we have um, these fuzzers, it's nice to have the training locally, but um, if it does not find anything in a day, it does not mean that as it mutates its input and tries to find interesting uh, code paths, um, it doesn't mean that um, it's, um, um, it won't find something tomorrow. So at the moment, what we have is that uh, we have all the three fuzzers running all week. And then uh, what they do is that they run for a week and then if they don't find anything, then they quit. And then they pull in the core git, they pull in the Collabora online checkout, they do the build and then they start again. And if something breaks, then we get a mail notification and we can download the producer and investigate the actual undefined behavior locally and provide a fix for that. Um, the last thing I would like to talk about is uh, string vectors which is um we found um this pattern during fuzzing that uh, in many cases we deal with, with these web sockets messages messages which is a vector of strings and it's very easy to forget uh, checking for the uh, array bounds before accessing a given element in that uh, vector um, and fuzzing was finding this this problem pattern again and again 
And um, if we are at, at these uh, string vectors, then the other problem was that if you split up a long string to these um, uh, tokens, then um, the STD string will create a non terminated um, buffer for each of these tokens, which means lots of allocations. And this uh, allocation was actually showing up on performance profiles. So what we do is that instead of using STD vector of strings, uh, we have um, a string vector, which is a single underlying string. And then we have tokens to that, which is really just an offset and some lengths kind of pointers into that. And we have a safe API, if, safe API around that, so that in case you would accidentally uh, read past the end of the array, then we would just remove, uh, return an empty string. And um, to prevent the unwanted allocations, um, I wrote some um, simple AST matcher. Uh, which is uh, which was looking for all of these cases where you are invoking an operator equals where the left hat side is uh, a result value from the operator brackets of um, um, STD string, and then in that case we can re rewrite this to some uh, equals member function on the string vector, so that we don't have to do this um, allocation of the template. This concludes my talk. Uh, the summary is that we have no uh, sanitizers fuzzers, these are running in, a, in the Jenkins job again and again as a continuous effort. And hopefully this is making online a safer choice for everyone. Thanks. Uh, I believe them. Thanks we will much. have the, uh, the questions at the end of the section. Exactly. Yes, yes. Thanks. OK, so next up, uh, Ruth Correa with translating Collabra uh, website. So I just made you a presenter. Can you hear me? And uh, please, uh, sh yes, thanks. Yes, I think your camera is coming and... I can hear you, sorry. Ah, perfect. I, I was very <laughs> muted, very... <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Many, many buttons. Um, right, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, I think it's this one. Yes. Okay, so, um, hi everybody. I'm Ruth. Yes, um, Thanks. My presentation is a bit less technical than most of the presentations so far, uh, but I think it will touch on some points uh, from Tor's presentation, actually. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is uh, kind of a, a it was supposed to be a, a, a presentation about Calabra's website translation, but I've translated it many moons ago, and so I decided to go uh, with something a bit more uh, basic. So three steps to keep in mind when localizing software. So hi, uh, I'm Ruth. Uh, I have some experience in, in translation and localization of software. I did uh, localization QA and translation coordination at Nintendo of Europe. Um, I was in charge of implementing content for 15 languages on Nintendo's website. Uh, well, actually not 15 languages, but eight languages and 15 versions of the website uh, and coordinating that process. I did translation management at Aptoid, where I was in charge of the translation processes of their apps and uh, their website as well. And then in 2020, I translated Collabra's website uh, to Portuguese. Um, so yeah, I have just uh, three slides, but I'm gonna dive into them. So the first thing to keep in mind is the original text must be absolutely flawless. Um, so I would say that um, for the biggest uh, part, most of the problems when translating uh, software and content in general uh, it goes down when you see a bad translation a lot of the time it goes down to a bad original text so uh, in software and tech most of the content gets translated from English so make sure you have experienced professionals in writing copy text for software and this is very important um, don't get just your marketing guys writing the content uh, or writing the copy text for software. Um, in case of a website, for instance, you have UI text, you have content text, and those are very different. Um, review, review, review. Uh, not only get 
uh, someone to write the text, get someone else to review the text. Uh, when you are working on text for a really long time, you start uh, missing the problems with uh, the text, missing uh, typos, mistakes, confusing sentences, because you are so used to the text that you don't see those things anymore. So whenever possible, get someone else to review the text and hopefully a native speaker. This is very important, especially in international companies. Um, being fluent and being a native speaker is different. Uh, the, the sensibility that you have to text is also different. So uh, whenever possible, use a native speaker, but also an experienced native speaker, because sometimes native speakers don't have um, the grammar knowledge or like the the systematized knowledge of language in their heads that it's also necessary when reviewing text. Uh, yeah, I had just said that content and UI are different. Uh, for websites, this is very obvious. Uh, for apps is, or or actual, you know, hard software, I'm going to call it like this, please don't. Uh, so hard software, so like uh, LibreOffice and Calabra is just hard software. I'm going to call it like this. This is not a technical term. Um, but yeah, when you are mixing both like in a website, it's really important to keep in mind that content and UI have different specificities for the text that uh, is on it. Uh, and uh, that can be a challenge. Be careful with confusing sentences. Uh, this happens a lot uh, with content specifically because you have longer sentences. Uh, so any sentence that is confusing in English will likely uh, lead to a confusing sentence in other languages. Uh, so uh, keep it short, uh, the shorter, the better. Uh, and also uh, if you are uh, providing redundant messages throughout the text, uh, this can be very challenging when translating to other languages because uh, redundancy uh, might not be as easy to translate uh, as uh, it might show up in English. Uh, then be careful with terminology and make a glossary. This is really important. Um, sometimes you'll have the same, um, it's very important and very underestimated. Uh, you'll have the same terms appearing over and over again uh but uh and and i'm not just talking about uh, a part of the software i'm also talking about actions that you uh, may um, ask people to perform so if you say tap a button or press a button uh, use that every single time you're referring to a button because it just makes language and makes interaction just very uh, so much more clear and uh, then think about other languages. English, uh, and this is valid not just for text, but also for design. English is a very uh, synthetic language. Um, most European languages, uh, so Latin-based languages, take up, give or take, 30 to 50%, uh, 30 percent more space on a screen or on a button, on a UI, than English will take. Um, some other family, of language, families of languages may even take longer. Others are shorter, but those are uh, the exception, not the rule. So uh, make sure that your design is uh, well fitted to uh, take on the text for other languages. Uh, if you think of uh, German, Slavic languages can be very long as well. They're a lot more verbose than English. Uh, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, uh, Latin-based language uh, languages are also um, more verbose than English. And what happens uh, very often is that when you translate, uh, the translation by, might be accurate, but there's not enough space for it. And um, when you're using especially UI and copy text, uh, where there isn't a lot of space for it, it just creates overflows and it gets like it breaks the the design and it looks really terrible uh, for the user. So the second thing is setting things up uh, and things to keep an eye out to make sure that um, it's kind of a 
a blissful experience for everybody. Uh, not only the developers who are working on, on, on the process of getting stuff uh, to the translation platform, which we will talk in, in just a few minutes, but also for the translators and uh, for uh, project managers who might be dealing with this. So the first thing is no hard coding on text. This uh, may seem obvious, but uh, it's uh, a common thing that uh, happens. Please don't uh, hard code any strings or any text that will show up to the user because that will be a nightmare to translate afterwards. So if you're creating uh, something and you're already thinking about setting things up for translation and localization yes please don't, don't no hard coding um also keep in mind that images will have to be translated so the less text they have the better it is for everybody because um translating images also has different challenges than than uh, uh than software or some of the main challenges but they pose differently in a technical manner most translation platforms accommodate the translation of images so you can upload the images there but it's a bit of a, a more uh more uh, more um, tedious process and more manual so um yeah keep that in mind and also define what will be translated continuously so here on the screenshot i don't know if you can see but this is from uh the portuguese version of of the website of collabora's website um and yeah so we have the buttons here on top that says uh todas as novidades com comunidade empresa so like all the news community uh company uh press releases etc uh, but then we have a search box that in, is in English and the content is in English. Now, obviously, um, this is down to the company uh, resources and decisions uh, because translating content continuously is a lot of work and requires a lot of people. Um, but yeah, like keep in mind that some some parts of your website might not all be translated uh and and yeah define in advance what will be translated continuously because then you can add some uh, some notes saying even just saying that some of the content might not be available in all languages etc um and then supporting the translators so uh before um you pass on the text uh, make sure you pick a good translation platform there are plenty up out there I use a screenshot of Weblate. Uh, it was not what I used for Collabora's web website, but uh, Weblate is an open source platform as well, and it's being used to translate Collabora's software, I think, at the minute. So yeah, make sure you pick a good translation platform. And uh, a good translation platform is a platform that allows for context. Uh, context obviously can be provided with screenshots and you should always have screenshots of the text that you're translated whenever possible, but also provide other cues for context. So if you leave, if you leave breadcrumbs uh, or like the code of the string saying like, um, you know, if it's a button, say that it's a button, uh, that's just good practices. And uh, for an experienced translator, uh, it gives extra cues as to what the, the, that text will be used on. And it's a lot like um, English, uh, before I was talking about how it's um, a very uh, a very synthetic language, it's very short language. Um, and for instance, uh, verbs don't get, uh, like verb tenses and verb forms are very simple in English. And if uh, comparing to Portuguese, for instance, where there are uh, three forms of subjunctive and each person, singular and plural, has its own verb form. Uh, so it might be very different uh, if the same word is on a button or if it's used somewhere else. And that's very important to have extra content uh, context. And also um, define a tone and design a style guide. So a tone is how you communicate. It's like the basic um, terms or the basic uh, familiarity, the level of familiarity in which you address uh, your user or your customer. It is different if you're talking to a user or a customer. 
uh, as well. Um, and design a style guide. Um, setting a tone and a style guide, they're kind of aligned, but a, a tone is just a more generic overview on how you address your user or your customer, etc. cetera. Um, and that can be, that has to be set in English and is something that is, uh, you know, translated to, uh, or it can be transposed to a different language uh, very easily is what you will tell um, the translator, like, oh, we are, uh, we use a very formal type of language or we, we would like to keep it very casual. That's the tone. Um, and in English, for instance, uh, it's not always easy to assume a tone because, uh, for instance, they only have one usage of the second person. So it's you and you, and there's no formal you or a casual you, everything is you. Uh, also singular and plural can um, be different depending on the language. Um, so for instance, uh, in, uh, in German, you have do and Z, which do is very informal and Z is a formal uh, uh, type of addressing the other person. Um, in Portuguese, uh, it is uh, sometimes you have uh, um, to and nosh. Very often you use uh, uh, um, uh, the the plural of the first ver of the first uh, person to uh, to to decline verbs to make it more friendly or to build a sense of community. Um, uh, so these things are something that would be included in a style guide. So define, you can uh, think of tone as something that is set for all languages um, in a more of a, an umbrella type of way. And then the style guide, you should work directly with the translators of each, uh, if, each language and are language specific. Um, so, you know, the things that I just mentioned, so setting up how you address to people, if, if it's very formal or not, how uh, you uh, use verbs, how uh, you use terminology, um, and just minor uh, things that will make text flow a lot better and make things less confusing for those who are reading. And um, that's it uh, from me, so thank you. I hope it, this was useful. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I, I think people, you can see in the chat people really enjoy it. And there's a lot of back and forth uh, regarding translations, languages, different uh, cultural backgrounds. So I think that's, that's really cool. OK, so now uh, we are going, uh, sorry for the noise, I have a baby crying. So and now uh, it starts uh, uh, questions and answers. And but before that, uh, there, there was this really uh, group effort uh, regarding translation, uh, trans translating our website, and many people from outside uh, really uh, contributed. So uh, thank you, uh, Sinji. Thank you, Raul, Eva, Anduli, uh, Kara, Mike Kangansky. Like just to name a few, there was really many people. Uh, we are currently <clears throat> trying to make the process slightly less painful, uh, and as you as you could read in the public chat, and we will be uh, moving to a, a better uh, workflow, um, and of course keeping using what we already use uh, in the product, which is the, the web web. Yeah. So so that's it. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, cool. Um, particularly uh, Ruth's talk on the on translation is very helpful for me as a totally spoiled English speaker. So I, I apologize in advance for, uh, for that, but uh, it's, it's fantastic the work you do uh, to communicate the, the weird things that we say, no doubt, in, in English. So fantastic. So if speakers or everybody can just share their videos, uh, any questions uh, for anyone there for tour on, on iOS uh, goodness or uh, Canvas? Canvas funkiness from uh, Dennis or uh, one on one. I hope uh, Alexandria is still with us uh, to, to answer questions or uh, new features in Android or uh, fuzzing. 
causing craziness. Uh, yes. So the... we have we have some questions. So for Alexandru, mm -hmm. um, do you have any changes uh, to the mobile tablet CSS or surviving without patching those? <laughs> Is that a possibility to improve the branding JS and CSS mechanism in any way? Uh, the thing is that uh, I think for uh, mobile or uh, iPad, there are other applications and uh, what we are working on, uh, as far as I know, is just for the desktop and uh, big screens. So we haven't really doubled into small screens that much. Yeah, so because like you, uh, you will actually get the the mobile screen, uh, sorry, mobile view even uh, even like when you when you look at the web page on the mobile view, like not not in the app. I didn't mean the app with the question, but about the the you know fat, uh, sorry the the browser uh, browser app, uh, but like uh, seen on the mobile the mobile device. So I was wondering like if you run in into any issues there um patching this or well but i hear that, that, that you didn't as, care uh, so far as far as i know when a user mm -hmm. a mobile user uh, logs into the portal they are redirected to um, some uh, optimized version of the portal which includes even fewer applications so uh, uh fortunately we we didn't really take a look at that our focus is mainly on uh, bigger screens. Understood. Okay. So I don't think we we get a lot of uh, mobile users because they can't really get to the uh, higher screen uh, version. Let's say they're already directed elsewhere into an optimized uh, portal for strictly for mobile usage. I see. I see. And the other question was uh, because like the the repeat repacking of the of the bundle sounds uh, fragile <laughs> to me so i was wondering like if you considered using the branding js branding css that uh, that we have as kind of like extension mechanism uh for you know adding your own stuff uh, or like you didn't consider that at all and uh, and prefer like having it just when one bundle or you know how that how this feels for you um actually it's it's not really that fragile because uh we are actually triggering the regular build uh the regular mm -hmm. cool build before so we are triggering that we have a dist folder i mean we there's a, the regular this folder with the the bundles the bundle.js mm -hmm. bundle.css and every static resource and after that, we basically patch those files by add, by uh, either appending or prepending um, uh, our customizations to the CSS and the JavaScript respectively. Um, this offers a bit more of a freedom because, yeah, uh, we can we can decide if we need uh, other alterations to the process. Um, I guess uh, having everything into branding JS might also work, but uh, we we went through through this route instead. Okay. Good. Cool. So I had a question for Dennis. Are you with us, Dennis? Still, or are you? Uh... Maybe he's uh, it's a bit late. You know. uh, Dennis couldn't be present at all. So, oh, yes, sure. uh, so let me to... tell you something good about Dennis. This is, so we've, we've also, uh, Dennis has recently come up with a very nice fix uh, around zooming. So that as you zoom, it picks the, the perfect uh, zoom level uh, that has the most tiles to show on your screen um, so that you actually get this beautiful fluid uh, zooming experience. Even if you just zoomed and you hit a new zoom level and we haven't quite finished getting tiles or if you're zooming right out, having having zoomed in very heavily, we then have very big tiles or a very little amount of the screen. And typically when you zoomed out previously, you then see this sort of small white blob of your document descending into the distance. Uh, but now we should smoothly uh, switch to a different zoom level and interpolate from that uh, if we had it cached. So it should just give a much more uh, fluid uh, zooming, panning experience uh, around uh, from your cache without needing uh, the kit process to render new stuff. So yeah, that's pretty cool. 
Anything else? Other questions, comments, thoughts? We should do the light break, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I wanted one for Miklos. Um, so, 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 Miklos, in terms of um, finding problems, how many of those problems when you first start escape, do you think, into the wild? I mean, how, how quickly do we find a problem from introduction to actually catching it in the fuzzer? Uh, I think that depends on um, how the problem is relating to the to our current coverage. So if it's something that we already covered, just it was good before, and now it's bad, then it's instant. And like, yeah, just introduce some obvious null pointer reference in the main loop, and you will find it instantly. And uh, similarly, the other end of the range is that uh, in case it's a problem in some um, some area which was. Um, uh, which was not covered before at all, then it takes a while. But um, I think, um, like, what, uh, uh, what Kalon was uh, saying is that if a file format fuzzer is running for a month and they did not find anything, then you can start to sleep good. <laughs> I, so I have that, a that's obviously for, for quite, uh, quite a complex file format. So, probably for our web circuit parsing, perhaps uh, even after a week, you can be quite a bit. Uh, Miklos, um, on that, uh, have you have you found any um, smart tips for balancing um, running the fuzzer for a long time versus restarting it every so often? Do you have any any tips for that? The, the, the current balance we have is that, like the way you know, some has set up the Jenkins job is that we time out after a week. So in case we don't find anything, then we give up and we pull and, and start a new baseline after a week. Uh, but other than that, there is value in this long running job so that it can actually focus on building the coverage rather than again and again pulling a new baseline and not getting anything. So see, it's certainly a trade off. Yeah, I agreed. It's, it's a trick. Ash muted himself just as he was talking, but never mind. Um, actually, <laughs> there was there was a software. Um, oh, was it? Ah, oh, someone or, else was muting you. Else. Look at that. Maybe, maybe oh, that sounds really else. fun. Let me try that for me. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, Ash. What did, did, what did you I, say? I, I was I was just saying that I um, I had noticed that um, um, uh, sometimes when I uh, restarted the the fuzzer, um, it would branch um, uh, to a, to broader um, cases more quickly then if i let it run for a long time sometimes it would get into um a sort of a, a branch that's very narrow and it tries to optimize around a certain area without trying necessarily um you know um, um uh, more mutations across the board because it, it kind of starts to prune the tree if, if 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 you if you know what i mean and i, I just noticed that by accident whenever i restarted it would hit more branches very quickly uh, then if I let it run more than, say, four or five hours, it would it kind of get into a very stable situation where it tries uh, minor uh, mutations versus broad ones. Anyway, it's an interesting it, topic. It, it also <laughs> probably depends on uh, what is your current coverage. So the behavior is probably different if you have near zero versus near 100% coverage. I, I do sometimes wonder if it sort of ends up trying to get past some uh, secure crypt key signing algorithm to the other end or something, you know, and uh, it is trying to solve essentially an unsolvable problem with great computational cost by, by disappearing off down some, some path. Anyway, cool. Um, any other questions? I, I have one more random one. That's uh, so, so root, it's for you. Um, so here we go. So what's the hardest word to translate from English into Portuguese that you've, you've struggled with? Ah, uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, uh, in general, loose technical terms uh, can be quite hard, especially because in the last, I'm going to say, 20 to 30 years, um, there is this growing tendency of not translating uh, technical terms, even when there are uh, equivalents. And so people uh, fall out of, like, those terms fall out of use somehow. So be, they kind of become, um, you know, antiquated or something like that. Um, and it can be a quite challenging, uh, uh, for instance, and especially if you work with a team of developers and they will go to you, why, why did you not leave the word download as download? It's like, because download is not 
is not a Portuguese word. <laughs> so, uh, um, so anything that it's a loose technical term, uh, and when I say loose, it's like a standalone, uh, not loose, but like a standalone technical term can be quite challenging. Um, and uh, and yeah, anything that is very new technology uh, is always a challenge because you have to make the decision of whether you translate it kind of literally and it can sound really odd um, or you just leave the English uh, which is also not what a translator should do like obviously for some terms like internet is internet everywhere I'm not going to translate internet the French tried that and went very very terribly um, I object I object it's not true <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like uh, technical terms are always a challenge. Um, but in that regard, I have to say that the Brazilian Portuguese do a much better uh, work than the European Portuguese people. Uh, but I think it's also to do with uh, how big they are um, and how, uh, yeah, they're translated for uh, 200 million people. We translate for 10 million people and it's very different. Uh, we get a lot of foreign content in our daily lives and are just so used to English that sometimes you don't even notice it anymore. Um, so, uh, yes, I think Brazilian Portuguese people are more used to like genuinely translating uh, documentation uh, and technical stuff uh, than the Portuguese. So they very often, uh, for instance, when I'm translating something to European Portuguese that is very technical, I try to see if there's already a Portuguese, uh, Brazilian Portuguese version of that. And more often than not, there is, which is good. Um, and then I try to, I either use, I either use that term directly or try to find something that it's uh, close enough. Um, rename Portuguese to Brazilian. I'm not against that. I think it may, <laughs> I, I'll probably lose my nationality by saying this, but I'm not against that. Uh, I think they have. Uh, it's it's a much bigger country, um, and and I think it makes sense that they kind of um, des uh, kind of define the paths of language. I mean, language is something that is always changing, uh, and that's great it's like it's a living being um and uh, in european portuguese because uh, our uh, geopolitical importance is very small we tend to just grab stuff and and i think because in the last 30 years a lot more people uh learn english and now are fluent in english it's just easy to grab it and it, it's just terrible because it really devalues uh, our own language um, so I'm all pro uh, Brazilian Portuguese taking over because they just translate everything. And sometimes it's weird, <laughs> but, uh, but it really works and it's a way to, to, um, um, to, to really make sure that your language is still living and that things make sense. And, and, th and actually regarding technical things, I think there is uh, an obvious gap between, for instance, developers who obviously are working in English regardless and people who will need to use the documentation. And sometimes we assume that everybody speaks English when they don't. So if you uh, keep a lot of English terms populating your text, it just creates a very confusing experience for someone who is not uh, familiar with the language or doesn't have as much um, fluency as a coder will probably have because it works in English. So, um, yeah, so uh, PT and PTBR are not completely the same due to the new agreement. The new agreement is the spelling. So there was a spelling agreement um, that had the, um, the goal was to make the both, both Portuguese norms come closer together because Brazilian Portuguese and European Portuguese can be quite different. Um, I think it's more obvious when people speak than when people write, but you can easily see whether a text is uh, Brazilian Portuguese or European Portuguese by the way uh, verbs are used or um, 
second person uh, uh, pronouns are used as well. Um, uh, the LATAM Spanish, uh, I think it, uh, like regarding uh, Spanish and Portuguese and I guess French in a way as well, because there's uh, European French, Canadian French and uh, all these other varieties. Um, it can, it, the one that you pick, it really comes down to uh, your business, the uh, in business wise. Okay, so what are your goals? Do you want to be in Europe uh, and other African uh, countries that are using Portuguese, or do you want to market to Brazilian? Um, I think the, the joy of it being open source, if I can interrupt, Rudy, is that of course you can have it always, you know, and you yes. can have your own native language as you like it and be involved in translation. Yes, so it's, it's and you can also. Yeah. Sorry, and and for some, I think for Portuguese is quite hard. I tried to do that, and it was very challenging. But uh, for some languages, you can kind of create hybrids. So, for instance, SoundCloud, they use what uh, uh, they call it international English. So it's English that may not be completely uh, normal for an English native speaker, but it will sound okay for most people that speak English in the world. And most speak people that speak English in the world are not necessarily native speakers. So they created their own blend of like hybrid English that works uh, in software and in music and, uh, and for what they're doing. Uh, in Aptoid, we did the same with, uh, with, um, with Spanish, so we had a hybrid um, version of Spanish that kind of worked for most Spanish speakers, uh, and it was basically a blend of um, European Spanish and Mexican Spanish because Mexico had our biggest Spanish um, audience, I guess, uh, and so we kind of blended the two. Uh, but that's something that you can really work with uh, your um, uh, your team of translation uh, translators, whether they're volunteer or not. It doesn't matter. Where you, like get them to work together and come up with like text that works in both languages. Because obviously you can translate in many varieties, but uh, that also comes with uh, extra challenges, especially especially. Uh, in, in regards of maintenance. So you might have someone who will translate, say, a European Portuguese version of the software uh, one year, but then uh, they can't keep up with the updates or whatever, and then it's just a, a weird thing. Or you can build like default. So like if there isn't an equivalent in European Portuguese, just default to the Brazilian Portuguese. It might be a weird thing, and sometimes there are weird things. Um, but it's better than nothing, obviously. To have, have yeah, it's there. a it's a fallback. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Ruth. It's really good to hear your uh, enthusiasm and passion, your knowledge uh, for it all. Um, I'm sure we probably have more questions, and we could probably talk about this all day. But I'm getting hungry, and uh, hopefully you are. Thank you so much for uh, for all of the talks, all the presenters. It's really uh, great to see you. Um, I think it's about 45 uh, 40 minutes now, and uh, we'll be back uh, for the next round. So, thanks, everyone. Yes. Have a great lunch. Thanks. All the Thank Bye-bye.
Well, in the in input field, uh, so we see the updates in the real, in real time, not only after we finish the typing, like it was in the initial uh, mobile wizard. Uh, another optimization was using the shared queue uh, within the one uh, dialog. So all the widgets now send uh, their messages to the queue and in that queue, we can reduce number of messages because we know we know that, for example, after full update, uh, the previous updates are not needed anymore. So we can just remove them or we can do other smart optimizations. Uh, we also 
generate JSON uh, in the lazy way. So we generate uh, it only uh, just before sending. So we are sure that uh, it's always up to date. Uh, that optimization was uh, very uh, useful for, for example, icon view, where we have a lot of uh, custom drawn uh, previews. Uh, and this widget was also missing in the our JS dialog implementation on the online site. So I introduced that. And also, thanks to that, uh, we can now have the front work dialog in online. Um, I also uh, reused that widget in the node bar, uh, improving the user experience where we have uh, lots of different styles in the document. So now we can just scroll uh, and look for a correct uh, style. We don't have to click multiple times in, in some uh, buttons. Uh, other widget which was missing uh, in our implementation on the online site was the trivia. It's the most complex widget, I think, uh, because it can show the content in uh, many ways. It can be a simple list box. It can be a tree with some checkboxes or without. It can, it can show notes on demand or even uh, supports uh, drag and drop. As you can see, we were able to introduce a few new features to the uh, online, thanks to uh, that widget. Uh, we have new uh, pivot table creator, improved auto filter drop down, which now we use uh, the JS dialogs. And also we added uh, named ranges support, thanks to define and manage uh, dialogs. Also, uh, as you can see, pivot table dialog supports drag and drop. We can uh, compose a new table uh, just moving uh, some entries around the available uh, trivials inside this dialog. But the most visible uh, feature uh, I implemented last uh, during the last year was the native sidebar. Uh, previously we have we had a sidebar which is drawn uh, on a canvas. It was a, uh, Im just an image. Now we have native HTML controls, so it improves the user experience, for example, on touch devices, where we can have now the native list boxes. We can scroll them uh, very easily. And also uh, this improves uh, the consistent look of the application because we can style the new sidebar with CSS. Uh, sidebar uses a lot of drop downs where we have more advanced uh, editing options and uh, I have to implement that too uh, for the uh, framework. So now toolboxes and menu buttons support uh, drop downs and also uh, I, I improved sidebar a little bit because I added a new panel for font work editing. Uh, as you can see, we can uh, change their uh, shape or uh, layout of the font work. Uh, these are all updates I did uh, last year in JS Dialogs. I think now uh, the framework looks almost complete. Uh, probably we will reuse that in other dialogues too, which are not yet converted. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Pretty cool. Uh, now we have uh, Mike uh, with an update uh, on the forum site. So I will make you a presenter, Mike. Uh, and I see that you are connecting with your camera. Perfect, I see you. Uh, do you see the icon to share the screen? Uh, yes, I see it and I'm sharing it. Perfect. I hope it is visible now. Yes, yes. Perfect, okay. Good. So, go ahead. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm Mike Gansky. 
uh, I am developer uh, in Collabora productivity, mostly working with C++. But today I decided to take part in the contest for the least, less, least technical uh, talk today. <laughs> My talk is not about how to write code, but rather about a way to keep in touch uh, and solve problems even when the conference is over, which is about our forum. Uh, the, uh, uh, we have a forum. <laughs> this is a big message, which uh, could be uh, the <laughs> end of my talk. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, talk about it a bit more. It is already a year old. Uh, it is not exactly the most busy forum on the internet yet, but we are improving in that regard. You may see some numbers here. And uh, why do we have this forum? Uh, it is obvious, uh, using the forums to get in touch, ask questions, uh, get and provide answers, have some uh, easy to use source of uh, uh, ready uh, solutions uh, is familiar to everyone using internet and uh, uh, we use a uh, usable and convenient discourse engine, uh, which makes it uh, almost as user-friendly as Collabora Online itself. And uh, many uh, nice things that you would uh, naturally uh, expect, like uh, answering by email, uh, uh, of course, work uh, in the forum. And uh, this is the place where you can uh, get answers from the first hand. Uh, our developers often uh, answer questions there and not only development related. Uh, basically, uh, everything you want to uh, ask about uh, Collabora Online is fine to discuss on our forum. But uh, the great thing is that uh, we have a very nice community and not only developers are replying. Uh, our community evolves, people becomes, become experts and uh, provide their exper expertise. So user-to-user -user communication becomes most important. It is something that's strengthen, uh, strengthening the community. Uh, sometimes, naturally, uh, you may found a bug or uh, have a feature request, and we have a uh, relevant GitHub section for that, and uh, everyone would use that uh, when uh, they have, uh, they know that uh, something is a feature request or bug, but not always. And uh, our forum uh, often uh, becomes uh starting point for uh, some development uh, when people ask questions which uh, happen to be some deficiency in the code uh, this is uh, also nice so uh, uh, communicating using this resource uh, is helpful also for uh, changes in the code one very important section of the forum that I wanted to uh, uh, st stress uh, the importance of which is uh, our uh, weekly meeting minutes, which are uh, the place where we inform every week uh, about the questions that were uh, discussed uh, and uh, which may, may affect the future, the development of the uh, collab uh, collabora online. Uh, and Pedro had shared links uh, how to start participating in the meetings, in the uh, talk he had in the beginning of the day. Uh, here are some uh, short statistics uh, for the uh, usage of the uh, forum. 
Uh, and you see that uh, the uh, stats are rather uh, stable over the uh, past year. We have uh, steady uh, growth of uh, the signups. We have a uh, steady uh, rate of questions uh, with some uh, spike, uh, but uh, normally it is stable. Uh, you see. Uh, The most important uh, are people who are uh, participating on the uh, forum. And here you may see our most important, most uh, active users who provide much of the value of the great stuff that is already there. Uh, you see that uh, there are people from Collabora, uh, but not only from Collaborate, which is uh, great. Many individuals who are um, or, already experts there are among uh, the most active contributors. I couldn't resist and added the most likes given column here just because I appear there. Uh, so uh basically <laughs> that's all what i wanted to uh, share about our forum uh, on this uh, talk please ask your questions and please visit our forum today and at any time when you have something to ask or share uh, thank you very much Thanks, Mike. It's amazing awesome. the work you have been doing. Uh, and you are a really interesting case because you have so much technical no knowledge and then you are also very active in every single answer. And it's, it's really nice to <clears throat> bring more, uh, more of that technical knowledge to, to, to those questions that are really waiting for an answer. So thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. I see. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so. Uh, next up, we have um, uh, Andras Stimar with uh, how to get involved in uh, translation. So, uh -huh. I was about to set the link. Yes, but I guess. A pre yes, go ahead. Recording. Thanks. Yes, exactly. Okay, thanks. Hello, and welcome to my talk about how to get involved in translation. My name is Andras Timar and I work with Collabora Productivity as project manager. I was one of the engineers who developed localization support to Collabora Online. That's why I have the honor to present this topic to you. So localization is a wider concept than translation. It includes translation and other differences such as default page size, measurement units, decimal separator and so on. But in this talk, by localization I mean translation of the user interface from English to another language. So we all know that uh, Collabora Online is a client-server application and the client part is written in JavaScript. So when we try to localize the JavaScript user interface, first we needed to find a suitable uh, JavaScript library that was good enough. And we found one, this Eligray Eltenen JS, which uh, introduces a um, function, underscore function, and we simply put the English string in this underscore function and it will take care of the localization. It will look it up from JSON files. On the other hand, we can use this underscore markup to teach xgettext to extract the strings to pod files, which translators then can convert and translate to PO files, and we convert the PO files back to JSON by a homemade PO to JSON Python script. <coughs> So it, it, this library has many advantages. Uh, it falls back to English. It loads uh, JSON files on demand. So it uh, uh, <coughs> saves uh, resources as much as possible. For the HTML files, we are using the HTML to PO script from the Translate Toolkit. And uh, HTML is then localized by J jQuery. So certain HTML tags are selected, which means that uh, we use a very limited subset of HTML in or help files, but it's uh, no problem. So when we first uh, built uh, 
initially the JavaScript user interface, we recognize that we copied a lot of from uh, LibreOffice uh, desktop version. For example, the, the menus. The menu structure is more or less the same. So uh, to avoid duplicate work and to get translations for free, we introduced uh, another function, this UNO function, and uh, in the user interface, source code of the user interface, we simply uh, put the UNO command instead of the uh, English string, and then we extract these uh, translations from the LibreOffice core by this uh, UNO command uh, Python script. So it uses the same uh, Altenen JS framework, but we, it, it is a different JSON file for the UNO commands. Also, we found uh, other similarities, status bar strings, language names, style names, and so on. So these additional strings are again extracted from the LibreOffice core by, by another Python script, and we use a different JSON file uh, for these strings as well. So the result is that a very few strings uh, remain that has to be actually translated for online. So currently, for the user interface, uh, less than uh, 400 strings has to be translated. The other part of the user interface uh, is the so-called tunneled dialogues and sidebar, which uh, come from the LibreOffice core as pre-rendered bitmaps. So it was quite hard uh, to achieve that during collaborative editing when user A uses, for example, English and user B, for example, German uh, browser settings, the same uh, core and the two views uh, switch the languages. So this requires language packs on the server sides, naturally, and it's a common mistake that people don't read uh, installation manual and forgot these steps and uh, get uh, half translated user interface. So let me uh, show the screenshots uh, in a bigger size because uh, sometimes uh, they are not very visible over the video. So here we have two browsers. Uh, one is uh, Chrome, the other is Firefox. Chrome is in English, Firefox is in German. And we see that we edit the same document uh, at the same time and one user get uh, the user interface in English and the other uh, in German. So, there is a new approach to uh, obsolete uh, these tunneled dialogues and sidebars. This is called the JS Dialogues, because uh, it, uh, it's uh, better themable and uh, we can uh, get the uh, nicer look of the user interface. This is uh, uh, similar uh, to, the, to the previous uh, tunneled uh, method in the, uh, with regards of the uh, localization. So the JS client gets localized JSON content from the server that describes the user interface. Therefore, it also requires language packs on the server side. So here is the screenshot in bigger. This screenshot is from uh, Collabora Online 2021 snapshot. So you can see that uh, the sidebar is localized. So how to get involved in translation? First of all, let me introduce you our translation tool, Weblate. So why we, did we pick Weblate? TDF use it for translating LibreOffice. Therefore, we thought it would be familiar to LibreOffice translators, and we hope that former LibreOffice uh, online translators or LibreOffice core translators would follow us uh, to the new infrastructure. So WebLate is open source, actively developed. It has version control integration, which is important uh, for us. Although automatic actions would be possible uh, in order to reduce the new noise, uh, I manually update WebLate when new strings are introduced and uh, I manually push new translations uh, before the release. But uh, this uh, GitHub integration makes this uh, really easy. And uh, I must note uh, a difference uh, to the TDF's uh, policy. So we retain authorship of translations. 
so uh, translations uh, translators uh, names and uh, email addresses uh, get to the git log so we can properly credit them and it was also important that weblate was available as a hosted service so we could set it up uh, in a few hours and we had our translation infrastructure ready almost immediately after the move to github last october so Colabora is happy to pay money for the good cause and uh, support open source development. So we support uh, weblate development by paying for this uh, hosted service. So weblate has many useful features that uh, help translators. For example, it has translation memory. You never have to translate the same string twice. And also, it has automatic suggestions from Google Translate, Microsoft Translator, or DeepL. And you can check translations of strings to other languages to get inspiration. It has also checks for punctuation, added missing tags, un unchanged translation, and so on. So let me quickly show you the, the, the user interface that I was talking about. It, uh, in, in this example, uh, I have uh, the Hungarian uh, translation. Here you have the English source string. You have here the translation. And uh, you can check the automatic suggestions from the different uh, <coughs> uh, sources. And also you can check the other languages, as I mentioned, how they translated uh, this, uh, the, the, this string. And of course we have uh, many other options. You can uh, add a screenshot of the user interface to uh, describe the term better and so on and so on. So, all tr translators are welcome. We no have no restrictions. We don't screen our translators. We don't ask for uh, special permissions. You can just uh, come and join, create your, uh, um, create your account, or you can sign in with your open ID provider. Weblate supports a lot of them, Bitbucket, Facebook, GitHub, GitLab, OpenSUSE, whatever. After the registration, uh, you follow the instructions and select you the language that you want to work with. And that's all. You can start translation right away. So here are the projects that you can work with. Most important is Collabora online user interface and Collabora Online Help. We also have uh, some additional strings for the mobile applications. And we have a project for the Alfresco plugin. And we also have a project for the App Store descriptions and code welcome text. But please note, if you want to uh, full translation of Collabora Online, you need to translate the localized strings that are come coming from LibreOffice Core, and those can be translated at the Document Foundation's WebLate instance, this translations documentfoundation.org. So our next release, the Collabora Online 2021, is based on LibreOffice 7.1. So how can you help? You can test Collabora Online in your native language. You can report translation issues on GitHub, or even fix them on WebLate. So you can check the statistics of your native native language on weblate and help to bring it up to 100%. Uh, so there are some languages uh, which seem to be unmaintained, so help there is uh, highly appreciated. But uh, of course, feel free to help wherever you can. And last but not least, let me thank you all of the contribu contributors who have uh, ever uh, submitted translations to Collabora Online. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please ask them. Otherwise, thanks. Bye. Thanks. So 
Uh, we are going to, again, I, I ask you to, to save all your questions for the Q&A uh, time slot. And now we have, uh, we have Gabriel uh, with uh, stability and cleanup improvements in online. Uh, can you hear me, Gabriel? Uh, yes. Can you hear I me? I can hear. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, do you see the the icon to share the screen? Oh uh, yes, I see it. I see it. Uh, so first, I should start the uh, presentation mode, right? Yes, yes. Or you yes, or you can just share the whole the full screen, and it doesn't matter. It's up to you. Uh, so can you see? You see my uh, my it doesn't work. So you can see my uh, you can see the impress interface, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So it's so you can either share the whole screen or pick the other window in the case. Okay. Okay. Let me try again. So I will start the slideshow. Okay. And then uh, uh, is the same. Okay, okay. Then I will share the entire screen. Yes, it's better. <laughs> okay. Entire uh, screen. Okay, and uh, now can you see? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you. So, uh, hello uh, for those who doesn't know me. My name is Gabriel Massey. Uh, I'm a, a senior CC++ developer at uh, One One Company, Mail and Media Department. Uh, my main task uh, here is to integrate Collabora Online into our online office applications. And uh, today I will uh, talk about stability and uh, cleanup improvements in online. Uh, as some of you already know, uh, our company provides cloud services, which means that the users are able to store, retrieve documents to from our servers. Also, it provides uh, features of uh, viewing uh, and editing uh, those documents. The view feature is provided through online office uh, viewer application, which is based on uh, Collabora Online and it uses uh, its uh, convert to REST API. Uh, the files are converted to PDF and then displayed uh, in browser. Uh, the edit feature is provided through online office editor uh, application, which is also based on Collabora Online and uh, provides the entire set of uh, editing capabilities of Collabora Online. Uh, these new applications uh, are also used uh, by uh, mail attachments for uh, viewing and editing attachments. Uh, so let's talk about uh, a little bit about the scale uh, of the deploy deployment. So um, the deployment of each of these of the applications consists of more than 100 good instances. Combined, they, they perform more than 600,000 conversions in 24 hours in viewer. Uh, in the editor, more than uh, 35,000 uh, uh, documents are edited in 24 hours, and more than 600 parallel uh, documents are edited at the same time, of course, parallel. Um, so such a scale of uh, deployment needs a powerful uh, and robust mechanism of deployment, scaling, and management. That's why we use Kubernetes. Uh, from Kubernetes' perspective, uh, we have a single instance uh, of Collabora Online per each pod. So at the end, uh, we have... Uh, more than 100 pods for each application. Um, so uh, again, the, the scale of, uh, of, of deployment means uh, uh, that there could be some uh, stability and performance issues. And indeed, we experienced both of them. As you know, uh, Collabora Online is based on LibreOffice, uh, which is a very complex application uh, and which is constantly evolving and so on. So, for any developer, it's not something unusual to experience uh, such kind of issues. However, if we take into account the scale of the deployment that I just already discussed about, the weight of these issues increases uh, sig significantly. 
so we experienced uh, crashes some of them uh, were solved and shared with community most of them were solved by community yeah some of them are still there probably will be solved uh, solved uh, in the in the future uh, also we experienced perf performance issues like uh, abnormal cpu usage and uh, memory uh, memory consumptions uh, <coughs> Uh, we've seen that the, most of the sources of these issues uh, are located inside core, which, uh, as you know, uh, uh, is loaded uh, inside a kit process. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, how do we deal with these kind of issues? Uh, well, <laughs> there are multiple approaches that uh, can be used to solve them. Uh, of course, the ideal approach is to solve the underlying issues, but this is something that is time and uh, resource cons consuming. Uh, and is never ending uh, because of the constant evolution of the application. Uh, at any time, a new problem could, uh, could appear because a new code was committed and so on. Uh, another approach is to use uh, Kubernetes. Uh, this means that uh, problematic pods can be restarted. Uh, but this solution has some drawbacks. For example, if a pod uh, has uh, 30 kit processes and only one single kit process does all the mess, then by restarting the pod, all the other kit processes uh, will be killed. And the users that have documents opened inside that pod will experience reconnections. They will lose their edit context uh, and so on, which is from user perspective uh, is very unpleasant. The third approach is to implement an automatic cleanup uh, mechanism that destroys only the problematic kit processes. Um, from our point of view, uh, uh, the last approach seemed the most uh, simple, fast to implement, and efficient one, uh, which can deal even with uh, uh, with uh, new issues that can uh, can appear as as the application evolves. Uh, <clears throat> so we split the problematic kit processes into two categories: kits that are still referenced by LUL WSD and kits that were lost by LUL WSD. This is because uh, uh, each category needs a different approach. Uh, those that are, that are still referenced by LULWSD could still uh, process some user input, so they need a more careful approach. Those that were, uh, were lost can be handled more directly because they are useless uh, and, and they should not exist, in fact. So let's discuss uh, about each category. Um, so a kit is a consuming one suited for disposal. If the document is in uh, is in idle state for at least a particular amount of time, uh, this amount of time is uh, very important because it tells us that the re uh, resource consuming is not generated by users' actions like uh, scrolling or copy pasting large data um, and so on, but by an issue that comes from inside the application. Uh, then the document must consume uh, resources for at least another particular amount of time. This is also important uh, because in some cases the resource consuming is something normal, if, even if it's not generated directly by a user, like for example, um, an autosave uh, uh, with a large document. And of course, uh, there must be a minimum threshold for CPU and memory usage. If these criteria are met, then the kit process is aborted uh, first, uh, uh, an abort signal is sent to the process, and uh, if at the next iteration the process is still running, then uh, a kill signal is sent to it. There is a set of settings in the configuration file, lulwsd.xml, uh, to which these criteria can be customized and where a set of default values are provided, and to which you can uh, enable disable uh, uh, this cleanup. Um, a kit is considered lost uh, if it's not referenced by LULWSD in either new children or dog brokers maps for uh, for a particular amount of time. Again, uh, this time uh, this amount of time is uh, important because uh, there are cases when a kit process is up and running, <clears throat> uh, but is not referenced by LULWSD. For example, uh, right after it is spawned and before it establishes a connection with the uh, WSD, which triggers a, a registration of it. Um, this amount of time can be set in the configuration file and has a default default value of uh, two minutes. Uh, if you pass a value of zero, the cleanup is uh, disabled. Also, there is a metric exposed uh, through the REST endpoint, uh, 
which counts the number of lost kits uh, terminated uh, processes. Uh, for those uh, who doesn't know, there is a REST uh, endpoint which provides a set of uh, metrics uh, in, a, in a Prometheus compatible format. This, uh, this was created uh, uh, um, because we needed that uh, and we use it heavily. Uh, okay, so um, our experience. Uh, well, <laughs> we are using it uh, successfully for almost uh, two years and it proved to be critical for the stability of our system in some, in some situations. Uh, below you can see a graphic which shows the evolution in time of the CPU usage uh, of each pod. Each colored line represents the CPU usage of a single pod. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, at the time we introduced a bug which had the effect of disabling the cleanup mechanism of lost kits. And suddenly we started to receive alerts from Kubernetes that there are pods that are using too many resources for too much time. Uh, you can see on the left side of the graphic that there are pods which are heavily consuming uh, CPU. So after we fixed the issue and redeployed the application, the problem disappeared. As you can see on the right side of the graphic, uh, and this is how uh, 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 a healthy uh, deployment uh, of the application should look like. Okay. Um, what, what I want to mention is uh, that uh, here, uh, this is a soft case. We experienced uh, much more severe cases, but unfortunately, I, uh, I found only this uh, graphic in my, <laughs> in my uh, screenshots I have. Um, last number, uh, last numbers shows us that there are uh, between 100 and 200 lost uh, kits uh, dismissed per 24 hours, uh, most on conversions between 50 and 100 resource consuming kits dismissed per 24 hours, all on editor. Uh, why on editor? <clears throat> uh, because this is not applicable uh, to conversions because the idle time property has no meaning uh, f uh, in this case for conversions. Okay, uh, all I want to mention is that we are, right now we are using uh, a slightly old uh, uh, version of uh, Collabora Online. So these numbers uh, were generated by that uh, version. Uh, and we are in the middle of uh, the of process of, of, uh, of upgrading to the latest version of Collabora Online, which uh, uh, I expect uh, 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 to be more stable and most probably those, these numbers will be much lower. Okay. Um, so at the end, I would like to say thank, uh, thank you to Collabora Online and LibreOffice communities that made this application possible, um, available and uh, very useful. Okay, so thank you. Thanks a lot, Gabriel. So uh, next we have... Um, oh. cool. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> We have uh, Gulsha Kosa. I will give you the floor. Um, can you hear me, Gulsha? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Can you see the icon uh, next to the camera? Yes, I can see. Now sharing my screen now. I select the entire screen. Perfect, I can see the, your whole screen and I can see your camera. So start uh, when you are ready. Thanks. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Gusha. Uh, I'm software engineer at Collabora Productivity almost three years. Uh, I'm working uh, on Collabora Office mostly. Uh, I'm experienced with interoperability bugs. And today I will talk about uh, how do we proceed when we receive a problematic OOXML document from a customer. Um, first, uh, when we get a problematic file, first of all, uh, I try to reproduce the bug myself. Uh, in this process, uh, I check whether missing information is given. Uh, if I can't reproduce the bug, uh, I report my own steps to customer and ask uh, what is missing. Uh, after that, 
generally, uh, reported files are complicated and crowded. Uh, to focus the problem, uh, I try to simplify documents, if it is possible. And for example, uh, the bug is the bug can only relate it to a table in the document, but uh, there may be additional text, images, objects in the document. Uh, in this case, uh, I clean unnecessary objects step by step, and uh, I have to be careful in that stage because some bugs are related with two objects or more complicated. Uh, it, at each step, uh, I check to see if I can still reproduce the bug. And then uh, I inspect the problematic object on UI. And here I take notes of what caught my attention. And then I read the XML files inside the document. And all XML documents uh, contains mostly uh, compressed XML files. Uh, when we use the unzip command, uh, we can see the XMS as you see at that image. Uh, at, the, uh, at this stage, I can get more detailed information about the problematic object. And for example, a paragraph element will look like uh, it's following. Uh, it has more info than UI as you see. Uh, after that, we try to detect problematic part in XMS. Uh, as you can see, uh, all XML is hard to understand document format than ODF. Uh, at uh, this stage, we can get help from uh, all XML specification to understand which uh, element means what. And now it's time to pick uh, some keywords to um, and uh, use use them in our uh, solution. And now it's time to understand how Collabora Office handles that problematic object. And for this, we need to collect good keywords from the XMS. And then we are on the hardest stage and it, it, it is not possible to formulate, unfortunately. And we will grab our keywords, take notes, read the suspected code, code parts, debug them, and we will do it again and again until we understand what is the problem in the code base. And when we understand the problem once, we will apply our solution ideas one by one, and we will hope it, it, <laughs> they will work. I want to show uh, one real example uh, that I saw before. Uh, that's an export bug. You can see details uh, from that link uh, if you are interested. In. And problem was uh, when that we open the file, then save it, then open again, we lose the last part of that text. Uh, in first sight, uh, it seems an export bug, but first I want to understand uh, how that simple text looks like in XMS. It was looking like that. Uh, for one line, there are four texts run, the first, second, third, and fourth. Uh, that's normal because the and is bold, as you see, and the other parts has different properties. Uh, I select uh, as a keyword, I note the text body uh, and try to understand how uh, it is imported in source code. Then uh, I saw that uh, interesting thing in UI. Uh, playing with UI is uh, important, I think. Uh, in sidebar, uh, text has an animation. And before the export code is called, it seems wrong in sidebar. 
During import, something happened and we lost the last part of the text. And when I removed the animation of the text, the bug disappeared and I was sure about and I had to focus on animation. And read, I, uh, I read the XMS again and find some keywords to understand how an animation is imported. Uh, during the uh, grab, read, and debug session, uh, I found uh, animation mode class handles our animation. Uh, at the last stage, I saw interesting value here. You can see a selection, a selection uh, as a parameter uh, during uh, insert into document. Uh, create enumeration is called, uh, there is MA selection. Uh, our, our string has 11 character, but selection value was 8. Uh, eight. Uh, last three character is missing here. Uh, I focus to where that missing selection value comes here. And uh, that part is uh, really hard to track, trust me. <laughs> I took some help from Mike Kaganski. Thanks, Mike, again. <laughs> At the end, uh, we found set selection function called here, uh, but it was early time to call it. So we just move it at the end of the function and problem is resolved. Uh, that's the method uh, that I used while uh, working on interoper interoperability bugs. And that's all from me. Thank you for listening. Uh, is there any question? Thanks, Gulsha. Uh, I think we will be waiting for the Q&A uh, time slot for answering those questions. But thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we have uh, Tor with the uh, performance improvements. Um, I just made you a presenter, Tor. Can you hear me? You are muted. Yes, and can you can yes, you hear me? I can see you Good. and hear you. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, missing let the me share this, mm -hmm. share this window, this one. There. So I'm uh, talking about some performance improvement and some uh, tooling we developed or enhanced for, for that. Uh, First about the tooling we had or and have. There were there or there is still this so-called uh, profile zone class in core LibreOffice. Uh, and it used to work so that for each uh, time you constructed such an object, it logs one line of of text and and then when the object goes away, it also logs one line of text. So you would like um, have one such variable in a function and and then you would get one line when the function is entered and one line when the function is is exited and uh, the output format from this was some uh, homegrown format that we had some Perl scripts to manipulate and inspect with I don't remember if what if we had some graphical tool to look at the result, but it's possible also. Anyway, we wanted something better. We wanted something that would uh, produce a format that would be directly usable by some existing viewer. And uh, the choice was uh, a format defined by Google, trace event format. It's used by uh, Chrome. Uh, and also Chrome also is a viewer for this format. Uh, it's based on or it is JSON and it is fairly human readable. The specification is public, but of course it's just uh, something that Google has come up with. It's not clear how how stable it will be this format, but Anyway, it's good enough for now. Uh, so we modified this 
profile zone class to instead output this tracebed data. And uh, I also refactored the uh, class to, to be able to output other types of events than the ones that correspond directly to the profile zone things. Unfortunately, then after a while, I noticed that actually the tracebed viewer in Chrome doesn't support all the types of events that they specify. So it was a bit annoying. Uh, and we wanted something similar or more or less identical in the online code base too. Uh, we can't use the same implementation as in four because that uses bibliography specific types and uh, so it was it's not like thousands of lines of code anyway so i just rewrote it to use such types that are available in online like standard string types and so on and uh, we wanted something similar also for the javascript i mean so not not yet that one <laughs> Uh, how are these trace events then handled in the online process processes? It is the WSG process that uh, creates this file and writes to it because that file is somewhere the file system where you want it to be. It's not inside these uh, these sandboxes or jails that the Git processes only have access to. But uh, most of the interesting profiling data is, is from the kit processes, so they have to send these events as they are generated to, to the WSD process. Uh, and uh, then this is what I was already starting to talk about. We wanted it in JavaScript too, and uh, there you can't have just simple uh, variables that do something when they are constructed and when they are destructed because JavaScript is garbage collected. Not, it's not uh, scope based lifetime of variables. So the API is slightly different. You need to call a function when you want uh, one of these events to be generated. And this data is then sent to the WST process and and written out by it. Uh, and all, all this, of course, is entirely optional. You have to enable it in the in the lolwsd.xml file. And then additionally, you have to turn it on for individual documents being edited. And uh, have we found any any results then thanks to this yes we have some uh, we found that for instance the message handling in in the javascript could be improved by a kind of buffering that they call slurping and also we find that something that we expected would be very heavy heavy turned out to not be that heavy after all or at least the trace events generated from that, those were quite insignificant in, in duration. And then uh, all the other kinds of improvements that we have done that have not used this trace event tooling. We have used other tools to discover bottlenecks and and parts of the code that take lots of time. Uh, we were in initially of the opinion that JavaScript is quite fast language and, and uh, you don't have to be too careful with how you write code, but that turns out to be uh, a misunderstanding. And in fact, if you do things wrongly, it will be very slow and just by some relatively small refactoring you can improve performance a lot 
uh, for instance, this slope that I mentioned and also other kinds of, of buffering helps. And uh, if you create strings like all the time by appending one character to a string and signing it to the same variable and so on, that's obviously going to be very slow. And uh, also the way our JavaScript reacts to messages from the uh, cool server had, has been improved. Like uh, when the server sends us messages that cause, cause the, uh, the document model to be modified. Uh, I mean, for, for the for those parts of the UI that are implemented in HTML. It's not a good idea to keep doing it repeatedly the same things, even if you get the same messages, but it's a good idea to wait a bit and see if if nothing more, more is coming and then do the, do the, the manip manipulation of the DOM. And also we had been using some third party libraries that were apparently a bit too heavy. Uh, like the, I think the list of fonts that we displayed was for some reason extremely heavy and caused a, a long delay. And that's all, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Uh, thanks, Thor. Cool. So it's questions time. Yeah? Exactly. <laughs> so why don't we all uh, share and uh, hide the uh, with this minus uh, little thing presentation and perhaps see each other, which is all fun. And uh, yeah, so questions. There were, there were a number of them here in the uh, in the chat. Uh, so Ralph, you're you you were very interested in the uh, resource uh, saving that Gabriel. Gabriel implemented there. Yeah. yeah, my question was, is that already in the regular uh, Collabora version and how to switch it on and fine tune it to what we need? Because we basically, uh, we have the same problems. We have, I would call it wild running uh, processes. And obviously at the moment, the only thing we can do if we identify it's in that pot, we kill the pot. But obviously, that throws everyone else uh, out of it, out of their document, and that's not desired. If it's just one document, sometimes a broken document, which causes the problem. You're muted, Gabriel. <laughs> so it is the software. Yes. It, is, it is there in the software. It is there. In yeah. Microphone. Yeah. So is in. Uh, so is already there. Uh, what I want to mention is that. Um, I don't know what uh, what version uh, are you using, but uh, at some point I saw a problem there because the name of the git process is uh, changed and uh, wasn't changed in uh, that mechanism, so it was a problem. But I, as far as I remember, I fixed that. I don't remember when, uh, probably a few months ago. But if you will take the latest version, uh, it will it should work. Yeah, so we are like one week or so behind the latest version usually ah no no it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> yeah it's, it's enabled by default gabriel or not i i assume we should no, no. It by default, but it's not enabled by default it's should not enabled by default uh well it's normal to not be enabled by default because uh, it's uh, well it kills processes it's something <laughs> uh. yeah 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 but so, it, sounds like it might be rather useful and you you might die of something else if you don't get killed from that you know so yeah yes yes uh, so uh, how do you enable? Um, uh, you have an enable attribute in the cleanup, I think, tag, which enables uh, uh, the mechanism. Um, it enables both mechanisms, the lost for lost kits and for uh, resource consuming. Uh, if you want to disable uh, uh, for, uh, the mechanism for uh, lost kits, uh, you just need to put a zero inside that uh, grace period. and. Uh, and that's it. The numbers that are there, uh, the default numbers, um, uh, are very close to what we, we are using. So uh, it 
could be it could prove uh, useful to know that because we already tested them and they work very fine yeah so thanks Gabriel. very helpful yeah thanks a lot and uh, so a, 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 any other question you can contact me i i will help you <laughs> okay yeah that's <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot yeah, yeah yeah what is the price of fish in lithuania you know, yeah. Yeah, well it's, it's good to know that uh, someone else will use this mechanism because as far as i know only we are using it <laughs> for now I mean, we have a similar deployment also on kubernetes so yeah, yeah. we're probably facing similar problems even if we use it uh on a much smaller scale I, yeah. I was particularly encouraged by your stats they gave but 35,000 users editing every 24 hours and only 50 to 100 which is like 0.3 percent of them have yes this problem, yes right? uh, yes but you know uh <laughs> A single, uh, a single kit process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. an entire pod. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so the other question I have for you, Gabriel, is what hardware are you running your your cluster on, or what? How does that look? Uh, well, I don't have uh, honestly uh, access to that information. All I can say is uh, that we are running two cores per per pod, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's it. What I can say. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, any other questions? Were there more in here? In the oh, we, we were very interested, Andras, in your tr in, in translation uh, stuff uh, and and trying to reduce it and all its profiling and whether we have more than we need in there. I don't, I don't know. Yes. So there are a couple of questions in the shared notes, Andras. So. Uh, basically, first question is in which language uh, Collabra is lacking effort uh, and why? Less native speaker, other cultural logic, etc. And the contrary, in which language we are most efficient? Uh, there was a couple of links, I think I, I and probably Elisa dropped so we, people can see the, the statistics there. And of course, yeah, you yeah, can. Yeah, we have statistics on the, on the WebLate instance so you can get very detailed data about that. Yeah, so I, I just presented, I think there was there are 25 languages, about 90%. So these are the maintained and we support uh, about 70 languages and, and 100 in LibreOffice core. But there is a long tail, of course. So with only a few strings and a percentage I, i'm considering a, a language as uh, available as complete i mean uh-huh i think we build uh, for for the online part we build everything even with the smallest contribution and for the core we pick the the 50 most translated languages so and of course, so we provide those 50 language packs, but uh, of course, uh, users don't have to install them all, just just those that are actually needed, so. And there was some thought about WebLate resetting translations as you move between versions or something like that and being different products. Is that right or how does that work? Well, now we have two versions, 6.4 and uh, the next, 2021. And we try to keep them in sync in terms of even if we add something to 2021, we don't remove. So uh, we translate master basically, and we can uh, backport those translations easily to, uh, to 6.4. And and we reduce the, the workload on translators so we don't have two uh, projects for, for each version in WebLate. Cool. Um, were there other questions? Pedro or anyone else? I guess we're, we're slightly running into the next slot already. Is that right? No, we have six minutes left. Oh, we have six minutes left. I, I can't read. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> In which case? Yeah, so there, 
Yeah, there were uh, people here uh, amazed uh, with the uh, Gusha presentation and the attention to detail to fiddle with the uh, XML and try to find out from where the problem comes from. Uh, I'm just trying to scan it for questions. Yes, and then there was this question we, William was asking about uh, if we have uh, deep L integration. But I think we don't, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, Kendi has answered to me that yeah. you uh -huh. are kind of partnership with, with them, and the, and the reason we have uh, all Collabora logo on the WeBlade homepage. Exactly. But uh, this doesn't answer the question whether we have DeepL integrated, basically. <laughs> so I will have to check uh -huh. this after after the meeting just to see. <laughs> Nicholas can... wants DeepL in, in Collabora Online as well, <laughs> uh, which is the, yeah, 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 these little little requests, you know. Yeah, I need to translate so many texts and uh, it would make my life much easier. And it's actually not only me, uh, in my team, several people asked me, hey, can we have DeepL integrated into Colabor Online? And I said, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know, <laughs> maybe we need to pay for it. <laughs> question. I wonder how difficult it is to do. Uh, this could be uh, interesting because for the new translation uh, tool I want to deploy on the website, uh, something which uh, will allow to translate in context. So, uh, Root uh, will be uh, glad that we will have finally this on our website. Uh, mm -hmm. This tool is called Translate Press, and it requires indeed uh, API access to DeepL integration. So maybe we could, if we don't have access to to, Weblade, to DeepL on WeBlade, maybe this is a combination of uh, access we could get, since this so, is basically the same API. So, so William, uh, I've just checked. Uh, we have uh, we have the DeepL. Okay. Uh, so just like, for those you, who don't know. When you start translating uh, in your language, there is this uh, automatic, uh, I don't know, I have it in check, so <laughs> automatic <laughs> subs, uh, like uh, recommendations and uh, like uh, there is, uh, uh, there is deep, uh, and there is, I don't know, Google Translate. Uh, just saying that people is, is really much better than compared to all the other services like it beats all of them um, at least for the language that i know especially german english and french and uh, it's it's nearly perfect really it's indeed awesome. this is what i'm using at martin Marston. this made my life basically easier way easier yeah. when translating yeah. so <laughs> cool. any other questions or thoughts or My hip is that the detail thing is relatively easy to do. It's just a matter of finding in turn with, uh, you know, and, and the business of going to deeper and working out what the API token is and how to something or other. Yes, I, your camera ball works. <laughs> I can see, I see you are drinking some nice uh, cup of coffee, it seems. Uh, but I think you are muted. I cannot hear you. So maybe because you joined with the uh, headphones or something. Yeah, I cannot still. No. Well, you might need to reload to get uh, a microphone working. Yes. Sam Robson is featuring the background. Okay, so uh, nice. So let's. <laughs> Uh, slowly move to the next talk. Sure. Uh, in ah, one sure. minute, I think. Yes. Yes, yeah, so we can share the screen. So we're ready to go as we. Uh, as Do we you can. hear me? Yes, can hear you, Ash. That's all good. Okay. Let me uh, hide my video again. One second. The test, the test is fine then. See yes, you. Perfect. See you in a few minutes, guys. See you. Um, and nice. I see that you, Ash, already are the presenter. So that's perfect. <clears throat> oh, 
probably best to hide, Paul, unless you want everyone to look at you. <laughs> Turning turn your video off. You know? Don't tell. Paul, it's probably best to turn your video off if you if you. Uh, yeah. I think we're ready. Goldwyn, Ash, are you? Uh, are you good to go? I can't hear you though, unfortunately. Maybe that's my hearing, but. Uh... Oh no! Ah, actually, no, I hear you. I hear you. I see you, and uh, your screen is also okay. shared. Perfect. Ready to rock and roll. Okay. Um, I would really like not to have this edit this this page <laughs> not sure where this is coming from um i welcome everybody um i'm going to try and present the um, async save um, feature uh, design uh, within the next few minutes um it's a it's an interesting feature that has um, a lot of uh, implications um, my name is, um, is Ashot Akashian and I usually go by Ash, um, if that is easier for you to pronounce. What I'm going to try to do today is um, present the, uh, the, the, the issue that we're trying to uh, tackle, um, the challenges that follow from that particular um, attempt the risks that we're, we, we have to uh, be cognizant of whenever we're doing a major change in the core of our product um, and how we came about um, with the solution and the results that, that we've achieved. Um, again, this is this is a summary and I have to apologize for, for this persistent pop-up um, that's um, um, hiding my text. So the problem um, is that saving and uploading are two uh, separate processes or um, uh, stages um, during the lifetime of editing a, a document. But uh, from the user's perspective, they are one and the same. And, and this, though not an issue in and of itself, the fact that behind the scenes um, there are different stages um, to saving a document as seen from the user's perspective um, that also involves um, the network uh, and storage and a lot of other complicated details like the access token and the permissions that the user the user has um, and whether or not the token is valid or has expired. All of these things, you know, come into view uh, when you uh, uh, dig a little bit deeper. But from the user's perspective, uh, they just want saving to work. They want auto saving to work in the background. They just want to be confident that their data is safe and secure at all times. Um, saving is, is not, not an issue in the sense that it is within our uh, control. Um, and uploading is the one that is a little bit more problematic because it involves the network, which can be unreliable, slow. Um, and of course, it also blocks the, uh, the UI while we were doing it. Uh, and that was the main issue that we, we didn't want um, uh, the failures of the um, uploading to become um, either apparent or uh, problematic for, for the user. Um, the, the challenge in trying to change this behavior and make it um, asynchronous, meaning that it, it wouldn't block um, and, and also make it flexible enough that it would retry and would be able to uh, pick up uh, uh, where it left off if it was, you know, retrying a failed upload um, is that we needed to change the core um, socket management within uh, uh, the code base. And that means that um, we, we needed to make the uh, upload operation um, asynchronous without any blocking, but we also had to um, deal with um, all the different features that we were already using uh, that existed without breaking any uh, compatibility for uh, our uh, customers and our deployments. Um, and that, of course, includes all sorts of variations of SSL and um, uh, proxies and um, uh, details of the HTTP protocol. Um, making a change to the sockets and the, the networking layer obviously um, um, 
inherently brings a lot of risks that um, we have to manage upfront and we have to be very mindful of um, lest we you know risk the stability of our product and uh, of course the um, the the level of satisfaction of our customers and partners um, uh, changing the HTTP layer um, obviously is 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 very much um, reinventing the wheel in this context um, however um, the fact that we were already using uh, a ready-made uh, library um, also means that we were basically um, you know buying the flexibility and ease of uh, use of ready-made functionality um, and trading that with scalability and high performance and all sorts of advanced management um, uh, you know features and abilities meaning uh, poco which was which, which is a library that we um, had been using um, gives us the ease of uh, you know accessing all of those uh, HTTP features uh, but at the same time obviously it, it um, it limits our ability to make this a, an enterprise level product uh, with all the um, necessary advanced uh, features and controls that are uh, expected in that domain. Um, on the application level itself, uh, we needed to um, make sure that uh, the, uh, the, the, the two different save and upload stages uh, remain separate, but at the same time, we had to uh, contend with the fact that saving uh, is uh not always an independent stage um saving has to happen for example before renaming a document which might not be obvious um but if you think about it you you do want to save before renaming or converting um and indeed whenever you have a, a conflict uh resolution meaning you're trying to upload an older version of a document uh, because somebody else um, updated the document uh, whilst you were editing it and, and that, that can happen in, in certain uh, scenarios uh, that involve uh, mismanagement of the, the, the uh, hierarchy of the storage versus the editing. All of these um, corner cases, you know, ha had to be uh, fairly, um, you know, thought out and uh, planned for, um, otherwise we would break things. Um, so all of these things, you know, bring um, risks that we had to, um, um, you know, maintain and manage and make sure that we're not regressing. Uh, the solution uh, that we came up with uh, was fairly straightforward. Um, we wanted to leverage uh, the already existing uh, asynchronous sockets that we had in the um, uh, in the in the core uh, code base. Uh, which we had developed actually um, at Colabra. Uh, these, the asynchronous sockets themselves um, uh, work for all of our uh, web socket um, communication, which is the heart of um, all the communication with the browser. Uh, and that was, you know, perfectly fine, but we did not have, um, you know, a regular um, uh, connection oriented HTTP protocol implementation uh, that we could use for external uh, servers. Specifically, in this case, for uploading, we need to communicate with the, um, uh, the storage host uh, that is provided to us, which is a, an opaque URL that could be HTTP or HTTPS. And what we needed to do was basically uh, make sure that we're using the same existing mechanisms that we had for asynchronous HTTP, which is extremely um, uh, lean and performant uh, because we uh, we used uh, a single thread basically to do all of the uh, socket uh, plumbing on the low level uh, kernel and hardware um, um, abstractions. And we needed to extend that uh, to be used for pretty much any, um, any HTTP uh, request uh, seamlessly. And that's the approach that we took. And on the uh, implementation level, basically, we uh, created uh, new abstract uh, concepts for HTTP request and response. Um, and all the necessary plumbing and the protocol parsers were also implemented in a very modular way. Um, as we will see very soon, uh, that was critical for making things uh, highly testable and uh, flexible. Um, at the same time, we, we wanted to make sure that um, uh, when we're replacing POCO, 
we're we're leaving most of the periphery uh, unchanged so that it would the new code would be compatible with the existing interfaces within our code base in general um, this highly complex um, graphic is a depiction of um, really the simplicity of the architecture. Um, we have a single thread that does all the listening uh, to the uh, external incoming uh, uh, connection requests from the browsers. Um, and we have a single polling thread uh, behind the scenes that is responsible for doing the plumbing for us. Um, that single thread is extremely efficient in that um, it passes all of the uh, available sockets to the kernel and the kernel only needs to let us know um, when there is um, data on at least one of the sockets and of course um, we, we might get multiple sockets with data and we process them um, uh, essentially in the same uh, poll cycle. Um, this very same uh, design is extended to be used with um, all of the communication that we do for uploading. Um, whenever we need to uh, um, upload the document to the storage, uh, what we do is we create an HTTP request and we just pass it onto the polling thread, just like um, any other browser connection. And the same uh, plumbing logic basically works seamlessly. Um, and this avoids any extra uh, threads, any extra uh, kernel level overhead. In fact, we don't even add uh, a single um, uh, low level uh, system call uh, beyond the existing uh, poll um, call already. Um, and, and this basically means that we get um, all of the advantages of asynchronous uh, socket communication without any uh, blocking pretty much for free, um, or at least nominal cost. One minute um, to go, Ash. Yes. <laughs> um, so in terms of in terms of testing this, this was uh, the, the modular approach was critical, extremely critical, um, because we wanted to make sure that we can extensively test uh, all of the new code and make sure that we have very high coverage. Mm -hmm. Uh, in addition, we did um, implement fuzzing uh, on top of all of the uh, unit tests that we have um, on both unit test level and fuzzing on the HTTP round trip level. And that gave us um, very, very good results. Um, in short, uh, we were able to improve the performance overall and especially for the users in terms of uh, the UI. There was no longer um, blocking or um, any noticeable change, um, even when the um, network was very slow or the, um, uh, the uh, storage was uh, not responsive um, or indeed failed completely. And we had to retry sometimes multiple times before we succeeded. Um, the code base is uh, fairly, um, as I say, modular and it replaces POCO and it brings um, the, the, the solution to a more homogeneous uh, state internally, such that we don't have different libraries. We just have a single um, networking um, layer and concept that we reuse over and over in multiple places. Um, thank you for listening. And I'll Thanks, Ash. Questions later. Great job. Sexy feature. Hmm. Thanks, Ash. So now uh, we are having Henry Castro with the macro dialogue feature. Uh, this one is a pre-recorded one, so I think William is about to set the video. Yes, indeed. I <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Just trying to click on the right button, and since we are on big the button... And um, sure we are all issue. trying to do that. <laughs> Perhaps worth Ash turning off your video again uh, briefly. Yeah. Much as I love to see you. I mean, like, I don't know. You know? <laughs> Hi, my name is Henry Castro. I am from Bolivia, located in South America. I'm going to talk about running macros using the macro selector dialog, which is a feature added to the Colabora online. First, we are going to analyze how does Visual Basic for applications scripts runs in the LibreOffice core. Then I'm going to explain how was the macro selector dialog implemented in the client side using JavaScript code. 
In order to run a macro, the user should trigger a unit command called run macro. This command is triggered clicking on the tools options run macro sub menu item. Then the dispatch framework will process the command, which it will invoke to show a macro selector dialog, and the user will select the preferred macro to run. And finally, it will invoke the main function to run a script called call script. You can read the source code when the dispatcher execute the unit command. Here is the location where you can analyze the code. Also, you can read the source code, the creation of the script selector dialog, and invoke to run the dialog asynchronous. A macro selector is shown and the user will select the preferred macro to run. Once the item is selected, the user will click the run button to execute it. Finally, when the, when the user clicks on the run button and the dialog is closed, the call script is invoked. This is the entry function, which is the in a script engine that will process the map. This is a big picture to process a macro. The unit command is invoked, then a uh, macro selector dialog is shown. Once the user click the selected macro, the script engine will run the macro. You can observe here, the main input data is the script argument, which is passed to the script engine to process the macro. We try to modify the diagram, but this time, using the web application Collabora Online in a remote site. We just need to send the script argument to the LibreOffice core, LibreOffice kit here, through a socket communication which it will route to the main screen function. Basically, this will be our design. On the client side, it's necessary to create an HTML macro selector dialog to be user friendly to select a macro to run and then send it through the socket communication to the LibreOffice kit server. But how was the macro selector dialog implemented in the client side? Here we have the options. First one is creating a static HTML dialog because the dialog it looks not complicated. The second option will be using the tunneling the dialogs which is sending images to the client side, render it on the server side. And finally, the three options could be create an HTML dialog dynamically 
using the JavaScript code. These options were deprecated in favor of a generic HTML dialog generator. I'm going to explain the basic building related to an HTML macro selector dialog. My co-worker Shimon Klaus will explain a detailed version of this dynamic JavaScript dialogs. You can observe the constructor of the script selector dialog. It does not change anything in the LibreOffice kit process. The difference it has added a generic dialog function to collect the JSON property tree data. Let's say instant to show the dialog or to render that dialog, it will send the JSON data as a property tree. Here you can observe examples of properties like title, collapse, and an ID. If we grab the diagram, we will see that the LibreOffice Kit core process will create that microselector dialog instance and it will invoke the show, but instant to render this, it will send that JSON data, the property tree, through this WebSocket communication. The web application Collabor Online will receive that JSON data and will use a generic JavaScript builder to create an HTML macro selector dialog. The function that receives the JSON data is called on GS dialog, as you can read in the source code. And finally, the builder is called to output the HTML macro selector dialog. The result will be a styled CSS dialog, thanks to my co-worker Pedro Pinto Silva for the styling. There were some problems with the generic builder. You click to expand the item, then all the dialog is created again. For every user interaction, the dialog is created again. It was not acceptable to repeat the macro selector dialog after expand or select, select an item. I had to improve by adding the partial update of the control. This is similar on the server side when the control internal data is dirty or invalidated. And finally, I will show you some code pointers where could be more where could be more improves. The function is called on GA's update. It will only update the data of the control. In case of the macro selector dialog, the tree view control requires updates to do user interactions like to expand or to select items. And if you read the code, the DOM element is removed and created again. A new one just update the control that belongs to a dialog. This can be improved traversing the tree data structure and for each node just update the inner text or value. Let's summarize all the process again. The web application Collabora Online will send the Uno command one macro. 
through our web socket communication channel this, ma this command is triggered by clicking in the tools macro room macro suit menu items the LibreOffice kit process receives the UNO command and using its dispatcher framework it will route the command to the corresponding function to process the LibreOffice kit process will create a logical macro selector DAO instant to show or render the dialog it sends adjacent property tree data through the web socket communication to the client side. The web application Collaborate Online once it receives the dialog creation JSON data will create an HTML macro selector DAO. Once it's created both dialogs, the HTML and the shadow of logical macro selector, the client and server side, there is a user interaction communication. If the user clicks the HTML dialog, the click event is sent to the logical macro selector dialog, which will respond if the control internal data is dirty or needs to be invalidated. It's respond with the JSON data to client side to update that partial data. When the user selects a preferred macro to run and click the run button, the click event is sent to the logical macro selector on the server side, which will close the dialog, sending back to close both dialogs, sending back to close the HTML and the logic dialogs. And as explained before, the LibreOffice core continues with this normal uh, flow process running the macro, passing the script to the main engine to run the macro. That's it for me. Thank you very much. That was nice to know step by step how the things work. I think I need to save, the, save this uh, video and share it on, in the forum. We have many questions regarding Microsoft. So now, uh, next, we have uh, rendering wastage and performance wins by Lubos Lunyak. Uh, I just made you a presenter, Lubos. I see your camera feed, so that's nice. You are muted, so you can unmute yourself. <laughs> um which one of the choices is sharing screen i can hear you now uh, yes it's right after the the video the camera icon we should see a new icon there oh yeah sorry like i was, looking, I was looking, looking at the plus yeah. stuff uh, ta -da. okay so Perfect. can you see everything yes, can you hear everything. me Yes, everything's perfect. Go ahead, thanks. Okay, so just a moment. Okay, so hello, my name is Lubos Luniak. I'm a developer at Collabora, and I'm going to also have a talk about performance. We have already some talks about the browser side, the client side. I'm going to talk about the server side, which is primarily profiling the C code. So, just for some introduction, just in case people don't know, would like to tr try it too. So, if you want to profile C++, you need to build an optimized build because we actually want to want to want to check the fast ver version. But we also need debug symbols. So, for core, 
you need you need the enable sim simple switch i think online builds by default uh, that way and then there are several tools i use the linux perf command there is an example of a tool i use uh, uh, of an invocation i use it's just some switches for performance the info important is the call graph so that we can have like information about which function calls which and normally this is invoked with, together with the command this doesn't work with uh, collabora online because the kit processes are started uh, in, a, in a special way so we need to either first start the process and then attach using the pid or if we want to track it from the start, we can use the minus U option and then Perf will uh, track everything from, from the given user. Then when it's used, I use to UI tool called Hotspot. And I have pictures like this, but I suppose I can just better show what it looks like. So, uh, this, this is from a session uh matt had a talk about the perf test tool which simulates simulates uh, several users just doing something so this is a session where six users tr together try to edit a document and i will show uh, by the uh, and act uh, actual recording of the editing if you do it you there is n basically no chance for like half a minute it just doesn't do anything and then it shows everything and one way to show it is to look at this call graph, which shows where the time is spent. We can see that most of the time is spent here in just uh, basically handling input and all of them called writers and action. And if, if we enter one of them, we can see that there is some time spent updating the cursor action. It is the actual layout, but even here, uh, if you see the part there is uh, collecting regions and it does operator minus it actually removes parts which is slower here is some compression of the data and he, here we send uh, invalidation of the windows which here there is some time spent just converting to string and here this all is uh, uh, queuing the message for the client and for example here we can see that here it's converted to string again and and here it's converted from string and if, if i go back it actually happens several times so if i if i like switch here this this is this is uh, all the functions which are used and i view i sort functions by the time spent so this is the to top level actions and if you can for, for example see that the and all action it's like almost all the cpu time in validation it's like half of the time here here below updating cursor is still a big portion of it Com compressing is a big portion of it even conversion to strings is quite a big portion of it so if i go back to presentation so basically what happens here is that a core sends messages to the client but in order to optimize it it first collects them and tries to uh, optimize them compress them so there is a class uh, it was showing the it, there is there is a class called callback flush, flush handler which processes the message and in the end flushes them one of the, one of the big problems here is that the flushing is done only when everything is done using using an idle handler but the problem is if there is enough information coming from from the clients it will take a long time before core will actually anything considered to be idle that's why i said uh in the original version you, you have to wait like 30 seconds before actually anything shows because it compresses stuff and meanwhile new input comes and and it was oh there is new information so i need to process it too so cores get busy and the queue also gets longer which means adding new stuff to the longer takes takes also longer because there is lo longer backlog of messages so how can we improve this 
we can generally optimize the code because the, the faster the processing is done, of course, then the sooner uh, the code will be idle. We can also uh, improve handling of the messages in, in the queue, make sure, for example, that, that, that there is no nothing quadratic. And also we can add extra timer. Like if the idle timer is good if if there if there are just small messages, if there is little input from clients coming, then it will just compress it and send it. But extra timer with with, with a hard timeout will help so that the clients do not wait too long. I will sh I will show just what you will you can see that even just this can make a big difference. But there are, uh, there are other things. Uh, you, you notice there were some st string converg conversions. If I go here, uh, I see it. Yeah, for example, you can see it was originally using IO stream, which is also a noticeable portion of the code. So it was, all, uh, it was even that was slow. And Noel did quite some work for faster writing, which improved this part. Other things we can do, the compression, the algorithm was actually pretty bad. It was even, even worse than quadratic because like if you have a number of rectangles, you want to uh, check if maybe they overlap. Or, but uh, anytime it did a modification, it restarted everything from, from start. I've, it's, it's possible it was left over from very old open office code when removing from the from the from the list of of regions maybe invalidated in a very uh, iterator so it was restarting all the time it was also comparing rectangles which couldn't possible uh, couldn't possibly uh, overlap like if one of them was high in high and one of them was very low in the document it didn't work so i have optimized this for example we, we uh, now we sort the rectangles so that it's we just compare the ones which are close in the sorted order. Uh, one of the areas I improved was another stuff related to rectangles. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we actually remove rectangles in some cases in a writer. Like you have this whole page and then wh whatever is modified is actually removed from it, which is computation computationally worse than just collecting the rectangles. And so what White was, was doing, it, 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 it had area, it removed the rectangles and then inverted it, which, which is another expensive operation. So I just changed it to just collect the rectangles and in the end I compressed it because I compressed got already faster. All the stuff I worked on, since we use LibreOffice Core, the code was originally written to work on Windows, like the what, what you see on, on screen in the desktop version. but. Uh, for online, we never never used it, but we still actually did render to, render to them. So I, I disabled it. This saves also some time. It needed some fixing because there were some side effects to painting, but I, I hope I have already figured it out. In case something still shows up, just tell me. I already know how to debug it. It was actually <laughs> quite painful, but if there is more, I will fix it. And there are, there are some uh, other things which can be improved. For example, the compression means that when we send messages, like some messages obsolete the old ones, like if we actually invalidate all the tiles, then we, we can drop everything because like it just everything is invalidated. It doesn't matter. And like also we send cursor updates positions for other users, but in the end we just care about the final type, final, final position. But currently what happens is that we generate all the messages. Sometimes that's expensive, like sending the writer cursor position is non-trivial and then we throw it all away. So this can be also improved. And I have some uh, pictures here. So this is the original one I was showing, and this is the new one. You, last you can. Minute. Um, sorry. Last minute. Yes. Yes, I know. Thank you. And you can see that, for example, uh, like in the right middle, there is part where uh, PNG 
encoding and it, here it wasn't even visible so uh, sorry so this was the same part but since since this is improved now we can actually spend time doing use, useful stuff and uh, with, i can just show you what it looks like so the top one is the original one slow the middle one is the just timer and the bottom one is the optimized and you can see that the top one just doesn't show anything the middle one just flashing already improves the interactivity even though it's still choppy and the lower one it still occasionally stops for a while but it is it's like all it's most of the time you can see that it's uh, like uh, real time and the upper one still doesn't show anything still doesn't show anything and now finally it processed everything so uh, these are these are some improvements for 2021 Collabora. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Lovers. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely impressive, as Paul was saying. Yeah, a lot of work there. Yeah. So now we have Paul uh, Symphony Bundle integrating WAPI and Collabora Online. I will make you presenter so can you hear me paul yes i do hear you and you yes yes perfect okay go ahead. i think you should see me as well yes now yes all right so i'm going to share my screen so i need to find the button take the presenter share an external video action no 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 so you have an icon on the center that has the uh, shape of a screen, so you can share the screen right after. The oh video. yeah. Okay, I see it. Sorry. No problem. All right. Let me know when when you see the screen. I see it now. All right, I can start. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to present myself. I am Paul de la Yera. I'm from Belgium, and uh, I'm a mostly a PHP developer, and I'm, I'm working for two clients. I am working for a cooperative called Champ Libre in Namur, uh, where we are doing uh, PHP development and uh, geographical uh, and all the stuff related to geographical development using JavaScript and PHP. And I'm also working for the European Commission as a consultant, external consultant. So my weeks are shared between those two clients. Um, two months ago, for Champ Libre, I've been asked to create uh, an integration of the WAPI protocol for one of their applications, which is open source. And uh, I never heard about the WAPI protocol before. I never heard about Collabra uh, two months ago also. And all of these things are pretty new for me. So I started investigating and um, how I could integrate uh, a document edition within the symphony framework which is the php framework that we are using which is also open source and very well widespread and uh, i discovered many beautiful things first of all is this community this is amazing uh, you really gave me some really nice tips and help so thanks for that and then i discovered also all the beautiful things that we can do with collabra within a symphony application in order to do that, uh, as we are mostly doing open source projects, um, I created a very standard package, um, which is available uh, on GitHub. Uh, there is no version available yet, because this is in this is still in development. And um, what is what was nice while doing this thing is that I had to analyze and study the Wopi protocol and implement that into the code. But what I really wanted to do is, uh, you know, implementing each endpoint of the WOPI protocol can be sometimes a bit uh, long to do and hard to understand the documentation. What I wanted to do is to provide one service to implement uh, and with a lot of facility to, uh, with a lot of facility, meaning that I am going to provide a package that does the heavy lifting of the whole logic of the WOPI protocol and let the user implement only the very basic endpoint that we need. So, but prior to reaching that level of abstraction, I created uh, some kinds of um, very basic interfaces 
uh, that describes the public behavior of uh, the WOP protocol. As you can see here, uh, my interface defines a set of methods that needs to be implemented. So check file info, delete file, enumerate ancestor and stuff. All these things are from the WOP protocol. You might know them, I guess, now. So this package does not provide any implementation at all. It does not provide that. However, it provides a couple of helpers like uh, a proof validator. Uh, you know that every time the, the WAPI client sends a request, it has a proof key and the proof key old that can be used to authenticate the request. This service proof validator will validate the request. Then we have also a kind of abstracted document lock manager service which is a, a very basic service to lock a document. Everything is standard, so it can be used in Symfony, in, uh, in another framework of any type. This is really not tied to Symfony, this is pure PHP. Uh, all of these are covered by test also. And uh, after that, I said, okay, now I want to use that in Symfony. It means that I need to make the glue code between Symfony and this package. And this is when uh, this is when the WP bundle enters. The WP bundle basically is the gateway between Symfony and the WP library. And this provides uh, the routes that the WP protocol needs. Every routes are already described in this bundle. And this is actually the, the most boring part. And uh, this is done in a very simple way. For example, the root check file info must be here here we can see the variable and as soon as we get a request on this endpoint we redirect it we pass it to this controller to this method it must be a get request and the condition is to have the query parameter access token then if we don't have that we pass to the next one the get file method is this url it's also a GET request. The condition is to have the access token request. And all of these are built like that. For example, for unlock and relock, this is this URL. It must be a POST request. And the condition must be having the query parameter access token, having the, the header header lock, having the header set to, uh, having the header override set to the lock value, and having the header header hold lock. All these variables are actually defined in the previous uh, file that you saw here and I can quickly show it. Yes, I don't have any slide because I really wanted to focus on on the, the demonstration that I will do in a couple of minutes. All of these uh, constants are defined here. Basically, these are the headers name that the WOPI protocol defines. So this WOPI bundle is making the link between the library and Symfony and also and also it provides a default WOP implementation. It means that every time a request reaches, for example, the check info file endpoint, it will call this service, WOP service, and it will call the check file info endpoint. And this is a very abstracted way to use the WOP protocol because nothing is opinionated here. Uh, the user is able to customize everything so here we get the document by the file ID, which is passed to the, to the query. Then we get the user identifier, we get the user cache key, and then we build a response based on that. Same goes for the delete file, same goes, same goes for all the rest, actually. And the whole uh, logic of the WOPI protocol is in here. For example, um, if we take the lock endpoint, uh, we can check that document has a lock or not here and reply accordingly. If the lock that we get in the request is the same as the current lock of the file, we can refresh the lock. Or else we return a 409 uh, response, just like the WOPI protocol um, describe it, basically. If we pass this condition, we can lock the file and return a 200 with the version of the file in the header. So all of these um, logic is completely abstracted in this file. So that every time someone wants to implement the WOP protocol, it just have to describe one service that says how to write to a file, how to read a file, how to get the size of the file, how to get all these small things. 
And um, now the demo part, I think this is the most exciting part. All of the things that you see here, I created a very basic uh, Symfony application that is online on this URL, wp-app.erokuapp.com, that you can reach from your computer as well. And um, this, is, uh, the demo, this is the small explanation, and you can click here to launch the application. So I'm going to log out, right? I'm logged out. I'm going to click here, and I have to log in, of course, with my username. And this is it. I'm logged in. So once you are logged in, um, you have uh, multiple sections here. Uh, the most important one is documents. When you click documents, you can see the available documents that are on this platform. So we have six documents ending with different extensions and we can edit them live. So I'm going to increase the size of my screen and edit the first document. I'm going to edit it. Hello world. And then save the document. Okay, and then come back to the listing. We can see that the document is still locked, but if I refresh the page now, I guess it will be unlocked. Yes. So we can see that the size has changed since we can check if this has been saved correctly by re-editing the document once again. We can see that yes, this was saved correctly. Uh, if you want, you can also connect to this document at the same time as me, and we can live edit the document all together. But um, what I wanted to show is that this application that you see here, the WOPI app test application, is a full-blown test application for me to test what I, what I have done. There is a configuration part here where you can uh, change the URL of the WOPI client. So you are aware that there are different clients. We have Collabra, but we have some others as well we can change by just changing this URL here. And you can see here that I am using the free demo ucollaboronline.com um, instance uh, to edit the document. I can also check that I can reach it by going to capabilities. This is making a query to that endpoint to see what are the capabilities. I can check the proof keys as well. And a very important part for me is this part. In order to see if what I am doing is fine, I need to check that my endpoints are correctly implemented. And for that, Microsoft is providing a validator for the WOPI protocol. And uh, it, pro it is provided as a Docker uh, machine, and I can run this thing on my local and test uh, on my local environment. So uh, in order to show you that, I'm going to um, take this uh, command line where I run the application that you see here online locally, so I can reach this application by going to this URL. If I reach this URL, you can see this is my local machine. I can uh, I can use this application just like uh, the online one. And I'm going to run the test. So I'm going to show you that everything is correctly implemented, hopefully. So um, let's go. Oh, sorry. And this is it. And now the Docker... Oh we have a 500 issue okay this is completely unexpected i don't know what is going on but i have a backup solution this is my animated gif here and you can see that uh, on this gif i'm running the same test and you can see that all the endpoints are um, are responding correctly every green line that you see is a successful uh, test. And there are a couple of tests. There's a lot of tests. And this was actually the most complicated things to, to do to implement the correct logic. So all the tests were passing. Like that, I am sure that what I did is fine. And now I can completely customize the way I read a document, save a document, get the size of a document, get the file name, and so on and so forth. So. Um, I don't know why I have these issues right now, but it would be a bit of a waste of time to check uh, why I have those issues. However, um, if you are connecting to this WOPI app online, you can see on the bottom there is a there is a bar, a black bar here, where you can click and see the whole uh, debugging information from Symfony. And you can see all the requests that are done by me here, but also by the WOPI client here. And you can see that those requests are a bit longer because they include usually um, um, an access token here, for example. And this access token basically is uh, generated by the application and it's 
then serialized and unserialized to get the user and all of these things. And uh, you can check this request. This was an unlock request. And we can see that um, during the unlock request, the, the WAPI host sent uh, some information, the XWAPI override, the XWAPI proof, the XWAPI proof old, and the XWAPI timestamp. And all of these things are uh, taken in account by different layers of package that were created first WAPI lib, then WAPI bundle. Then for this demo that you see here for WAPI app, I created a WAPI test bundle uh, because I needed a way to save the documents. Right now, we are I am using here uh, SQLib database. This is why if you come back in one hour, all the changes that, I'm, that I've done on these documents will be completely gone. Um, and this is uh, this is it. Maybe I can restart to the demo on the local machine. If I still have some time left, I don't know. Let me check if this is working. Let's go. Come on, no. I don't know what happened, but yeah, yeah this so is the demo effect, I guess. <laughs> Yes. So but, this is it for me. This is it for me. But any, anyhow, it's it's really impressive and thanks a lot. And I think Paul is, is a, is a, you are a very good example of a person that just uh, hanged around in the in the IRC, in the Telegram, then suddenly started to appear in the in the community meetings. And now we have some nice stuff to show. So that's, that's really yeah, cool. I think it's very easy now for anyone uh, who's using Symfony to to use uh, to use that and to to use Collabora online and to make a very nice integration. What I am doing here is just the bare bones of something that could be much greater, but um, we are doing the best things in the, in the other application that we are creating. But here is just for me to test that everything which is done in open source for the WOPI protocol is valid. This is what matters actually. Yeah, that definitely it's really cool. And I think we, we will have more time even if you want to show again in the Q&A. Uh, and yeah, now... Yeah, I don't know what is happening. I need to check. I uh, most probably did a, did a mistake. I don't know. No problem. And now we have uh, Gokai with uh, multi-page PDF uh, viewing. Thanks. Can you hear me, Gokai? Thanks, Paul. Good stuff. Thanks, Paul. Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me, see my camera. Yes, we do. Okay. And let me share, uh, share my presentation. Sorry. Uh, screen needs to be granted, it says. The browser then, I think, is probably banning the app or not. Uh, permissions. Okay. Oh, I hope you go. can see, yeah. my see, see now. Yeah. But if you press F5, hopefully it'll work. Beautifully. Oh, it just you. <laughs> no, and wait. crashed and quit. Right. Well, so you, okay. what, why don't we uh, move on to someone else then, if, if that's reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so no? next up is Zina with how to uh, bisect. Yeah. Wait. I, no. uh, I'm, I will now uh, present. No. I hope you can see. Yep. Yep. Getting there. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Sorry for the latency. No problem. Uh, now, we a few months ago uh, we added multi-page PDF weaving feature into Clover Online, uh, which uh, which is not supported uh, on the desktop version. So it has some difficulties and it has some uh, challenges inside it. Uh, and I will now talk about it right now. Uh, <clears throat> Now, uh, not, uh, these days, you know, uh, users want to see the PDF files like a whole page, a uh, whole document, and they need to scroll it down and up, and they need to, they want to uh, be able to 
uh, click on a page and see it, uh, read it, and Office documents uh, before us, uh, Clover Online, uh, didn't support it, but uh, be required to edit. And um, as you know, uh, we basically uh, show the uh, presentation files uh, one by one, one, pa uh, one page uh, or one slide at a time. They, they are not shown rendered like a writer document. The aim of this work was to make them uh, rendered like a, a writer document and user can um, comfortably uh, read the document, read a PDF document. So, and since it is not supported on the core side, we had some issues there, uh, of course, uh, while we were, we were working on this one. For example, uh, the positions of the tiles uh, are sent from the core side and they are always sent from the zero, zero point X and Y positions are always zero because even if you view the 50th page or, uh, or another page other than the first one, uh, the core side thinks that uh, it's top position should be the zero uh, point. So it sends the uh, coordinates according to that one. And uh, also uh, for, for every page uh, you view, it is the same. So we needed to, um, we needed to manipulate those coordinates uh, on the client side uh, by calculating the, uh, the distance from the top page, the top point. Uh, the absolute zero point, uh, maybe. Uh, so we did it. Then we, of course, we needed to, to test it uh, after positioning the tiles. Uh, like I created uh, test files, like the one you see now. Uh, it had numbers uh, from one to 100. So uh, then my aim was to see all the numbers uh, without gaps between. Uh, if I if I can see them uh, at all the zoom levels, then it would mean the tiles are rendered and fetched from the core perfectly. So we created test uh, scenarios like uh, the one you see now, and we had some several others uh, while we were developing the feature. And uh, one uh, one of the challenges was uh, this one is positioning the tiles. And the second challenge uh, was, uh, of course, uh, about the um, comments uh, on the files, uh, because uh, the same problem goes also for the comments. Uh, the comments are all um, saved with their positions relative to the uh, target page's uh, zero point. So we, we also needed to manipulate the comments, comments uh, positions, but it's not all that because we needed to do something else. For example, uh, if we add a comment to the second page, then uh, that, that comment is, uh, since the selected page on the core side will always be the first one, uh, then that comment will be saved uh, according to the first page's top point. So the position will be the same, but uh, when we did that, uh, we couldn't uh, open that file and see the comments with other uh, software applications other than the Clover Online. So we also needed to save the comments to the target page, uh, to the selected page. Like uh, if you select the page 10, then the command command uh, needs to be saved into page 10, really. Uh, so for that one, uh, we needed to select the page. And uh, if it is not changed uh, by now, uh, I added an implementation that uh, uh, looking, uh, which is looking uh, for the position of the view and sets the selected page according to the viewed part uh, of the document. So if you view the 10th page and uh, 
add a command or modify a command, that command will be the uh, will be saved into page uh, will be saved into page ten, and also uh, selecting selecting that page was uh, the issue there because if you zoom out from the document, then you can see uh, three, uh, maybe two or four pages uh, at once. Then what? Uh, which page will you choose to uh, add the command? Uh, for that one, uh, we created uh, a function that um, that uh, searches the visibilities, uh, calculates the visibilities of the pages, and selects the most visible parts uh, of the document, page of the document, and adds the command uh, to that uh, that page. And also, then we will be we will be able to uh, open that file with another application, and everything will be okay. And it was indeed. Uh, I hope it is now. Uh, and also, uh, with these features, we uh, added feature like while we scroll down the document, uh, also the pages on the left side, uh, the thumb thumbs uh, that little files. Uh, uh, also uh, scroll down or scroll up when we select the page automatically on the background the selected page on the left side is also changed so it's updated according to the viewed part uh, while we develop these features uh, for the collaborator online uh, since it is not mm, supported uh, on the desktop version we needed to uh, handle uh, events differently on the online side. For example, uh, we needed to um, uh, add a separate function other than other, uh, a new separate function into Canvas tile layer, because when a, a new tile is, has arrived, uh, we need to handle it uh, differently and we need to calculate uh, its position differently uh, because the position uh, sent from the core side is not uh, is not right uh, for this view for this uh, new view type uh, and other changes are made uh, on the drawing of the tiles uh, as we can guess because the tiles uh, do require some uh, some other things and when we mm, for example scroll the document the viewed part of the document uh, is also calculated differently because uh, for example when we uh, view the fifth page uh, core side uh, may think that uh, oh they are looking far away from the first page uh, but there is nothing there and core side may send empty tiles uh, because the first page is not that long uh, but uh, but at the same time uh, we only want to see the fifth page for example so uh, different uh, different portions of the code uh, should have been changed uh, so and we did those changes uh, and published the published the work and I hope they I hope it uh, works uh, as intended and uh, I hope uh, users like it uh, this is a stretched uh, image uh, from the work uh, we have done uh, uh, the the real version looks better uh, thank you Thanks, Gokai. So uh, next we have uh, how to bisect uh, with Ezine. And I think it's a pre-recorded one. So Yes, it uh, is. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm here. <laughs> uh, it's coming, it's coming. And here we go. Presentation by Hello everyone, thank you for being a part of our Cool Days Collabora online program. My name is Ezine 
and I work for Colabora Productivity. Today, I'll be talking about how to bisect a bug to a single patch. It will be good to understand what regressions are. A regression is a type of software bug where a feature that has previously worked fine suddenly stops working. This is the point where bisect comes into play. Bisect is usually uh, is the process of finding a particular commit that has caused the regression by comparing the middlemost commit in a given range of commits. By bisect, however, is short for binary bisect. It is a term used to describe a bisect procedure when there are binary of repository used in the process. It is generally good to find the good working state of a feature to be able to bisect the regression. It can be done by checking the older version of the product. At each step of the bisect procedure, one would need to repeat the procedure that triggers the bug. If regressions occur in code docker, we would need to test using the docker images. There are docker images released for each released versions. Although it is necessary to test with versions older than 4.0 because a lot of changes has been made in the on Collabora Online since the 4.0 version was released. If a bug occur in code docker, we would need to test using one version. If the bug occurs in that version, then we would need to test using an even older version until we find the good working state of the feature. If we finally find out that the bug started in one version, for instance, within 6.4 updates, then we would need to take two pairs or range of commits within the 6.4 updates to bisect in. If, however, the bug started between different versions, let's say 6.4 version and 4.0 version, well, would, that would be a bit uh, handful because there would be a wider range of commit hashes to bisect with. Okay. Well, we would need to understand the relationship between the core build and the online build. The core, the Collabora Office core build is required for Collabora Online to run successfully. An online build from any given time is usually composed of Collabora Office core and Collabora Office Collabora Online commits that were the latest at that time. Collabora Office Core and Collabora Online builds, often possibly months apart, can be matched. So when looking for a commit causing regression, only one of the repositories matters at a time. So it can be by setting only online or only core at a time. If the regression occur in Collabora Office Core, would would use the binary of repositories for tracing the regression. There are binaries of repository for tracing and con tracing regressions in Collabora Office Core, and it has been used for tracing regressions for a long time. Similar binary repository also exists for Collabora branches. An example of regression in Collabora Office Core would be at a time when image was missing when when docs file is opened in Collabora Office Core. I'll show you the screenshot in a bit. So this is the screenshot of the regression missing image and when the regression has been fixed. Regressions in Collabora Online Repository. 
There are daily builds of APK for tracing the good states of the feature in mobile. However, there are no binary repository for bisecting in online. So, we'll, we'll do it a little bit with uh, our kit commit hashes. <laughs> okay, so example of a regression that had occurred in online repository would be uh, recently the show ruler feature in, in writer stopped working. Although we remember using the writer ruler about a month ago and it worked well. This is the commit of the this is the commit that worked well that had the show ruler feature working well. This is the screenshot showing when the regression occurred and when the regression has been fixed no matter how much you click on the show ruler feature on the show ruler option it won't show the ruler in writer and that was the regression okay so the steps in by setting using the online repo we will be using the recently occurred show ruler regression in writer for our procedure what do we do? As always, we would need our good working state, and that would be our older commit. So, the current commit where the bug exists would be referred to as the newer commit, while the commit where the good, the commit of the good state would be referred to as the older commit. Okay, so we will use the git command, git by set start newer commit space older commit this is the git command that would this git command would check out to a particular commit and we will need to compile our build in that commit however to avoid errors during compilation we would need to use the flag disable w error in our configure parameter while building and also to avoid JS linting errors we would need to add the JS star.js in the low leaflet ESLint file that is to avoid the JS linting errors and then we'll build our we'll compile our build successfully then for every successful build we will need to trigger the steps we will need to repeat the step that triggered the bug. So if the bug exists, we will terminate the build and then enter the git by set bad. If the bug does not exist, we will terminate the build again and enter the command git by set good. This usually this process usually takes about three seven to eight builds then uh, the, the commit causing regression will be obtained and in our case this is the result we have this was the commit that caused the regression so that is it thank you for listening i will be around for questions comments and feedbacks Thank you once again for being a part of our program. Thank you. So, yes, now it's me. Um, hello, hello, Pedro. You're yes, muted, I believe. Ah, oh, excellent. Oh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let me tell you where the button is, Pedro. If you look down at the bottom, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. Okay. So, uh, after bisection wonders from Ezine, uh, let's uh, dive into some design improvements on desktop uh, this time around. So, Annotations. Before 
<clears throat> sometimes we got this this scenario where we have a document and there is no, no document no comments right no actually in this example there are comments but we cannot see them they are either cropped or hidden uh, because this because of the small uh, screen factor uh, of the user then with the cool uh, canvas development um, uh, from uh, kokai uh, some of those things went away some of the some of new new things appeared this time annotations were super duper persistent at the point of blocking the actual documents content um, and again thanks for uh, all the support and QA by Ezine and Aaron uh, that you know that helped to to basically plan a solution and a path uh, to, to solve this. So after uh, we knew for a fact that we wanted we wanted to avoid introducing any drastic changes to the code. We wanted we don't want we didn't want to touch the new cool canvas bits uh, from Kokai and we would be maybe nice to reuse the mobile wizard pieces uh, since they already bring uh, many things for free. So, and with that in mind, uh, maybe we could even bring some of that uh, improvement to tablets. Uh, maybe it would be even easier to keep track of the annotations. Uh, so between navigating uh, from content to annotations and, uh, and, and back to the content. So here we have a normal big screen let's say and when we go back to a laptop screen or a slightly smaller screen uh, we can still focus 100 percent on the document but we know for a fact there are a couple of uh, annotations there uh, and these wouldn't be possible with all the effort from uh, shimon close and all is all this in development here uh, but when the user wants on his own on, on, or is ready to view the annotation, he can just press and see even all the, all the comments that belongs to that specific thread, sees the total of comments. And really nice is that this is a familiar user pattern, not, not only because it comes from, from the mobile, but also it's a user pattern that is used in other productivity tools. So we are not reinventing the wheel, we are just improving the user flow, even in this uh, slightly smaller uh, uh, screen uh, size devices. Now, next, anchoring. Before, we really didn't have any visual uh, feedback. There was no anchor icon. The user were, was forced to sometimes reach, uh, reset the anchor to be sure which option is, is set. And this was leading for to many problems regarding uh, like editing uh, wise. So after and uh, with the help of uh, Mert, we work on this little nice solution uh, that now we have an icon that it says is specifically where it's anchored. That icon, it's not a static icon. That icon changes depending on the mode you are. So when you start to drag and drop that, that icon, it transforms in, into a pointer with a, SME, uh, with a SME transparency. So you can really pinpoint accurately the character that, that you want to anchor in the case you want to anchor to a character. And of course, there was many styles and improvements around that, but I don't think I have that much time. So let's get busy. Uh, it was really important to get messages out there, meaning that uh, it was important to show to the user when the application is busy uh, and why it's busy, what it's doing. So, uh, because the more uh, transparent, uh, the, the, the faster we send those messages, uh, the user will get this feeling that actually the, the Collabora Online is very responsive, even if sometimes the, the waiting period that doesn't change, but at least there is some visual feedback. So he knows what is going on and he's reassured that everything's okay. So here we have an example of a busy pop up uh, that can be used for these ongoing processes being downloaded, downloading or uh, connecting any message of, the, of that uh, type. Uh, the cool thing about about this is that it's an anime. This this busy pop up appears uh, and uh, with a SVG animated SVG, and this SVG, since it's within the code, is then automatically tinted to the color of the respective uh, document type or respective uh, app, if you will. And this is nice because at the end you have this really nice um, 
color palette consistency uh, from the notebook bar until the content of the uh, dialogue. But not all of these uh, messages are uh, about ongoing states. Sometimes are about on and off states. So in uh, status. So in this case, we have, for instance, this, when this, the server has been disconnected or when the server is now ritual. <clears throat> and so we have this new component uh, that we call snack bar. It's not a term coined by me. It's actually a term well known in the user experience cycles, but basically it's nothing more than a snack bar sized element that uh, pops up uh, from the bottom and uh, discreetly, uh, but still very, very easily reachable um, if there is an action needed to be presented there. Um, now, a couple of ideas in terms of to do would be to expand this level of consistency to other feedback pop-ups. So improving uh, even when we have the doc when the document is idle or other type of messages that we can uh, expand this level of consistency instead of just having a, a big pop-up with big text and no uh, visual work around that. Status bar, it's another topic uh, and it's another element very important to many users uh, from journalists to project managers because it displays a very quick overview of many things without further clicks or with additional clicks, you can even have additional actions. So it's, it's really a, a, a nice element to have. Um, and we started to receive this feedback from, from some customers that some, 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 some customers that uses, uh, that use uh, Collabra Online as a previewer that uh, they were not understanding the big difference between read-only mode and edit mode. So they would end up in read-only mode and they started to uh, look for uh, tools to edit the document. And then just after three, four minutes, they realized that, ah, okay, this is preview mode. So with that in mind, why not use the, the status bar to, guess what, <laughs> display uh, status. <laughs> uh, so here we are previewing something uh, in read-only. And because it's not like the default uh, status, especially on, on desktop, uh, it's slightly a little uh, prominent. But uh, when we go back to the edit mode, uh, it's still there, but now much more discreet. Uh, but it just reassures the user uh, what is going on. Uh, and again, you see this this level, this this um, you, you see uh, that there is a pattern here. It's all about consistency and reassuring the user. Um, another big topic is the new sidebar. Uh, we have no we have an, um, no canvas anymore here, so it's native, thanks to Shimon, um, as he already des described. Um, they uh, the sidebar is animated, so opens and closes elegantly. There is many uh, there was many com uh, cosmetic improvements, alignment, padding, uh, you name it. Uh, how, the icons that that op that triggered dialogues, uh, just uh, a bunch of them, and still many things are coming in. Uh, and thanks for Andreas Keynes to also help um, Sidebar to get more and more matured for our 2021 uh, release. Uh, notebook bar. So there was there is many things to talk about notebook bar. So I will uh, and uh, Andreas Kent has already talked about the structure of notebook bar and goes in great detail. I will I will just say that there was many layout improvements, uh, consistency in terms of margins, padding. Uh, the style preview got completely revamped how we how it looked. The different states of over status, clicked status. The shortcuts uh, bar also got revamped. Um, many fixes. Uh, the undo redo button as well improved. Uh, now it's more visible when the document is unsaved. Um, all these and some more, like for instance, the on off switches, uh, these type of elements, the buttons that work like on off switch, were all, there were also many improvements. Uh, this is just a couple of them. Uh, dialogues. There was also a lot of improvements uh, around dialogues, not not only uh, the the like around shortcuts, so to visually and semantically represent uh, key um, keys on the keyboard, uh, 
um, but also to be a, so the user is able to copy paste some information that in many dialogues were not possible. Uh, the help dialogue also got a lot of fixes. I have this idea that I would like them to discuss in the Q&A uh, about using maybe Cypress to also create some of these screenshots that we are using in the help dialogue. So they are always up to date. JS dialogues, I don't know, it's just a lot of them. So I will just skip and just show you uh, that there was a lot of elements shared between uh, JS dialogues. That's the beauty of it. Uh, that uh, all, since those elements got improved, all the JS dialogues got improved as well. Um, also, I see now that there is a scroll bar there. Yes, there was also improvements regarding scroll bars um, and many other dialogues that didn't have uh, the love they deserved. They started to receive some more attention. Uh, it's not done. We still there is still more things to go. Uh, you see that there is this tunnel uh, uh, dialogue. That there was also some improvement regarding the VCL uh, theming and even the, the the tabs, but there's still a lot of things to do. Uh, but I think we are in in a, in a good path, um, and that's it. And I have the feeling I got uh, I end up to do it very fast the talk. Well, but yes, but we've we've gone quite uh, over time. So generally, oh, ah, so perfect. You're okay, up, that's brilliant. Thanks, yeah. perfect. So so that's it. Thanks. So we're and... We've got about four minutes for questions. So if anyone wants to show up and uh, ask a question, perfect. So interesting things there, I think, from everyone. So we had uh, async saving design. We had macro dialogue questions. So we had. Uh, rendering wastage removal, uh, which is great. Uh, symphony uh, excitement around Wapi from Paul, uh, multi page viewing, and uh, bisecting patches as well as a desktop design improvement. So, any questions? And then we can. Uh, I have some questions about the PDF editing. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, um... I just want to be sure that I understood that. So this, uh, the PDF editing uh, is done by the draw component? Yes. Okay. So um, uh, at which level you can edit the PDF documents? I mean, uh, as far as I understood, um, uh, the pages of the PDF are loaded as images or something like that, or are rendered, so, or something like that, right? wants to go <laughs> so i think pdf is complicated ash do you want to you know, if you're, or, or is uh Gokai still with us so, so there's lots of answers but, but you're muted ash so I'll oh i'm sorry i was i was saying let me let me take a stab and you can fill in the details so there are actually two modes to um to, to uh, viewing and editing pdfs initially you get a, a um, fast and accurate rendering that is in the form of an image um, and that is uh, very quick and very accurate. Um, and that is basically most um, of what you would need just to view the document. But if you need to edit, then you would need to convert it into text and objects and images and all the, um, you know, breakdown of all the, the necessary elements on the, um, you know, document level. And for that, it's obviously much more um, costly in terms of, you know, the conversion, the time you need to spend if it's a huge document um, but once you've done that you should get um, completely editable elements provided that the pdf itself uh, retains all of the original details uh, including the text um, um, uh, characters the unicode uh, you know code points the fonts uh, the images and so on some pdfs don't have that and in that case you can't really edit it's just an image uh, embedded within the pdf um, obviously, you know, we, we, that's information lost, we can go back. Um, but these are basically the, the two modes. So uh, I hope that gives some clarity. Yes, uh, so. yes but uh, 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 you, you, you say that it must be con converted first. So that conversion is done automatically or uh, it, it must be done manually? It's, different modes. It's, it's rendered to a bitmap for the PDF -EM mode that we ship with. So you'd see a bitmap per page. And the primary editing then is adding comments or overlays or, or drawing on it or this kind of thing. And so that's a very common use case that we ship and, and support. The other, the other use cases are more speculative, like the whole convert your PDF uh, into shapes and then edit it and then reassemble it. A quickie, quickie is an expert here, actually. So, uh, quickie, do you want to give a better answer? Yeah. 
I just saw them there. How much? We've reached a great chunk of this, I think. But, uh, no, he didn't hear anything we said. So, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Quickly, yeah, can you Okay. Maybe Henry. Henry wants to speak. Henry, speak. Tell us if you know the answer. But I think you're muted, Henry. Or you're, you're just connected with the uh, headphones or audio uh, listening. So you, you, I think you need to reconnect and uh, connect your microphone um, to reload. In the meantime, while, while Henry reconnects um, with, with the answer, uh, Lubosh, uh, when when we get all of your, your speed ups, are they all going to be in uh, shipping tomorrow? Or what, what's the story? Well, most of what I have, I have already pushed it to 2021. Not all of it. Uh, like, I have pushed most of the simple stuff, including the timer. Uh, what still can be done are improvements like uh, for example, uh, dropping the repeated cursor positions, or I, ha I have work in progress patch, which where the callback flush handler doesn't does a, uh, takes directly binary data and not strings. Uh, I f I could finish it, but that's still for, for now only local. Okay, so some of that goes into six four. Then does it do simpler stuff for the next release? Or? Uh. Well, uh, at least the timer definitely can go to 6.4. Cool. For, for the rest, uh, I suppose some of the simpler stuff like the uh, rectangle co compression definitely. I'm not sure if, if all of it, like I suppose I, 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 I can record all of it, but uh, some of it could be more work. So Yeah, yeah. We, don't, we don't want lots of work and, and certainly we don't want risk in the state of bond. Um, Henry, can you speak now? I still can't hear you, weirdly. You want to say something? I, I no. think he had clicked the uh, uh, raise a hand uh, by mistake. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what he implied in the chat. Um, okay. Lubosh, I have a quick question. Is is uh, is some of what you've uh, improved in terms of performance um, also beneficial to the um, Collabra office? Um, or is it mostly or all completely specific to online? Uh, most of the work is for the callback flash handler, so it's online. But for example, the, 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 the rectangle handler in Writer, I suppose it should improve writer slightly i'm not sure how much because because like if you work with writer it's just you so you don't don't get as many changes as if you have several other users who also also hit the same code so there may be some improvements for writer but i don't know if it will be noticeable thank you Cool. Uh, we should probably, if there are no more questions, rush on because I think we're already three minutes late for the next uh, the next person. Who is that? Ah, oh, Pedro. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Are you able to get set up quickly? Uh, you know, yes. To do. So, yes, I'm, uh, I I'm ready to go, I guess. Is there anybody here, I think? <laughs> okay. Aaron won't be presenting the next presentation, so we will uh, go straight after Pedro directly to to uh, let me check the schedule uh, to Candy for easy acts to get involved in. So let's start first with Pedro with user sentiment reporting. Yes, and uh, please then bring Candy. Just warn him in the case he doesn't. Okay. Know. Yeah, and uh, my friends, you can kill your camera feeds, I guess. Anders. <laughs> <laughs> I 
It's okay, yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, I guess so. So user sentiment reporting, uh, basically facilitating user feedback on code. Uh, right now, we have various places and in those uh, various places, uh, we have a uh, lot of feedback, uh, be that in a, in a form of a topic, thread, comment, uh, report, or questions. Uh, but there is a there is currently some missing link or, or a link that we would like to reinforce, which is uh, we would like to know uh, the the feedback versus satisfaction, and we would like to know what uh, what how we are doing with our users. Yeah, so we are able to prioritize our work. Uh, ideally, to pinpoint uh, the WSD hash that is connected to that specific feedback, so we can work on, let's say, even you know, by section finding some some bugs that were lingering around, uh, make it easier to send notes without signing up for any uh, platform. Basically, uh, a way to do this uh, within the app, and uh, a lot. Uh, of these wouldn't be uh, possible without Henry because all the all the backend uh, related work uh, was done by Henry Castro. The solution here uh, was to uh, show a new dialogue, but that dialogue uh, shouldn't be shown while others uh, are visible. Yeah, basically to avoid user frustra frustration that would of course uh, influence the feedback that they would send us. Uh, so we don't want to do that, and we would also we also wanted to make it possible to just enable and disable it uh, very easily. Um, and even more important, that it would be ideal if that if the contents of that dialog wouldn't be tied to the code version, meaning that that the contents of that of that dialog would come from outside of code so we are able to iterate send updates over the air without the need of uh, additional updates or even additional uh, storage uh, from the integrator side for example uh, you know so we are able even to change dialogue on the holidays no i'm joking but basically so we have greater flexibility but so how we do that uh, how how they would turn on this. So there is there is this new uh, variable, this enable feedback, that we can switch that to true uh, by adding uh, the, the enable feedback uh, flag to our configure. And since uh, we wanted to have this content coming uh, outside to give us a greater flexibility, adding this with feedback, with feedback location uh, and the instance where we have uh, our Django server. That Django server is nothing more than uh, an instance uh, where we we just have the content of that dialogue and where we save that feedback in a database where when the when the user chooses to send. Of course, all of this is optional. Like the enabling this this variable is optional, and even sending the feedback is optional. Here is an example. Uh, of two records in that specific database. You see that one user has uh, some feedback in terms of the description uh, and with a rating, other user didn't choose not to write nothing, even not an email, nothing, just, just a rating. So it's also good because we, we get the feedback. We, I mean, we get the, the rating and we can see again the distinction between satisfaction and the, the feedback that is sent. Um, more important is that each of these records are tied to the version hash. So this WSD hash, so we, we can know specifically which version of Collabora Online they are uh, they are talking about when they talk, uh, when they say, whoa, now everything is super fast or the opposite. Now I see a lot of glitches around this or that element. Uh, so this is how it looks. As you can see, uh, everything, uh, this whole dialogue is optional. So you can choose to not show ever again or later. 
um, and even the fields, description and email, everything, everything is optional. And if you, you can still send uh, the stars, the rating just by interacting with those stars. Um, so, uh, yes, we, w we wanted to be sure that this wouldn't be a nuisance. So does the do not show again, is that present? Uh, we also wanted to add visual cues, so there was a lot of, uh, you know, fiddling and, and improving on all the different status on over the submit button automatically appears, enable when, when the stars are filled, all these little things that it's, it's little things, but are hope, hopefully are, are little things that welcome the interaction, welcome the feedback and that the effort of that interaction at the end of the day is, is seen by the user as minimal. So they want to, to, to play with. Uh, the nice thing about this dialogue is that even though it's, let's be honest, it's actually an iframe that we present as a dialogue. And then it, here it comes the content from that the, the Django instance. But even though it, it works like this, we are able to pass uh, themable stuff. So, you know, like the, the title is themable, so it's already getting the color of, of the theme. Uh, we are also passing, by the way, if this is a mobile or not um, device. So we are, we are able to adjust the dialogue, how the dialogue appears, you will see in a second. And we are even passing, uh, as, I, as I said before, the, the, the version. So uh, when we are uh, in the presence of a mo mobile device, here, here you have it, it automatically adapts to your uh, cell phone. Uh, and since we are passing that, uh, my idea, my to-do would be, uh, and I'd like, when I have time, I would like to add one more field in that uh, database. So we are able to see, even if that feedback comes, you know, from a desktop, from a tablet, from a mobile, and it's really nice. Um, and it's also nice because the users that use and love our respons responsive mode, meaning using Collabora Online in these devices, but uh, without using the app from Android or the app from uh, Apple, just using the browser, they are not blocked. They can still uh, send feedback, and that's the, and that's pretty nice, I think. Um, and they don't need to sign up anywhere. They, they can just send. And it allows uh, a lot of more control and flexibility on our side. Because imagine if, if we know that in one, spe one specific version, uh, we have a huge revamp of an element, let's say, guess what, sidebar or something like this, we might even, we might even change the content of this dialogue to have a specific question, to have a specific uh, request. Uh, so we are able, uh, hopefully, to improve uh, the overall user experience and the way we even uh, hunt uh, some of these glitches or some of these uh, bugs uh, that uh, sometimes uh, get, um, you know, get forgotten because there's some small detail and you just, we just realize after a while. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I think I have one minute and 50 seconds left, uh, but I would just uh, call, uh, call your attention to all these links, um, you know, how to, uh, how to do your first pull request, uh, all the various communication channels and as well uh, how to start with the easy hacks uh, you know just navigate through our community website and we we are i'm going actually to have a talk on our community website and how even contribute to that community website uh, so i hope that was uh, clear <laughs> Cool, thanks, Pedro. I'm, I'm rather tempted to do uh, Aaron Clyde's uh, for him uh, because I'm, I, I, there's lots of good content he's made there, and uh, it would be a shame, a shame to yes. miss that. Yeah. So uh, let me let me try and uh, share my screen. If you can give me a presenter, um, yes. Um, I let will me trying to get loads of Michael and stuff. Make a presenter. Ah, yeah, I have a button. Fantastic. Floor. Yes. I will share my 4K screen and see uh, what happens. Well, uh, <laughs> but I should probably get rid of my pop-ups, in which case I won't share my whole screen. I'll just share this and we'll have it window in window. Um, 
Perfect. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I will zoom in slightly. So unfortunately, I'm not Aaron, Hodge, which means you're not going to get the quality you deserve, but never mind. Let's, uh, let's move on. So, uh, but these are Aaron's slides. So uh, starting resource wise, uh, I, I guess it's, it's kind of easy. You know, you go to our website and uh, there's the code page there. And so you can download and install that and code's a great way to get started. Uh, there's some setup instructions in the SDK um, that make it uh, quite easy to do, or you can build it for your, yourself and see the uh, documentation in the source tree. Um, so really, you know, there's several ways you can do that. Um, I personally uh, install the code packages and there are also Docker images. Um, and you can do all these other things too. So you can configure it to run without SSL or with SSL. Um, obviously certificates, I mean, for me, the, the most difficult piece of setting up Calabra Online is really getting the certificates right. If you want a public server that is running with HTTPS, then you have real problems because you, you, know, you have to have valid certificates and so on. And that's, I think, quite, quite a large chunk of the problem. And then beyond that, you need a, a WAPI host uh, that's ready to serve you, whichever of our integrations uh, that is. So of course, that, you know, in theory, that's all you need to do. And it's, it's, it's all easy, but of course, there's a lot more to it than that. So I uh, say so one of the things that's absolutely critical then is to allow your WAPI host uh, to be contacted. Otherwise it's, it's a little bit uh, problematic to load and save your documents to the storage and get, get authenticated uh, from that. Of course, that's very important that we don't just trust random uh, WAPI hosts. Um, and yeah, again, the SSL certificates. Um, in terms of trying to work out what's what's going on there, uh, the logging logging level is, is really useful to set up while you're troubleshooting and then to turn it down again, because we can log practically every keystroke and packet and dump everything. Um, and well, it's incredibly expensive and performance falls through a hole in the floor when uh, when it's turned on. So turn it on and then turn it off again before you start complaining about performance. Actually, these days we warn with an error in the log saying, Hey, you know, you know, your log level is really high. Uh, yeah, this is not a good idea in deployment. Um, if you have a, a language that's not in the small core of, of languages that we default enable, it's really important to enable your uh, dictionaries there. So they're preloaded. We actually preload all of the dictionaries. And as we've seen from the discussion, dictionaries can be quite big. So we try not to do that for all languages in the world. Um, and yes, you can tweak your UI. So you have a notebook bar or the more traditional menu and toolbars are up to you. And uh, yeah, you can set the admin console password. I believe you can use the, the root password if you, if you uh, like that. Um, but yeah, we're looking at doing some different things around authentication, authenticating admins. Uh, yes, brand packages. So a code brand or cool, cool brand and uh, fonts can be really helpful. Uh, once you've done that, you then really want to run this little WSD sys template setup tool to rebuild the, the, the root or the jail uh, that we use to, to show, show that stuff off. What else? Aha! So the Docker image then has everything packed inside it. And in theory, is, everything is wonderful. Um, and you can build this uh, image yourself using the custom script, or you can just download it from Docker Hub, which is very easy and configure it via parameters. Uh, we discovered recently that the parameters, uh, well, the, the configuration script was being overridden by the parameters, even if they were empty. So we fixed the bug with that. It should make things uh, generally better for people uh, building their own images. Now, reverse proxy wise, yeah. So, so it's, it can be very, very helpful to uh, obviously not steal V1 port number everyone wants, which is 443, and, and then not have to worry about certificate handling because presumably you, you did that all already uh, for your web server or your web proxy. So we can then just plug into Apache and Nginx, uh, or we can use an HA proxy, for example, there are various configurations there in the SDK, and which can then also help you load balance uh, based on this WAPI source parameter to different, to different hosts. But that then makes life very much easier. You just run on port 9980 and then uh, forward traffic to that port, I think. So uh, once it's running, of course, you can then see if it's working, uh, which is always helpful. Uh, by trying to fetch your discovery uh, file and uh, troubleshooting. Yeah, you, you, you know, well, yeah. there's all sorts of failure modes where people get things wrong or miss, miss dependencies, it crashes on start and so on. We, we try and have relatively helpful messages in the logs. Uh, sometimes the browser console can be very helpful if you press F12 and look at that. Sometimes, you know, there's an exception or something we're missing. Um, yeah, if, if we completely fail to start, we usually have a yeah a 70 exit code. And again, the logs can be helpful. 
Um, but yeah, it's really useful to have your certificates in the right place if you're if you're running with HTTPS. Um, yeah, beyond that, I think this is all good advice. And yeah. It can also be really helpful to see what the WAPI host is doing. So, so whether you're actually getting the, the document or not, and it's really, really good to look at both ends of that problem and then, then look at co correlate timestamps there and see what's happening and try, you know, if we have the WAPI URL uh, that should be there in the logs with a file access token and so on and see if the server that's running this or the Docker image that's running, it actually has access and, and you can actually fetch that WAPI URL. So quite a lot of our failures are, are you know, sort of strange configuration issues where we can't actually get you know, you can't use the URL that was given to us uh, because there's some kind of problem with it. And yeah, when you have questions, just jump into our forums, uh, report a bug if it's a real bug. If it's more of a configuration option, then perhaps the forum is better. Uh, clearly, Aaron is on hand uh, every day uh, with, with Azina and uh, Andrash to uh, help people uh, get set up and answer customer questions. Uh, so we'd love to do that. And yeah, get involved, join the community, try stuff out make what you want to have happen and that's that's me standing in for Aaron I think think that's about it hopefully he'll be around later to answer some questions if there are any who is next as they say ah oh, it is a Kendi Kendi yes fantastic Kendi. are you around Kendi Ski I see you I, I think so you. Well, I didn't uh, see you I didn't have the, uh, the video on yeah, uh, I, I, I should probably steal the presentation role. I think that's sensible. I have the, <laughs> I have the rights. So let's not wait for somebody to give it to me. Do for it. And uh, yeah, I'm sharing the screen. So I'm Gendy, and I will be talking about the easy hacks uh, so that you can get involved. But first of all, like what are actually the easy hacks? Because like we are talking about something that is online, so like you might get the idea that like it is something that you want to break in easily. That's not the case. Uh, like we are trying to be secure, and we are supposed to be secure. So easy hacks uh, use uh, uses the hacking as in programming, not as in trying to break into things. Um, so. Easy hacks could be uh, like improving anything in Collabora Online. Uh, so it could be uh, in improving the code itself, but it could be also some icon design, UI rework, new tests, uh, like whatever comes to your mind, improving the documentation and stuff. So, and easy in the easy hacks is that these tasks are supposed to be somehow like well described and uh, uh, are supposed to be somehow easy so that. Uh, when somebody is new to the code base, uh, they are able to like um, learn it um, somehow easily from the basic steps through something like more uh, more advanced until like they are very advanced hackers or very advanced uh, advanced uh, designers or anything that they could do in the Collabora Online. Uh, I will present like what it means, uh, the, what the EasyX mean for us, but also will pre present some some examples of what we have currently. So why to create new easy hacks in the first place? Um, it is not easy to get involved. Like you know, um, you somehow get the idea that like you would like to do something in Collabora online, but like you do not know where to start. So this is like where the easy hacks uh, come to to play. But also, like uh, for you uh, as an easy uh, as, as an experienced developer, uh, something that is like easy for you or you know somehow boring for you because you have done it like many times already can be like very interesting for somebody who is new to the project. So um, for you, uh, an easy hack, um, like for you as an experienced developer, an easy hack can be a way like how to. Uh, how to actually achieve things uh, that uh, somehow like you think like you would be able to do it but just do not want to uh, just yet because it is just you know either too easy or too boring for you at, the, at that very time uh, because like it's some kind of repetitive for example so in case uh, like you are hacking on something and find out something that could be improved uh, but think that it is like not not important enough at that very time, 
uh, please just file it in and file it uh, like with the uh, with the information like how to how to uh, like access uh, so this concrete uh, part of the code uh, so like uh, note down the the exact file where it happens or the function name and what do you want actually to do with that so um the way how we are actually organizing the easy hacks is that we file them as github issues um so there's a label easy hack uh, for these github issues that are supposed to be easy hacks and as i've uh, like already somehow um somehow uh, um, thought a bit so please describe them well so that it's understandable for the people that have no knowledge about the collaborator online uh, make sure that it's something that is like reasonably easy because we do not want to scare people at the like very first hour and uh, add the co code pointers like what file it is what function and of course uh, at um, if it is not obvious like how to contact you if there some contact info uh, so that like you can help the people if they get stuck um usually they will just uh, ask more questions in the easy hack like when they when they are uh, when they are interested in this but, uh, but like it always helps like when you add there more info how, how to reach you so uh if you search uh for the easy hacks uh it looks something like this uh, so this is the uh this is the link uh, that uh, that points from the presentation so so it contains uh, like Currently, some 18 open easy hacks, uh, 48 are are already closed. Uh, there is some kind of like pinned issues that, uh, that, that that might be interesting for people. But other than that, uh, like you can choose from from a variety of, of things here. And uh, yeah, so there are some examples of the easy hacks so that uh, you have the idea like what is the scale so um a very easy one is copying of documentation into source code as comments so as you can see on the web page of this uh, of this task like it is very well described uh with the examples of the steps like what you are supposed to do so how to pick uh, something from the documentation how to locate like where to put uh, where to put the comment how the comment should look like and how to uh, how to like create put request with this great example of, uh, of what to do um, there are about 30 smaller tasks in this so if you want to start uh, that's a very great great thing where to do then on the other hand like there are some more advanced um, easy hacks so if you are familiar with the c++ uh, then um, you can uh, help with the removal of the poco library um, it is something uh, the poco library is something that we have uh, in uh, in the collabora online from the very start and uh, it is uh, like quite tight in uh, in there uh, but we are trying to remove these dependencies so that things are you know more obvious more easy for people to have on so that is uh, some kind of c plus plus task then uh, there is uh, uh, user experience easy hack uh, so improvement of the word count dialogue uh, mostly uh, improving some C css uh, in collabora online so that the, the visual appearance is better and uh, um something that is uh, that is uh, more for somebody who uh, likes uh, to do shell scripting or make files and and these things uh, so we have tasks even for them there is one example here so that uh, like improving the uh, improving the the make files so that uh, uh, so that the cypress test uh, uh, failing message is uh, somehow like uh, easier written there are uh, many more, more out there uh, i've shown you the page um so from the documentation of css and javascript to c plus plus and uh, please uh, the experienced developers here please do create new uh, new easy hacks like there's never um shortage of them 
And so some next steps, like once you have uh, you have uh, chosen one and uh, you want to hack on one actually. So try to sort it out just right away. Like it's not necessary to book it some way in the issue, like telling there, like I will be working on that, uh, on that issue. Uh, it is uh, not that probable that uh, you would start it uh, like in parallel with somebody else. Of course, if you are, uh, if you fear that that might have uh, happen, like uh, write it in the issue that, that you are starting on that. But then, like it might discourage others. Like in case, like you you find out that uh, it is too hard to, to sort out actually, or you get stuck and you just do not want to continue with that. Um, somehow then then it uh, it uh, like stays in the state that that uh, it seems still booked uh, uh, against you and uh, uh, and nobody else like takes it so if possible do not try to book it do not try to assign it to yourself just just do it and start to communicate about the the uh, the next steps there so when you are finished um create a pull request and ultimately of course uh, the 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 issue is sorted out like once it is uh, in the master at least so um, for the pull request work just the normal github way and uh, uh, like uh, oh God. Uh, so uh, just uh, create it in the normal github way and uh, um, and uh, like create the, the pull request and uh, and uh, use the issue number in the commit message so that it gets linked into that, that issue. So most info, more info about this is at this web page and that's it. For me about the ECX, I think. So thank you so much. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. Good stuff. So next uh, we have community website, how to edit. Uh, let's just share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, community website. So we have our community website, which is here, collaboraonline.github.io. Um, and all the code related to this website is of course in github so i'm just going uh, to explain how it was done and how you can improve uh, the website be that on the content front or even on the website structure front so uh, we use yugo at the time it seemed the f it seemed the fastest way to get something up uh, there was a, there is a lot of popularity around it, uh, so it seems uh, that there is less uh, teaching and less uh, explanation to do. It's uh, very flexible. It allows uh, customized components. It allows theming, uh, and it and really really important is that it requires zero learning effort for someone that just wants to help out. You know, like fixing a typo or, or adding some text because you just need to know markdown so uh, open a pr and it's done after someone merges it so this is the website of uh, yugo with all the various informations including a nicely uh, set quick start now uh, do you really need to install yugo to uh, to help short answer no as, as I have discussed, if you find a typo, if you find a missing uh, paragraph or a missing flag in some specific comment, <clears throat> or maybe we are missing one link in our uh, communication channels, you can just edit that uh, markdown file, open the PR and it's done. Long answer is if you want to do something a bit more complex and if you want to see it, uh, if you want to see it, how, how it looks uh, before uh, opening the PR, then yes, you can open. You can you should install Hugo, so you can <clears throat> generate the the content locally, and you can even play with components with uh, and even fixing other things like CSS, for instance, uh, and so on. So uh, the structure uh, 
so the structure and the git so the, the we have this is the, this is what it where the website is hosted uh, we actually track also the generated stuff <clears throat> uh, also uh, basically to give the opportunity to the people that do not have the Hugo installed to be able to download it and see it locally so they even don't need to have the Hugo installed if they just want to check it locally uh, of course, if they want to do, again, if they want to hack on the CSS part, etc., it's nice to have the Yugo installed because it's easier to debug and it's easier to go through the code. Uh, and also, so we are able to, to, to use in, in an easy way the GitHub, GitHub's page uh, feature. So master uh, branch is where the generated staff, uh, stuff is at and the source branch is where the actual source files are. Uh, we have a readme file that explains everything, but basically uh, here we use the git work tree, so we are able to have a mixed branch um, folder in our in our uh, computer uh, with the public folder, the, the folder that is created by Hugo when you run it locally, uh, becomes automatically the the master branch. So that's pretty nice because then you can basically work on the source uh, branch you when you run the Hugo command it generates to the public so you know everything is nicely uh, divided and you don't need to go back and forth in branches um, in terms of structure um, so uh, we are using uh, a theme this a chunky poster theme uh, but I actually changed many things, including creating uh, uh, custom elements and even the, the whole theming colors, etc. was were changed. So for instance, an example would be uh, the, these drop downs, uh, these drop downs, uh, for instance, to choose the, the operating system and other components like this were uh, created uh, as a costumer short co short codes. Then we have um, then we have uh, partials that are just like footer head and header. It's uh, like eight, uh, chunks of code that live there that they will be reused in multiple pages. And we have also this folder uh, underscore default um, where some of the layouts that uh, that are needed to generate uh, multiple pages um, are stored. An example, we have this card.html, which is where uh, we uh, we have how, how we, we have set how a card looks like, and we use that in the home page. But then we also have uh, an additional one as well, like regarding sidebar. So we have a nicely context sidebar in each of these um, posts that go through the build instructions. In this case. Uh, the build for iOS, but we have the same thing for Android and uh, normal normal uh, code. Um, the CSS uh, lives under the static folder. And uh, lastly, but actually very, very important, is uh, our config file. So we have our config configuration file, uh, this uh, TOML uh, files, where we, st we store things like what should be the description of the website, subtitle of the website, the taxonomies, which is basically, you can call it like, it's like typology of contents, like categories, tags, types, uh, what it should be the menu of the, of the website. So there is a lot of things that you can set and fix uh, within, this, um, within this configuration file. So it's, it's, nicely, it's nicely laid out for you like that. And uh, and it's pretty much it. Then we have the default MD, so markdown file, uh, which is uh, which is the the model file that is used uh, when generating posts. So each 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 post, uh, for instance, is how to build the iOS. It's a post uh, will automatically get appended these properties like a property, a title property, a date property, and a draft, and automatically it's true. And then, it, so you are even able to have draft posts and then just later on changed uh, to false, so it gets published. Um, and then 
uh, running out of time. So how to contribute? So first, if you just want to fix a typo or fix a small thing, it's very easy. You just need to clone uh, your forked uh, repository. So first you need to go to the GitHub, fork the repository, clone uh, to your computer, check out the source br the branch, uh, and fix whatever typo you want to fix. For instance, in this case, in the build code. Uh, add those changes, commit, uh, don't forget to sign off. It's kind of nice to have emails of everyone so we know, uh, you know, each, each person so we, we, we can pinpoint and even, uh, you know, request changes and push and then uh, just compare and press the pull re open re pull, pull request uh, button. So that's pretty easy, actually. You see, no no installation of Hugo, no nothing. Just changing a markdown file and bang, uh, you are contributing for to, to the website. Uh, now, if you want to contribute and fix more stuff, like more stuff, not just on not 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 just content, and even sometimes some metadata or even that specific author or some. Uh, hold on. Sorry. I think Paul accidentally unmuted. Carry ah, on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so, uh, so then it's very easy. You just go to this. Uh, you just go and read the README file. I really try to spend some time in that README file so everything is clear. You install Hugo. I also have it there. Very. So if you don't want to read everything, you can just see how to install Hugo there in many different forms, um, and you do exactly the same thing. And here you use our little friend work tree. So you have the, the public, your public subfolder set to master and uh, you do exactly the same. So change, do your changes. Uh, you before you open the pull request, now that you have Hugo installed, why not generate and see how it looks? So you just can write on your computer just to Hugo space server in the main root of, of, of uh, of that repository and bang, it will generate, it will create this virtual server inside of your of your computer and you can see, and it will show you the link in the, in the terminal and you can see how it looks and if everything looks good, uh, you can just send the PR and uh, we are good to go. <laughs> so I think that's it. Thanks, Peter. Cool, who's next? Tomasz, Quickie, how are you doing? Uh, we can give you the, oh, is that important? So you should be the presenter, you should have a button now on your screen of Doom. Aha, you're unmuted. That's good. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> ah, we can see you. Everything is going swimmingly. See your mouse cursor. That's always uh, encouraging. You're not using Wayland, are you? Oh no. Ooh, no that's nothing. No, lost your screen share. Wayland. What's that? It doesn't work with Wayland. I have no idea. I imagine it does, but uh, it's. Uh, I saw only a mouse cursor. I just see the black screen should yep maybe Is that's because easy? you have two 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 screens now uh, or you have one screen i have only one screen okay it's easy so uh, meanwhile let's do this uh, do you have it uh, PDF, pdf version of it PDF version okay what about now one second yes yes so, we, we see the whole yes i'll think but it doesn't go to the other slime. Right. So if you just uh, yeah pre present then, I guess F5 will. Or is that just the browser window? Since it's just browser window. Yeah. So we see only your big blue button window. But technically, if I go now where we have the slides i should be able to present yes <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
I don't know if this is wise to stream this. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, oh. So, how do we... So... So uh, why don't we have um, Andreas do it while uh, Cookie sorts his uh, thing out? If you're ready, Andreas, are you around? Hope so. Excellent. I hope so. Good man. So let me um, make you the presenter. You should have a button to show your screen. Uh, yes. Yeah. I got it, and now I have on the side. I think we can hear you, which is good. We can't see you. A quickie, you might want to turn your video off. Andreas is presenting. So. A video is not possible, I don't know why. Do you have a camera, Andreas, or not? Yeah, sure. Maybe I'm not allowed, however. Oh. Um, thanks for the press. Uh, Can I have the presentation for today? I think it was the wrong. Sorry to rush you, you know what it's like. Ha ha ha. Hide, hide the uh, pretty master slide. Yeah. Hide ah, so this is great. Yeah. What a user experience. Anyway, over to you then, Andreas, if you're ready. Sorry to rush you. Yes, I'm ready. Um, I can have a talk about notebook, notebook bar structure. Um, the idea is, um, my name is Andreas Kainz, I'm not from Colabora, um, only community member, and um, did in the last... Only, only, uh, only. you're a pressure. Only. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't exactly. <clears throat> Quite, please. Um, the good thing is I can do whatever I want, and uh, I break everything and you have to fix it, hopefully. Um, in the past year, I do some stuff about user interface uh, and start with the notebook bar, the notebook bar structure, uh, ordinary, everything is located at a uh, notebook bar, at uh, the low V flat uh, <coughs> folder, <coughs> the uh, control notebook bar, writer, calc, impress, draw, JavaScript files, and two other JavaScript files, I don't know what they are. They are really important, I think. <clears throat> First, you have to switch uh, to notebook bar. You can switch uh, in the config file. That is somewhere this uh, user interface string, and then you can switch to notebook bar, and then you will see it. In general, the notebook files are structured quite good. Uh, we have there for example, notebook bar uh, writer JavaScript file. We have the, um, the different tabs. Here the file tab, home tab, and so on, all the, all the different tabs uh, with context. So home tab will be shown by default when you are in text mode or in the draw text context file. Um, and then we switch, for example, to the home tab. There we have the JSON file with a type. Big to it item means it's a big item, big icon, uh, and only one icon in there. So one icon, and that's it. Uh, unbutton the the label. Uh, then we can have con a container. A container contain a couple of toolbox, and the toolbox can contain can contain a tool item. Um, for example, here we have a cut and format paintbrush, and in the next uh, toolbox, you will see then uh, copy and clear. Um, so you can make all the notebooks with these two elements, with two, big two items, you make one icon, and with containers, you can group them and make them shiny. That's it. 
uh, the first thing was uh, that we cleaned up all the um, notebook bars to have only these two items. Why? Because it's way easier to design then with JavaScript the layouting when you only have some types. Um, in general, I have an open bug for a long time now, but it's not, it's not an easy, easy hack. Um, the idea is to make the notebook bar more uh, simple. So that, that it's uh, way easier to edit the document. In general, it's not not that difficult to edit. It's easier than uh, for LibreOffice, for example. Uh, but it could be way easier. And at least um, we have really nice JSON files, for example, for the toolbar, for the classic toolbar. And we can also go further in the direction uh, because we only have mm, some groups and that's it, only some. Yeah. So the idea is you have a big tool item, you have the container, the, the boxes, and when you can simplify the, the JSON file, um, you can then with JavaScript change how to arrange all these groups. So for example, you can switch, you could switch from an notebook bar to a more compact mode and uh, and back. Or you can have then um, with JavaScript uh, and in CSS the options for a specific mobile or specific uh, tablet mode and so on. That was the idea. So first of all, I would prefer to have some simplification and then play around with JavaScript, which is always funny. So you can switch from notebook bar to a more compact mode. Um, and in the end, you have, would have two JavaScript, uh, two uh, CSS files, one for the classic mode and one for compact mode, and only one JavaScript file and so on. So would be a good option. Um, the issue, very important, one, two, five, seven. And um, you can easy hack on the notebook pause. It's really simple to, to add some content. Uh, you only have to copy paste whatever is already here. And that's it. Um, don't make it more complicated than it's necessary. So one thing I uh, was work in the last couple of weeks is um, on mobile. Uh, why? Because nobody cares about mobile in the past. So I start with it. No, there are a lot of people cares about it, but I uh, don't see someone who will work on the user interface stuff and so switch to this side, um, to the mobile UI. Um, the idea is we have now in the mobile, also in the desktop, we have a toolbar and the toolbar is not, it's, it's, it's static. And to um, achieve one, add me an option uh, that we can also have context related commands at the toolbar, which works already. Uh, all well, I have one open box, but that, that's it. Uh, and so, for example, we have here a text mode in the center with all the commands. When you go to the tablet, uh, to the to a context table, you have the same text elements, but on the right, you have some table specific commands. So, in general, when you switch, the UI wouldn't switch because you always have on the left all the text settings and only on the right the table settings. Um, for when you are on the graph, in the, when you select a graphic or a drawing, something else, then you will see there 
all the commands that are related to graphics. Um, because you don't can you can't make them bold, whatever. And then you can have a cleaner user interface and it's really cool. It's not too complicated to edit and document on mobile. It works better than expected. Because you only have the commands that are available and on top you can click to have all the uh, sidebar commands, so you can have all the additional commands which are ordinarily not available as uh, toolbar items. And this is how the mobile button bar looks like. You have to type a button, a menu, whatever, uh, the UNO command and the context. <coughs> uh, now you can only select one context, but uh, the open bug is to have also the option to make to have more context elements because as you see in the first slide and in one of the first slides the, uh, the home elements are for default text and draw text so it would be easier to have more options because you can use the text elements also for table and so on yes so I work on mobile stuff, uh, in the past the notebook bus stuff and on the sidebar, sidebar stuff for the layouting. If someone wants to join, welcome. If someone uh, needs help, please let me know. Uh, ordinary the stuff, uh, we work on issue trackers on GitHub. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Andreas. That's really cool. And uh, it's also visible. It's also visible that you are also active in GitHub, and I see that already that you uh, are guiding other people. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always good when, and you have an, an easy, easy hack. <laughs> uh, someone else will fix it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so now let's try. Let's try it again quickly. What do you think? You are the presenter now. I think. So I think your video feed is coming, hopefully. Yes, I see you. Yes, perfect. So start when you are ready. I hope the full screen works. Yes. Yes, perfect. Ah, oh, finally. But my video doesn't for some reason. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, Ah, no, no, everything works. Perfect. Yeah, I'm Tomas, and I'll talk about uh, document searching. Uh, so first, I'd like to ca categorize uh, what kind of searching is, like uh, searching inside the document. I said is there is searching internally in, inside the document, like in Collabora Online, you can already search for some phrases inside documents and traverse actually the internal document uh, model for for uh, what search phrase you want but there's also what is uh, declared as external searching which is usually then searching using a, a index database uh, so that uh, the idea here is that uh, you are searching for mu in multiple documents for the phrases uh, and uh, there is a little bit different uh, use case here because mainly uh, when you are searching in multiple documents this is not for exact, uh, uh, required that uh, the documents are all always uh, up to date or like uh, all, all the changes are uh, immediately. Of course, this is nice if it has, but uh, there is also 
an indexing pause that uh, uh, can be a little bit delayed. Uh, how this is usually done by uh, like uh, there are like uh, already existing uh, search uh, uh, databases uh, and uh, usually they what they do is they transform uh, the documents into text and uh, and uh, or a rich a little bit rich text like HTML uh, and the problem with, with this uh, searching is that uh, the search result itself you get is like uh, which document uh, uh, contains uh, the the search result uh, but you don't have no extra context about uh, searching at all it just maybe it says like uh, the text uh, uh, the, the, the surrounding text that was found, but uh, not uh, uh, more than this. So, um, so what's the idea? The idea here is that we can do better than this uh, with the LibreOffice and combined with uh, Collabora Line. That so that we can also provide the context if this search result is found inside an um, image or in. Uh, as a caption or is inside a table, we uh, we can provide an uh, uh, an image of the of the search result where in where inside the document uh, it's uh, uh, present. So uh, thanks to NLNet uh, that uh, 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 sponsored uh, uh, this work. Uh, so that uh, what what we uh, built is uh, exactly like this. So uh, so what we needs to be done to get a solution like this is like uh, we need to first at first uh, create the search data. Uh, not not we we cannot just uh, export uh, searching a search uh, text search paragraph itself, but we also need to uh, add uh, additional data like it's uh, which is in this case uh, internal uh, document model data the indexes where, where these uh, paragraphs are uh, inside the document are uh, located then we, we have to import this search data inside a search platform, search indexing platform like uh, Solar, Apache Solar, which is just one of the, the uh, indexing uh, databases available. And then we have to search it, we get some search results, and then we need to, with help of uh, Collabora Online and LibreOffice, render this into an uh, image uh, of the search result location. So first thing first, uh, we need to create this uh, search result data and about uh, how this, this is uh, uh, implemented is that we added a new LibreOffice Kit API uh, that uses a save as to create the search data. And this is also uh, available via Collabora uh, Online, this converts to REST service and the search Format is just a simple XML flat structure uh, that is uh, easy to convert to the more specific uh, uh, search data format that is used by the uh, database. Uh, then next is to render the image. Uh, we need we, we usually search, then we get some search result, and this contains our uh, additional indexes of the document model and now we say okay give uh, for this search result can you give us the uh, where this uh, image uh, an image where this search result is found and uh, this is then the next rest service that was added is a render search result which is very similar to convert to and uh, we have to provide the document and the actual search result and as a result of this we get the image uh, of the search results location so now we need to 
combine this uh, together. Uh, so for this uh, create a proof of concept application, uh, it's just uh, combining uh, everything together. So collaborate online with uh, Solar, uh, the search platform, and I've written a Python, a simple Python HTTP server, which uh, has additional uh, uh, REST services uh, and uh, it's also used to provide the uh, HTML and JavaScript uh, to the to the web client, and then everything is happening there. Then on Collabor Online, as already said, it uh, provides the rendered image for the search result and also opens the documents. So this is how it looks like. Uh, and when you're searching, we get the results. Uh, maybe quickly, because I want to uh, add a quick uh, demo. Uh, so what is uh, important here is that uh, it has a re-indexing. Uh, every time the document uh, changes, uh, we have to re-index it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we don't get uh, up-to-date uh, information. Uh, search uh, information and uh, I guess that uh, this will be then uh, done every time that the document uh, is changed uh, but uh, in, inside this application this is a manual process then the search we search uh, uh, we have uh, solar uh, has a like extended uh, query app API already. We are just uh, quickly searching inside the, for the paragraphs and just show the results on the web app. And then lastly, we trigger this result search, uh, uh, render search result service uh, to render the, the actual document. So I'll try it demo quickly. Uh, so here is the, the application, web application, and we can, th these are the available documents here, just a list of them, and then we have LibreOffice. I got, can just, just, uh, yeah, this is wrong. And now, uh, when I click search, uh, it asked for so solar for the search result, and after search result, each search result was rendered by uh, Collabor Online. Uh, and now we have uh, all the paragraphs where this is uh, uh, contained. And we can also say, like, well, and this will have a little bit more search results. And again, this will show exactly the, exactly the context or where this has been search has been found and these are some uh, shapes so it can show the shape and there are some like in figures and the drawings you can also show the drawings and the exact paragraph uh, document if we just click here it will open this inside uh, Collabor Online and we can all see the document, how it actually looks. Okay, and this is all for me. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so now we have uh, Q&A, I think. Yes. Oh, we have Q&A. I think we have like minus three minutes. Is that right? But hopefully we can uh, we can ask a few questions in minus three minutes if if people have them. Um, Andreas had a question. Does, does it search work with the video? No cookie. I don't know if you answered that in the talk, but uh, does the global search work also for PDF? Uh, no, this is currently only working for uh, writer documents, not even uh, all the all the supported documents inside the Collabor Online. This is the first. Oh, makes sense. And 
how far you will go with this uh, search. I think it's a bit for a client, isn't it? NLNet, yes. So I think at the moment we, we've completed the work for NLNet. Um, it would be nice to have someone that wanted uh, more work here so that we could make it work beautifully. But I think it's a very unique thing to be able to search inside and have a graphical view of what you've hit. Um, so I, I, I'm pretty pleased by it. But, uh, you know, I think having more people that wanted uh, beautiful search results would be uh, good uh, from the customer perspective. So at the moment, Quickie is working on other things, I think. Some other gorgeous, important thing. So, uh, you know, there's lots of things that need doing. You know, we, we we live in a candy store, and the only shortage is money. <laughs> yes. We also have another, yeah, we have also another question for you, Andreas, uh, from yeah. uh, Ash. Uh, he asks, uh, the files were in uh, JS, but the content was in JSON. Does JS imply there could be JavaScript code or just JSON? Feel free to answer in the Q&A. Yes. Yeah, I think it's both. So you can you can mix, and uh, you also have the some commands with HTML link and so on. So I think you can mix, and you have these two uh, notebook bar and notebook bar builder files that are in general the generator stuff, and the, in the in the writer card and so on notebook bar files you have the content. So. Uh, I think you can mix, but I think most stuff is in this um, builders files. But it's really easy and you, you don't need anything in, in general. You only have to add the unit command and that's it. The reason I'm asking it's you It's way cooler than in, in LibreOffice. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I, 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 no, I hear you. Keep it simple. Um, yeah. It's just that sometimes you need, uh, you know, a bit of dynamic logic maybe or to calculate something at runtime. That's that's what I was trying to see if it was possible or not. Um, for example, the font selector, uh, you only add the command and the font selector, I don't know where it comes from, but it's the same than, than the toolbar font selector. You, so you don't have to uh, do, anything. Yeah. do anything, yes. Right. Makes sense. Thank you. Welcome. You are muted, Michael, but you are talking a lot, it seems. That's the reason why you muted. Yeah, the smarts are connected to them at a different level, uh, the JavaScript. And the plan, I think, was to get this into LibreOffice as well, so it was easier to, to edit, to pass that. We've been busy. <laughs> Perhaps you noticed. Um, good. Uh, any other questions? It seems like the Mortimer's team is uh, eager to to listen to uh, the Mortimer's presentation, mm -hmm. so they will uh, retweet uh, someone uh, now. I think so. <laughs> they will bring some uh, some additional people. Well, there's a lot of cool talks going to come up uh, shortly around uh, integration. So yeah, do uh, bring your friends as it were. I'm um, sure we move on then, uh, Pedro William, and uh, start Julius. Yes, talk indeed. Yes. Then we call the talk yes. by Julius uh, about Nextcloud integration and date, which I'm going to launch right now, right away. And this time I'm taking your consideration and we'll replay the video in good quality. <laughs> so I'm pressing stop. We're loading as I definition, putting back in, and we are ready. One, glad to be here. My name is Judas, and I work at Nextcloud as a software engineer. I will be presenting you a bit about the integration we have with Collabora Online in our Nextcloud product. If Toma and LGO could uh, stop their webcam, please. Uh, it is a fully integrated collaboration platform. It is easy to deploy and maintain and to use. Um, you can run it on like small home devices like a Raspberry Pi, but it also allows uh, scaling for enterprise use to, to millions of users, basically. Um, you can run it on your own infrastructure, so it's fully on-premise, and we're also a fully open-source solution. 
Um, as a bit of an overview on our core product we call Nextcloud Hub, which is kind of a combination of different uh, software features. Um, first of all, there's Nextcloud Files, which provides an enterprise file sync and share solution. Um, it allows you to upload files, synchronize them with your computers or mobile devices, and also share them with other users or, or guests through public links. Um, as the next component, there is the groupware uh, part, which uh, integrates yeah the, the, the common groupware solutions like uh, uh, mail, calendar, and contacts. Um, there is Nextcloud Talk, which is a video conferencing and chat solution, and there's Office, which uh, comes with Collabora online integration to edit um, and view your office files right within the, the browser with the next cloud. Yeah, so the Collabora online integration, as you can see, is nicely integrated into the next cloud user interface. Um, right from within your files, you can just click an office file and it will open up in Collabora online. Um, as we can see here with the, with the presentation, um, there is uh, also integration with the Nextcloud file sidebar, as you can see on the right, um, where you have direct access to the sharing functionality to comments, versions, um, or the files activity. So you can basically write while editing, for example, share a file to a different user. Um, the Collabora online integration uh, consists of two parts, basically. So we have the Nextcloud connector app, which is an app that runs inside of Nextcloud. And that one then connects to a Collabora online server. That can either be like a real uh, or a, a, a fully separate running Collabora online um, service uh, that can be installed through Docker or um, distribution packages. Or there's also the, uh, let's say, smaller uh, built-in code server, which is also a Nextcloud app um, where you can run Collabora online with the Nextcloud uh, without any any need for a server setup. Uh, for the basic features, uh, of course, we offer document, spreadsheet, and presentation editing and viewing. Um, so as mentioned, right from within your files, just click them to open. Um, with Collabora Online, there comes the, the feature of collaborative editing. So you can work on the same document with multiple users at the same time, seeing uh, all the changes the other users do in real time. Uh, we make use of the conversion endpoint of Collabora to uh, also generate previews for files, of course. Um, but there is also a few of additional more advanced features uh, that come with the Nextcloud integration. We worked on, on integrating template management um, that allows users or admins to define a list of predefined templates. Um, as you can see in the screenshot below, uh, the user would then be asked on, on, on creation of new files to select a template for the new file to be created. Um, next would be the viewer app integration, which is the viewer app is basically a Nextcloud component uh, that handles file edit or file opening. Um, and that break yeah that is uh, integrated in Collabora in our Collabora app as well. And this allows to not only use uh, Collabora Online within the Nextcloud file set, but also, for example, in inside of Nextcloud Talk. So as a, as a simple use case, if you share a file to a talk conversation where you are, you're currently in a video call, then uh, everyone in that call can immediately click on the file and open and edit the document while still stay being in the call. Um, yeah, so first of all about direct editing. Uh, uh, with Nextcloud, we have uh, clients for the desktop, like uh, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. We also have mobile clients for iOS and Android. And we work together with Collabora to allow editing basically right from within our Nextcloud applications. Uh, so if you have a Collabora online setup, and connected to your Nextcloud instance, you will get uh, offered the option to create new documents, spreadsheets, and presentations right from within the Nextcloud mobile apps. And then you can also like directly just tap on a uh, on a file in the mobile app, and it will open a, a web view that then uh, allows the same collaborative editing as it would be on the browser. Um, the way we implemented this is. Uh, that there is basically uh, a one-time token being generated uh, on the Nextcloud side. And with that token, the mobile apps can then 
open Collabora online um, without the need of having an like a locked in user session available, which is uh, the case for the for the web view we use on on Android or iOS, for example. Next one would be Secure View, um, which makes use of a couple of uh, Collabora online features, like uh, there is the option to uh, limit copy pasting on documents, to uh, limit download options, so you could could hide the download option and and printing and exporting for for shares, for example. Uh, and there's also an advanced watermarking feature, which would allow you to watermark documents. Uh, so you can specify like a text with certain placeholders and then uh, define in, in which conditions those watermarking rules should apply. Uh, global scale is a bit of a um, different topic in general, maybe a quick overview on that first. Uh, so by, by default Nextcloud is, is like a single instance solution where you would have um, one Nextcloud instance where all your users um, all your users are, are located basically. Uh, and this comes with some limitations, uh, especially when it comes to larger installations, uh, where usually the, the database uh, setup then becomes the bottleneck. Uh, so f yeah, some, some a while ago we, we came up with a different architecture for scaling Nextcloud uh, across even yeah, uh, hundreds of millions of users. Um, so the idea is that you can have uh, multiple separate Nextcloud installations which run kind of on their own, but there is um, yeah, communication between those instances to allow users from one instance to share files to users on another instance. And this makes use of a feature that is already there for a while, which is called federated sharing. Um, yeah, that allows you to share a file from one Nextcloud instance to another. And with global scale, we combine this feature with um, yeah the ability to also find users in other instances and um, allowing uh, multiple instances to be used uh, even in, in like one organization, for example. Uh, with federated sharing, the file would always stay at the, the source instance. Um, and like when a user downloads the file from another one, it would always be fetched from the original source. So the, the the owner of the file would still uh, stay in control on, like, if he wants to delete the file or uh, restrict access again. Um, yeah, so with uh, Global Scale, we came up with a bit of a different approach for editing files with Collabora Online, um, which basically would still edit the file on the original source instance, um, but there's some need for, for information exchange, of course, to make sure um, that the user details are passed to the instance and yeah, the, the proper access permissions are also checked. Yeah, a, a bit more on the integration we did with Collabora Online. There's quite some things we do for, for customizing the experience. Um, there are certain values that we, we customize with the UI defaults because with Nextcloud we, we always aim for um, having a simple uh, simple user interface by default. So there are some, some UI elements that we kind of want to hide for the default experience um, where Collabora Online uh, luckily offers some options for that. So we hide the sidebars, for example, by default, uh, as otherwise we would end up with two sidebars, with the Nextcloud one and the Collabora Online one. Um, but the sidebar is of course still available. Um, we do some UI customizations with the CSS variables that can be passed to Collabora Online, for example, for setting the, the primary colors. And um, we also make use of the post message API to, to adjust some further things. So that was all from my side. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, otherwise, we also have information available at our website, nextcloud.com. Um, or especially on, on the Collabora Online integration at nextcloud.com slash Collabora Online. Um, yeah, thanks so far and have a good day. Cool. So next up we have uh, eGroupware integration update. Uh, I think uh, 
Birgit Baker, can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, okay. can we see you? <laughs> What's the so, next question? Ah, ah excellent. Perfect. Slides. perfect. Awesome. Different. Hmm. Yeah, so um, welcome to eGroupware integration update. I prepared a few slides, and if there is enough time, I also show a bit saying a few things live. So eGroupware Smart Online Office, we are almost a complete office in the web browser, even with the integration of Collabora Online, but we have a lot of applications like um, Groupware applications, but as well Kanban board or uh, ticket system. So there are a lot of integrations in eGroupware video system, rocket chat integration. Um, all these things are available in eGroupware. Today, I'd like to show a bit of the installation and integration of Collabora in eGroupware, a bit our file manager, which is for sure the base where files are stored. And then comes something which is really specific for eGroupware, talking about templates and placeholders in eGroupware, which means every data you store in eGroupware can be used in Office documents. So placeholder of the application gets merged with the template and you get contact information, project information, calendar information, whatever you like, you get into your office documents and can't use them without copy paste. And we're using the SDK conversion API to also allow to directly merge template documents into PDF documents or convert files into PDF or PNG from file manager. Yeah, by default, Collabora gets installed with every eGroupware installation, but you can also skip it during the installation and install it later with one command. Everything is based on Docker. And um, you can also install eGroupware standalone and, or Collabora standalone, which means we have some customers using Nextcloud, for example, but using our Collabora packages on their Nextcloud server, which includes also something what we call Watchtower, and therefore updates automatically if there are new packages available. And you can switch easily between cool and code version. Yeah, there is a configuration for Collabora integrated in eGroupware, where you just specify your Collabora server. We are checking a few things that the connection works. And you even can directly insert there your license key and the username for admin and password to be able to reach the admin console directly. In that case, you just save. We are inserting everything into the loose VD and restarting the container. So everything get automatically restarted. You don't need to edit your files itself, but for sure you can also edit it. For example, if you want to have specific languages for your spell checker, that can still be done. License key user interface and these things can directly be specified in eGroupware itself. So there are preferences where the user can select if specific file types should be opened with or without Collabora. So if I don't want that CSV files get opened with Collabora, I can specify it and then it gets downloaded. Um, I can have a specific merge print handler for our templates if that should be opened with Collabora or downloaded. And same is valid for double-click action and which toolbar should be used, if it should be the tapped or so the old or the new interface. The language we're giving automatically from the language the user use um, to Collabora, so it opens automatically in the user language eGroupware file manager acts as a file server and you can mount directories via either SMB WebDAV file system into eGroupware. There are a few examples below and 
this also because we have some customers using Nextcloud and eGrouper. And so you could mount your Nextcloud share, which supports WebDAV, into eGroupware. So even if your Nextcloud is not configured to be to use Collabora, uh, if it's shared or mounted into eGroupware, you can reach via eGroupware also your Nextcloud files opening with Collabora online. So everything can be in one place if you, the customer likes to. Yeah, so in general, one thing which is really specific for us, we use the templates, but the templates not only in a way like um, opening for documents, but also in a way of merging data. So an easy solution is here if I want to have a typical document opened for new documents with my logo in, with my font in, with the borders, I just store it in templates Collabora. And if I create a new document of that type, we are taking the template in um, and open it for the new document with whatever was stored in there. For other applications like a trust book or so, you can use in your file placeholders. So everything, every data, as I mentioned before, can be used. So it doesn't matter if you are talking about the organization name, the full name of the contact or the place where it is or the possibility to use custom fields in eGroupware. So if I want to create a customer number, which is not there by default in eGroupware, you just create that field. Everything is able for updating. We have a lot of general fields, placeholders being available to create if statements um, for replacing data. All things, these things are part of the placeholder system of eGroupware and all apps can take part in that system. So easy example, I have a document and in the background you see there are some placeholders in. This is a new um, dialogue we inserting in Collabora, thanks to Michael and the guys making that available in the last uh, couple of weeks. So you can search in the placeholder of eGroupware, select them, insert them, they get into the document, or they can even be filled with contact data. So I can search directly for a contact and then get the value being inserted into my document. And if I save such a template document, merge it with my data, I get a letter fully filled in with the data, replacing wherever the placeholder was, like the customer number now shows up here in my document. The way it works is easy. I'm selecting, for example, a contact. I select insert into document. I select my file so we can deal with different kind of um, MIME types like um, text documents, spreadsheets, but also emails or um, with the SDK conversion API now also merge it directly into a PDF. Then the file gets generated, the placeholder gets replaced and you can work with it. Same is valid for converting. So if I'm having an ODS file, I can click simply convert to PDF and it creates a PDF, stores it there, and you could also mail it or share it to a customer directly. Yeah, as mentioned before, if I'm having a few more minutes, I would like to also show that um, live. So we're running a bit over time. File manager. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, this is a um, document I have been working with and I can simply click here on that placeholder icon. Uh, yeah. You need to click on the right screen and not on the one what I'm sharing, that doesn't help. <laughs> So I'm clicking here, I select, for example, I want something um, with the email, I can select or I want to get the website and I get the according placeholder displayed and it gets inserted at the position I'm at. Or I could even search for a contact like, let's search for test. It searches directly in the eGroupware database I select my company and if there is something, it shows up here. Um, so let's go, for example, for contact full name and then you see it shows and displays that's the value which is behind test tester and if I'm inserting it gets directly into my document and what, whatever position it was. And so I can create my templates itself, but I can also directly insert data. So for example, if I want to insert here something, I can also click on insert directly some contact data like a business address, searching for a user. Um, let's take that one. It shows up here, I say insert, and it inserts it directly into my document at the position I have been. So these are things where you can easily either use templates or use the contact information stored in eGroupware directly um, to Great. get these things. But as mentioned before, it's not only a trust book. We have the it's other apps ridiculous. also being available, working with these placeholder system and the data can merge into. Great, I can... it's really good to see it, Bridget. Thank you, thank you for your demo. I think we're, I think we're out of time. Are we better? Are we? Yes, I will. Uh, thanks, Bridget. Was I'm looking forward to your presentation tomorrow. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll show you more need... tomorrow. Yeah, read the comments. People uh, really were getting excited this about placeholders. So <laughs> now, Ash, uh, I just gave you the floor. Do you hear me? We'll have a chance for questions uh, in a minute, of course. Yes. Uh, Chitaya. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, this is so uh, me. My uh, yes, yes, yes. yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, yep. Getting by uh, yes. share my Sorry. screen. Can you see me? I can uh, see Can you hear me? Yes, we can see you. We can hear you. And uh, let's let's how do I share my screen? Hmm. Uh, Welcome, Chitanya. Yeah. Good to have you. Hi. So how, how do I share my screen? Oh, so there should be a button at the bottom. If you move to where your video thing oh, is, yeah. because you're I, now a I, presenter, sorry. you have a magic new button, which okay. yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be nice if it was always there, but insensitive, and then suddenly it became sensitive, but uh, there you are. Uh, yep. So hmm. you guys can see me. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. I will be talking about the Mattermost and Collabora integration. And for those who don't know, Mattermost is a team communication platform similar to Discord or Slack or Microsoft Teams. Many of you must know that. So the best part is it's open source, like just like Collabra. And this is how the interface looks today. But like a major rewrite of the UI is coming. Like it will look like this in the next month. So that and so basically, Mattermost allows you to share messages and files. But by default, you can't see any file. And it just shows some information about that file. You have to download the file so that you will be able to see and edit it. And then you have to upload a new version and enter the Collabora plugins. You, this is how you enable it. This is the settings. So it, the integration works very similar to the next cloud one. So you have a Collabora server some running somewhere. So it is running locally right now. 
and then you have the Colabra server, you get this option, but like you can basically just preview this file. This has nothing. And basically you can edit this file as well. And you can just save it. Just close it, it should get saved. Yep, got saved. And yeah, that, and basically, Similar, like Mattermost, all the files are stored in the data directory of your server, which, which is running Mattermost, or some S3 compatible storage. So basically, for, for using Colabra, all the files, the file that you need to edit is transferred to Colabra server, and that is done securely. And this is the encryption key. So this is like similar to how Nextcloud maintains the security. It is very similar. And so, yeah, so basically you can now edit the file and you can also view the file at its current state. So if someone is editing this file right now, I won't be able to see it, see the edits. I'll have to close the file and open it again. But yeah, that's something. Uh, but yeah, now by default, the Colabra plugin allowed us to so you may not want to edit the file with everyone, like allow everyone in the server to edit the file. So basically what you have is uh, edit permissions. So I will show that too. So this is a file I was editing. So right now it's in the view mode. Then if I click this log button, it becomes opens in the edit mode. Then I can just edit it and then I can save that to view mode. And this happens sometimes, curse of demo. <laughs> but yeah, so now by default, only I can edit. So I'll open another user. That user cannot edit. This button gets disabled for another user. And uh, yeah, but I can give permission to everyone in the channel to allow them to edit this file now. And now this other person can edit it. The other person cannot change the file permissions, but yeah, that person can edit. And we can see that two people are collaboratively editing. So I can see the other person's cursor and I, we can see each other's edits. So this is how you can do it. And I can save it and I can open it in view mode. And this gets updated after everyone saves the file. Yep. Got updated. And you can see the file got updated. And you can download it. And basically, the edit permissions feature is implemented like this right now. But like as we have more users, we'll have more minute fine grained permissions. Like I can give permission to a few users or something like that. That's the plan for the future. So that's all I had for today. Great. Well, it looks really cool, Shinto. Thank you. Good stuff. Excellent. Well, hopefully there'll be some questions there at the end. Um, great to see the collaborative editing going. We can now chat inside our document uh, as well as inside the wonderful chat uh, that Matt pro pro provides. Yeah. <laughs> And I think now we are actually up to, to Moodle. Is that right, Ash? Are you uh, Moodle? Yes. <laughs> it's a new verb. Yes. Let me. Another noun, truly verb. Uh, this. Ah, we can see you, Ash. That's encouraging. Very good. We can't again, which is less encouraging. <laughs> yes, I am sharing.
Yes, we see it. Okay. Um, hello again. Um, I'm going to be talking about Moodle integration in the next few minutes. Um, Moodle, uh, just to make sure everybody is on the same page, is uh, basically uh, the most popular open source uh, learning uh, platform that there is. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually um, quite popular in, in schools and universities where um, the, uh, both the teachers and the students are able to uh, uh, group themselves around curricula, uh, material, and obviously documents and videos and so on. And this is where um, collaborative um, editing or indeed just the ability to uh, create documents, edit them and share them becomes um, extremely useful. Um, before um, moving on, I should uh, highlight that um, I am presenting the work of um, uh, others who have been very helpful in making the integration of uh, Collabra Online uh, within the Moodle ecosystem um, a reality. Uh, I will uh, get back to them and thank them again um, soon. Uh, briefly, the uh, uh, the ability to edit documents uh, within Moodle uh, is not limited to text only. Obviously, uh, we support uh, uh, presentations as well as uh, uh, spreadsheets, and um, as you can see, all of them are supported. Um, a better view. Uh, uh, especially for those who aren't familiar with the Moodle uh, platform, is, uh, is is visible on the screen. And you can see uh, basically that um, uh, where you have on the left and on the top, the course material and the organization of the material as the um, instructor uh, so fit, um, you can see that the document itself is embedded within uh, the structure of the course. So there, the, the essentially wherever a document is um, is, is shared or added, um, it can also be um, edited on the spot, embedded in the page. And you can see also the settings on the um, right menu, uh, where the uh, uh, primarily the the instructors, the teachers, and the admins um, are able to have advanced um, settings. Um, but of course, uh, for the viewer and editor uh, full features are available and we'll see very briefly how that works. Uh, behind the scenes there are really two plugins uh, that make um, all of this magic um, happen. One of them is the, um, the, the main um, uh, module uh, that is responsible for embedding the document and the document editing within the page. That's the mode Collabra. Um, and the other one is the assigned submission um, uh, plugin, which is responsible for controlling um, access rights and assignments and and um, that kind of thing. Um, we were just uh, talking about um, uh, you know giving uh, uh, others permission to edit and write uh, to a document, and this is this is exactly um, what happens in this case as well, where uh, the uh, the teacher or the instructor has the full ability to control. Um, who can edit which document. Um, one of the use cases for this could be um, to allow, allow the uh, class uh, to collaborate on a document or indeed to have them uh, individually visible um, for quizzes and tests and homeworks and things like that. Um, all of this is, is fairly straightforward to install. Um, on the uh, Moodle side, it's just the plugins and on the um, uh, Collabra uh, online side, there are multiple solutions for uh, the back end uh, that can get uh, somebody up and running in, in very, you know, very short uh, period of time using uh, containers uh, like Docker's and, and so on. All of this is obviously fully supported here as well. Um, in terms of configuring the plugin, um, there is mainly just a single required uh, setting, which is um, really just the URL to the um, Collabra online um, service uh, wh wherever that is running, and uh, basically that um, uh, hooks up the back end to Moodle. Um, so I want to um, take a brief moment to uh, thank um, uh, all of the individuals who participated in, in um, uh, creating and maintaining the Moodle 
uh, plugin for Collabora Online um, without their uh, you know persistence and hard effort, this wouldn't have happened. Um, and they still um, maintain and um, make sure that new features are added and um, issues are addressed. Uh, so thank thank you for the community. Um, I'm going to uh, very briefly go over um, the plugin configuration just to get a, a taste of the features and um, how all of this really works very well uh, on the Moodle platform. Um, uh, first of all, uh, one would need to add uh, the uh, collaborative document um, um, as an activity um, so that to make it available. Um, and once that is done, um, there is uh, the ability to um, control uh, the permissions um, and the features that are available uh, to the users um, that can also be configured on a, a more granular um, level. Uh, beyond that, a document uh, uh, typically uh, is locked for editing unless um, it is uh, unlocked by the teacher um, to allow others to edit the document and thereby um, essentially make it a um, writable document and not just view only. Um, this is the very important uh, uh, because in, in, in many cases uh, there are reading material that is shared that one wouldn't want it to be edited either accidentally or intentionally, but in other cases um, the document is specifically to get input from the students um, rather than uh, reading material to share with them. Uh, the uh, assign uh, submission plugin um, is uh, also highly configurable in that uh, one can um, uh, assign documents and can specify uh, the uh, file types that are um, acceptable um, and other um, relevant detail, thereby making um, the interface uh, a little bit more friendly and restricting uh, what is expected and what is acceptable. The as I said, the integration is um, uh, fairly straightforward, um, and this is really important because from um, a uh, user's perspective who's trying to integrate uh, something like the uh, cool service within the Moodle framework, uh, what they would really like is the ability to do this um, as a drop-in um, uh, sort of a service. And uh, for that, having a, a, a container uh, just to get you up and running and to do a proof of concept is really trivial. You just download a Docker image from our website um, and um, really um, uh, link uh, the Moodle plugin with the URL and off you are, you're pretty much um, up and running. And this is um, obviously a, a very uh, important uh, trait just to get people started and um, get a quick taste of um, uh, the cool features. Um, and thank you for listening, and I'll take questions in the Q&A section. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so next up we have uh, Willie, we, Willie Klodzek with the Collabora Online and Wopi in OnCloud Infinite Scale. So I will just give you uh, the presenter. Uh, Yes, I think someone already did it. Yes. So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> I just did, did the same thing twice. So I'm <laughs> muted and you are muted too. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. So now you can see the a new icon down uh, right after the camera icon to share the screen. Uh, not yet. I cannot yet see it. But now I can see it. Yeah, yeah. OK, perfect. OK, great. OK, um, today I'm going to talk about Collabora Online and Wopi in OwnCloud Infinite Scale. And um, my name is uh, Willi Kluczek. I'm working at OwnCloud. And first of all, I want to introduce you to OwnCloud to Infinite Scale. And uh, as a second point, I want to talk about Collabora Online and Wopi in OSIS. OSIS is shorthand for OwnCloud Infinite Scale because it's quite long and you need to save some time in your daily work <laughs> when talking about OSIS. It's quite fast in comparison. And uh, then we'll do a live demo and also do some question and answers because this is the last talk for today. Um, 
So I don't know if everybody of you has already heard about OwnCloud Infinite Scale. A lot of you might have heard about OwnCloud. Um, yeah, and the current version of OwnCloud is OwnCloud 10. And um, OSIS is the next generation enterprise file sync and share and collaboration tool of OwnCloud. So you could call it a successor to OwnCloud 10. It has an all new web front end, uh, which is called OwnCloud Web. And um, it's built on Reva. I need to tell you that because that implies some technical uh, reasons how, to, how we can handle, um, handle uh, Wopi and uh, Collabora. And it's also based on the CS3 APIs. Something more to Reva. Reva is an interoperability platform um, developed by CERN. And they have the CS3 APIs, which are a defined set of APIs to connect storage and application providers. And um, they try to achieve to connect enterprise, uh, enterprise file sync and share solutions between um, institutions, for example, between universities, because um, CERN is a research institute which um, has researchers all around the globe at different institutions, and they use different toolings, and they want to connect them. And OSIS builds on top of that, so we're using their code, but also are contributing on that. Um, and that is also some groundwork for Collabora Online and WOPI in OSIS, because I will show you how that works. Um, Reva, which we use in OSIS, has an app registry. We can register so-called app providers there. And the app registry then knows about all of them. So the app provider has some properties like supported mind types and a name. And for example, our web interface like OnCloud, uh, OnCloud Web can now ask the app registry to list all supported MIME types for the apps which are available and also list the available applications. For example, is there a Collabora? And um, if the user decides to open a file, for example, with Collabora, um, we will get an URL and um, can open that. But I will show you that in detail later. And also the app registry um, handles creation of new files, um, for example, for, from templates. But uh, yeah, we're still in, in uh, an, yeah development phase, so that's not not um, ready to demo you later. And uh, so that's the app registry part. So we we have a abstraction about applications. Um, CERN also has um, different applications beside WOPI protocol um, applications, I would call them. So they also have, for example, Jupyter Notebook using this or Kodi MD. And um, so how does the setup look like? Um, OSIS does not talk WOPI, and that's what we use Collabora with. So we have uh, the CS3 org Woki server, which is also developed by CERN and used by CERN. And we can connect that to OSIS. Um, I'll tell you in a minute why that is. Um, but first of all, if you want to open a file in OSIS with Collabora, first of all, you need a Collabora online server, uh, obviously. Then we have an app provider, um, which is um, inside Reva is a so-called WOPI app provider because that understands the discovery protocol of the Collabora online server where we can see, okay, which uh, file types does the Collabora online server support? The app provider then registers itself at the app registry and our client, uh, for example, on Cloud Web, can ask for all the existing apps. The user can then decide to open um, a file in that um, in, in, in a certain application and will receive an, an URL 
from the app provider through the app uh, registry and can then edit it, uh, open this URL in an, in an iframe. It also receives a um, token so that it can, uh, that it then passes on to the Collabora online server, which then uses the token to actually do the VOPI magic and talk to the VOPI server, which uh, translates the request to the CS3 uh, APIs which then does the, the um, file open and file save actions to the storage. So basically these um, CS3 API protocol uh, make it possible to, to use that uh, out of the box um, with all compliant CS3 API storages. So that's great to having a, another standard uh, which you can just use. Um, Okay, then let's go to the live demo. Okay, that's uh, what OwnCloud Web is looking like. So that's um, the front end for OSIS. You can also use it with OwnCloud 10, but it's the only option for, for OSIS. So there's no, no, um, uh, we call it the classic UI, which is available for on Cloud 10. This is not available for OSIS. In OSIS, you only have the web UI and also the clients, uh, the desktop client and so on. Like you know it from other um, synchronizing solutions. And if you do a right click on a file, you can see what, what um, apps are supported. For example, I told you before, there are other file apps besides uh, Collabora or other Wopi Office um, apps. Um, for example, in this case, it's uh, CodeMD. And if you have a look at the at, at a docx file, you see it could be, it, it is Collabora and it could be another editor and I can open that file in Collabora. And it will reload from the storage and yeah, you can edit it. You also can click on the file and there's a default action in which editor it will be opened. And you also can see that some files um, might support only one editor. For example, Collabora supports a rich text uh, document and the other editor doesn't. So it will only be displayed that one. Um, yeah, that's the current state of the um, implementation. There are still uh, some more things we need to implement. For example, um, the new um, new uh, file dialog is not yet there. And yeah, um, I think we will have a few things left for next year's conference that we hopefully can demo you to, uh, to them. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, that's it. I think we can continue with the Q and A round. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thanks, thanks. Really great Thank to uh, great to see it presented. Uh, very good of you. So yes, uh, do you share yourself or bring your questions? I don't know what questions we had <clears throat> in the chat. Um. Yes. So there was a question from Andreas Keynes, I think, some time ago. Uh, regarding uh, the possibility to hide and show us uh, integrators uh, sidebar. Oh, yes. he, he gave an example of Nextcloud, but basically, you know, since if we want to have it uh, collabora online occupying the most space possible, mm -hmm. <laughs> if we can, like, it's a little bit tricky eh? because depending on the <laughs> the case and depending on who you talk, I mean, depending on the type of user you talk, you might have people saying that, no, no, I want more of the integrator's control and less of that application because I only use for previewing or I only use for this small thing. And then you talk with another person, no, no, I actually do a lot of stuff. I use placeholders, I use these. And this. So I want to collaborate online to occupy the maximum space. So it's, uh, it's a tricky balance. It's true. I think we should probably have a, an API that allows an iframe to be embedded in our sidebar and be shown as a panel. Um, particularly with the new sidebar 
and post messages crazily up and down the stack so that stuff can happen. Uh, and then see who uses it and what they do with it. Uh, that would be my suspicion. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, was, it was a great idea from Andreas to uh, look at that at some stage. But uh, we'll talk to our wonderful customers and partners if, if they actually want it before we do it. I think. Exactly, yes. Yeah, I mean, our placeholder thing would obviously work really nicely in the right sidebar. Right. Yes. And I mean, it's reasonably easy to do that, I think, as an iframe and then to have, you know, some way of showing it, you know, in your, in your, as a button. Yeah, we could pass a URL in and you will show it just in that iframe and we Definitely. use the, yeah. the iframe API, the, the post message API to do the same thing as we do it now on what we show as an overlay. Sure, sure, sure. So but that would be really cool if we, if we could do that. And we can. It's just a matter of engineering, which is <laughs> which is fun. Um, but anyway, great to see uh, many things there. Other questions do we have? Um, so nice, nice to see e groupware doing good, good things. And uh, people yeah, are loving there was, the placeholder. There. Sure. Yeah, there was one, one more question some time ago uh, from Paul, but Paul needed to leave meanwhile. But anyhow, he was uh, asking if we ever uh, thought about. Uh, I think it's called GitHub discussions. Uh, I guess it's it's something that get that uh, GitHub GitHub offers, uh, and I guess it's for discussions. <laughs> yeah, I don't know much about it. <laughs> I'm just uh, communicating what he asked. Uh, but yeah, maybe we can look into it. I didn't know about it, so yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, yeah, all sorts of good things in, in cloud there. Nice to uh, nice to see it coming together and uh, working nicely. That's all really good. And CERN using it is uh, exciting too. So uh, it's great to uh, be helping. Yeah, us the... actually, they are developing it. So oh, well, indeed, we... indeed. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's actually, actually, it's the other way around. So we are, <laughs> yeah, hey. like, like I said, we are, we are using Reva and uh, also contributing to it. But actually, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello there. I'm happy to be here as well. Uh, uh, thanks so really for uh, presenting this. I was just replying to Pedro in the chat, and, uh, but uh, but I'm happy to also contribute. Uh, so yeah, indeed, this work. Uh, I'm especially super happy to see the the web UI because this is the part that is mostly on the cloud side. So we are using on cloud in the end, but the core backend. Uh, is is a collaborative effort it's all there in github and uh, yeah i can say i'm the proud uh, uh, main author of the wp server but uh, but <laughs> there is a lot of work really from our team and there's really a lot of stuff going on behind the scene i can so, tell you for example one little detail this will be server because we actually allow to mount the storage so people can also access the the storage as a normal fuse mount file Oh, okay, so yeah, I got muted at some stage. Uh, we even have integrated the, uh, a mechanism such that uh, people that open a file, a LibreOffice file with LibreOffice, or Windows or Linux, no matter what, will, uh, will lock the file in such a way that WAPI understands it, and vice versa. If a file is opened by Collabora, then LibreOffice understands this file was opened by a web editor. As we will tell you, really, Collabora as the web editor. So there's a nice, uh, there's a nice integration in that respect. We should, we should get that uh, upstream. I think uh, left and right. I, we're, we're looking at similar things to try and do that, <laughs> for, for, or, and to standardize that for, for file sync and share people and having a, having a decent way of finding where to to send a REST blocking request. <laughs> Um, but for now, I think, uh, as, as our friend Ralph was saying earlier, we need to be uh, dropping locks when we uh, quit or, or this kind of thing. You know, there are a number of things there that we need to improve. Yeah, indeed. But, uh, but yeah, that is, uh, that is definitely true. But OK, this is also, we have this speciality of, uh, of uh, allowing the, the storage to be accessed directly, so behind the, 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 the web front end, which maybe is not that uncommon. I don't know. What is your experience? Yeah, but I think you always got the problem as uh, soon as you uh, allow um, file synchronization. 
And well, yes. There, there you even have some other corner cases like your laptop is on, uh, offline because you're on a train or something like that, and then you can't do anything about it. So. Of course, but that one, that, that is kind of the core of the problems. I remember chatting with Michael somewhere where we could do a real chat over coffee. Uh, like, uh, yeah, what do you do with this lock uh, API? I mean, the semantic there is what it is. So if somebody is synchronizing a file while the file is open by Collabora, the only thing that uh, I can tell Collabora, look, the file has changed. And Collabora is doing actually a good job in, in saying, the file is has changed now in the storage, uh, you can save it. Uh, and then you have to deal with the conflict. Uh, that there is no magic. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why we didn't do locking for a long time, just because of the leaked locks and that you know unplug your laptop, go into a tunnel, <laughs> you know, drop, drop the laptop with a dumpster fire, and uh, you know, yeah, what, no, there goes the lock. We'll never be able to do file again. You know, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, indeed, it's, uh, it's all good fun. But and and the funny thing is that you see this in Windows. I mean, Windows is a heavy locker as an operating system. And for many yeah. years, we'd be like, uh, you know, hunting around the office to find how we can, who has got that file open still so that we can, you know, reboot the server or restart the app or, you know, I mean, you know it's, it's a bit of a plague of uh, immovable files for unclear reasons. So anyway, we'll see. Uh, hopefully with, with quicker see. leases and good internet connections these days, I think we can probably get lease time right down and, uh, and get a good user experience out of it. Good. Any other questions before I try and wrap up? Anything at all, you know? <laughs> oh. Well, in which case, I shall give myself a presenter something or other, if I can. I don't know. Um, um, I think you should be already. I should be already. Look at that. And, uh, and I'll share my screen. Yes. And I'll press the right buttons if, if, I'm, if I'm lucky. Perfect. So here we go. Thank you, pretty much. I mean, you're all amazing, and it's wonderful to uh, be here, but particularly, you know, partners, integrators, the speakers. I mean, I don't know. I, there's, some, there's some very humorous asides in, in many of these talks. I was very, very pleased to uh, hear. Actually, I, I, one of the things I want to do is uh, I have a whole load of boxes here, which I can use to raise my uh, game, as it were. So there's less nasal hair and more, uh, you know, more sort of, uh, and, and obscure lighting. I get, how's that? That looks better. So. I, just, just looking under the hood of what we do here, I, I, you know, we live in a world where there are all sorts of extraordinary claims out there, and it's very, very easy for people to say things well, exactly like this. You know, open source always wins. Uh, you know, well, the community creates the software, and uh, it all sounds very convincing. And it, it, well, we hope it's true, right? But it's really not magic. You know, the 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 f software is made from blood, sweat, and tears condensed into beautiful software. And, uh, you know, it, it, we can't just anthropomorphize and relax and claim, you know, uh, hand-waving uh, that it's done. And really, there's surprisingly few people doing an amazing amount of work. So if you're here and you're doing things, uh, that's just a brilliant. Uh, and thank you to everyone that, you know, actually contributes things, whatever it is, from bug reports, forum answers, you know, uh, integrations, WAPI implementations. Um, you know, UX stuff, coding, you know, there's, there's so much, uh, the translation, of course, vital. It all makes a big difference. So I just like, you know, to, to emphasize that. For all those who uh, actually did something, uh, you are in the minority. And, uh, you know, it's just wonderful to work with you. Um, and thank you for caring about the detail. You know, one of the things that really encourages me about hearing all of these talks from all of these skilled engineers and contributors is just the attention to detail and looking at those things that perhaps you never even knew existed, but it's just reassuring to know that someone out there is caring about it and, and doing a good job of making it beautiful. So thanks, thanks for that. And I really think this is true. Um, we live in a world where most people are consuming content. Um, so thank you for being the people that create it and uh, you know, push the state of the art forward. Um, so there's a whole load of people there who have contributed in the last year. Uh, I think they, they rock, uh, that's, that's absolutely amazing. And uh, translators, too. I think we mentioned those. Uh, uh, Andres just talk had a, a similar slide. Um, it's just a privilege to work with the, the team that uh, I work with. And, and some of them you, you haven't seen there, maybe uh, Eloy, some of our marketing team who, who enable uh, things like this conference and so on. I'm pleased to encourage them. Uh, those involved actually managed a team as well as doing all of this good stuff. So that's kind of doubly impressive. 
And uh, you know, we have open job racks. Consider joining us, uh, Calabra, if you like. Uh, particularly for this conference, uh, there are some people who've stood out and done done a whole load of uh, amazing things. So, so Pedro and Kendi uh, really helped to put all this together from a very uh, loose uh, specification. Uh, you know, I like to wave my hands and then see what happens. And apparently, apparently amazing things happen. So, uh, thanks so much, Pedro uh, and Kendi, for uh, you know putting all this together. And, and hosting and, and helping people, uh, Elisa for making beautiful artwork, uh, Cora, Cora Mark shepherding it all, uh, publicizing what happens, and William, and particularly to William for getting the infrastructure sorted out and put together and tested and, and, and you know, helping run, run the day and live tweets and goodness knows what. Um, finally, of course, Arrowa and Scaleway uh, co-sponsored, I guess, uh, Big Blue Button hosting, which is uh, very impressive. I mean, a massive multi-way video chat. So I was very pleased with uh, what they were doing there. Um, so both Arawa and Scaleway, thank you uh, for your uh, contribution. And of course, thank you to our wider partners. You pay for everything uh, that we do ultimately as we sell sell through those. The, the, the cool people who aren't just pretending that they can do something, uh, but actually have people standing behind them and beside them uh, that help uh, support their users. And, and of course, many more partners uh, to choose from there. And beyond that, of course, to the whole uh, Floss technology uh, stack that we build on. I mean, you know, we're, we're a, a small piece at the top of a big stack of good things. So, uh, you know, the LibreOffice technology is, is some very large percentage of what we do. And it's uh, fantastic to contribute uh, to Core and, and the, the code there alongside uh, the community and to credit them. So thank you for LibreOffice. Um, a quick plug for tomorrow. Uh, so for any business people who happen to slip in here by mistake, um, you know, we, we, uh, we sell all sorts of things and we'd love to talk to you about it. And we'd love to talk to you about our vision for it and how we go to market, uh, what we do, how much that costs, where you can buy it. And so uh, we've really separated that from all of the community pieces and put that in a separate day tomorrow. Um, and that's just going to be much more focused on the enterprise. So primarily case studies, um, you know, to reassure customers that actually, you know, we are doing this. It does work. You can edit your documents. It is, it is, you know, deployed out there. Uh, we're a successful growing company, and this is a good, good place. You know, any one of our partners uh, will be a good place to uh, bet your technology stack on, uh, and how you can get control of your documents and you know, uh, get control of your data again. Um, so that that's a paid uh, entry fee there. But if that's a problem for you, do just mail me, uh, and uh, we'll see what we can do. It'd be great to have people that are interested in that there. What do we do next year? Well. I don't know, it sucked not being with people this year. Um, this is a picture of uh, us in Almeria, just about to go on a, a small walk and then go snorkeling together. Uh, and again, it's not just Calabra, there's a whole lot of our partners there too. Um, I think probably next year we will try and do something similar with some you know, fun team building exercise and uh, a chance to meet up. And I think inevitably we'll have an online component to that too. Although that is no excuse to not come. So. Uh, Hope, we hope to see you there in person uh, sometime next year. And yeah, again, thank you for joining, supporting our mission to make, yeah, a free Linux open source software a rock. So looking forward to seeing you next year and what we can do by then. Thank you very much. And I think that's about it. Cool. Thanks. So my dear friends, I think that's the wrap up. I think we can now uh, close. Cries a river. <laughs> <laughs> and now, and be prepared for the for tomorrow. Yep. Happy hacking, everyone. Yeah. See you all. See you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.